Two of the world's top ranked players will fight it out against each other in the Freestyle Chess Go Challenge. It's world number one against the world number two. Magnus Carlsen takes on Fabiano Caruana. It's a big final coming up. Welcome everyone. I'm International Master Tanya Satchdev. Alongside me, the legend himself, Grandmaster Peter Leko. Peter, how fitting is it that we get Magnus versus Fabi for the final? Wow, we have seen yesterday's brilliant semi-finals between uh, Fabiano Caruana and uh, Levon Aronian. Fabiano showed some incredible fighting spirit, stunning chess, fighting till the very end. And he is rightly challenging Magnus Carlsen in the grand final. The two of them have played a world championship match in the 12 classical games. There wasn't a single decisive result taking it into a playoff. We've seen some epic battles between them over the board, online chess, and now for the first time in a classical format, they take on each other for the ultimate, ultimate grand final here. It's all happening in Bison House. We are super excited, especially after what we saw in the semifinals between Levon and Fabi. If Fabi keeps the same form, Peter, Magnus, it's not going to be easy for him. Yeah, not at all. I mean, Fabiano is, uh, is world number two for a reason with, again, over 2,800 rating points. He has also shown some stellar chess here, uh, incredible nerves. Yeah, we did see his heart rate reach 170, blundering, but still bouncing back. Incredible sportsman. I'm calling him now the marathon man after what we have seen yesterday. I love that name, the marathon man. It went down to the wire with six games. Fabi and Levon basically spent Valentine's Day together. Six games in all-time formats, and in the end, it was the Armageddon that decided our finalist, and that was Fabiano Caruana. But what a fight it was. And Peter, before we get into the finals, let's take a look at all the action that went down in the semifinal. Day six marks the final day of the semifinals of the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge in Weissenhaus. It's the players' last opportunity to showcase their skills and secure their spots in the finals. It's a very exciting day. It's uh, Valentine's Day, but there's going to be no love on the chessboard because we've got the elimination day for the semi-finals. Uh, so Noderbeck and Fabiano Caruana have to strike back against Levon Aronian and Magnus Carlsen. We'll have our two finalists today, and I'm really looking forward to the action. Chess is more than an ancient board game. It's a highly complex sport demanding strong memory skills to process information efficiently. With countless variations and moves in each game, players must remember and apply specific strategies to gain an advantage. This could be the primary reason why millions of people worldwide stream this game every day. The live stream that we produce here is like the most extensive one we've ever done. We have like all the small cameras that look through the pieces. We have a professional booth, we have heart rate, we have like touch screen. There's all kinds of elements. And to be honest, only like the software part where I'm very involved with. Uh, it takes up months to actually like prepare and then develop and stuff. 48 cameras in total are installed to capture each move of the games. Today, Magnus Carlsen, Nodirbek Abdusatorov, Levon Aronian and Fabiano Caruana are fighting for the top positions. However, by the end of the day, it's Magnus Carlsen who claims the first spot in the finals. Nodibuk is good at you know uh, adjusting to new positions. Like I've seen in several games that he plays the opening relatively well. He knows how to use his uh, queen sometimes in non-standard ways. And I feel like I'm hitting my form at least a bit. So regardless of my play, I'm very optimistic. Magnus Carlsen's opponent will be the Grandmaster Fabiano Caruana, but who will emerge as the ultimate winner of the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge in Weissenhaus? Stay tuned and follow the finals on freestylechess.com. We saw Peter at the very end of that Armageddon, Levon Aronian resigning with a smile on the face, but it's got to be hurting on the inside. Yeah, for sure. At the same time, his composure, the way how immediately congratulates uh, Fabiano Carne just shows what a gentleman he is. And uh, that's why the hearts are still bleeding out for, for Lev. He also would have deserved. But last night during dinner, I went to him and I tried to say, yeah, what a match. And he was the first who said, yeah, but Fabi deserved it more. And uh, that's, uh, that's stunning uh, sportsmanship.
And I think there's some truth to that as well, Peter. It's not just the scoreline, but the games that we saw, Fabi was... It felt Fabi was the better players, player for the most number of games there. Even in better positions, he did blunder the rook, giving the chances. But Levon finding the resources to keep it going, it was an epic clash. And Levon Aronian will also be back in the arena fighting for a third place against Nordebek Abdu Satrov. A lot on the line. There's glory, bragging rights, a lot of money as well. And uh, to break down more of the action to keep us good to the position of course in the studio we've also got grandmaster nicholas huschenberg nicholas are you excited about today Tanya, thank you so much i'm really looking forward to it where warm welcome from me as well we have the first day of the finals it is carlson against Kawana. it is the matchup of the World Championship match 2018. These two know each other very well. They have played so many games against each other and their rivalry continues here at the Weissenhaus Resort at the Baltic Sea. And this is really an epic final and we could not have asked for more. I'm looking so much forward to the action and soon the position will be revealed, Tanya and Peter. Yes, and that's always an exciting moment for us. We will have the position reveal ceremony in just a few minutes. Before that, let's remind everyone of the format for the grand final that is about to begin. And as always, it will be a best of two played in a classical time control. It will be 90 minutes for the first 40 moves. There are no increments. After 40 moves, after time control, the players get an additional 30 minutes. And then from move 41, a 30 second added every time they press the clock. If it goes into a 1-1 tie, the best of two will be played over two days. If it goes into a 1-1 tie, we go into the madness of uh, the madness with Magnus uh, with the rapid playoffs. But that's for later, Peter. The first thing is the first classical game. And in these mini matches against Magnus, the one thing I think we've all seen and learned is that Fabi needs to keep it under control in game one. To come back against him is always probably one of the most difficult things to do in chess. Well, as Magnus always says, yeah, in all his interviews absolutely correctly, that whenever he, he get, grabs the lead, there is no stopping him, but whenever he falls behind, he has the power to come back. Yeah? And this we have seen in that epic battle against Arya Zafiruja in uh, what it was, was it the quarterfinals? Yeah, it, it, it feels like it was ages ago. <clears throat> Just some insane action there, bouncing back and then uh, winning the tie breaks. <clears throat> Fabiano is, is also mentally so strong, so tough. What we have witnessed, blundering two rooks with a 170 heart rate. I'm coming back to this because this is really incredible. And then in a couple of minutes, calming down and playing again perfect chess. That was true art by Fabiano. And Fabi has been so in form over the last last 23 and even coming into this year. Peter, we're seeing a sort of a resurgence of Fabi, a Fabi 2.0. He had this fantastic performance uh, up to 2018 and then after the World Championship, it felt, like, it felt like it took something from him and then a couple of shaky years. But I feel like there's this renewed ambition in Fabi with the candidates coming up. He wants to become the world champion. He wants to fight for it one more time. We've seen him in the Champions Chess Store. He is the reigning US champion, the US number one. He's been playing fantastic chess in the Grand Chess Store as well. The winner of the Grand Chess Store, uh, Peter. Fabi versus Magnus, it's going to be a battle to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Also, when we just look at the overall results of uh, last year, yeah, he was winning the FIDE circuit by a very big margin. The question was from other super players that who, take the, who takes that second spot. Fabi was way above everyone. So nice to see. There was a saying always that when Levon is in great shape, it's such a great news for the chess world. I feel very much the same applies to Fabiano. We are so happy to see him in his perfect shape. Fabulous Fabi against Magnificent Magnus and we are 
really excited about this clash. And of course, out of the 960 position, one of them will be picked up, one unique one which hasn't been played so far. Let's remind everyone that it's position number 518 in chess 960, which is the standard chess position. That's been taken out. And another position which is not in the running is where the kings and queens, they swap places. So it's actually out of 958 positions that we will have one random position. And Peter, before we reveal uh, the first classical starting setup. Let's remind everyone about what is Chess 960. The world of chess in a completely new light. At the Freestyle Chess Goat Challenge 2024, together with Magnus Carlsen, we call it Freestyle Chess, played according to the rules of Chess 960. Chess 960 ensures surprising games from the very first move. Why? because the arrangement of the chess pieces is drawn at random before the start of each game. In total, there are 960 different starting positions. The pawns remain on the second and seventh row as usual. The arrangement of the pieces on the first and eighth row is random, but symmetrical. The only condition, the king must always stand between the rooks and the bishops on different colors. In chess 960, players can't rely on memorized openings. They see positions they have never seen before and must invent new strategies from the beginning. Despite being under time pressure, the two-day preliminaries at the Weissenhaus Resort will require swift decisions, being played with rapid time control. In the subsequent elimination round, Chess 960 will be played with classical long thinking time. For the first time in the history of chess, the Super Grandmasters can play highest level Chess 960 games because we give them the time to do so. Chess in a new dimension, to be experienced at the Weissenhaus Freestyle Chess Goat Challenge. It is going to be a lot of fun and we can see the action from right here. The players are getting into the playing arena and uh, we are setting up for our position reveal. It's going to be so much about the setups. And I believe Fabi starts with the white pieces. Peter, how does that affect the dynamics in a best of two in freestyle chess? I think it's, and there we see the pairings. Yeah, Fabiano Karna starting with the white piece against Magnus Carson. and Nodir back up Satorov for the third place, plays with the white piece against Levon Adonian. For the fifth place, clash of the Titans, the young Titans, <laughs> Ali Reza Filhuza, Gukesh, yes, and uh, for seventh place, Vincent Keimer against Ding Liren. All great matchups, but clearly our main focus will be on Fabiano Caruana against Magnus Carson. And the reason why I'm very happy that Fabi gets the white piece and the same applied to Magnus Carson after his grueling tie break, his playoff against others, is that once you are completely exhausted, it's uh, so much nicer to start a match with the white pieces because you feel mm. like you, you can set your foot on the ground and, uh, and start playing normally. That's a big fight and also it's a big fight for the fifth place because the player who does finish fifth in this Freestyle Chess Go Challenge gets an invitation to the next Freestyle Chess Go Challenge event. And of course, so Peter, we've been so happy that Freestyle Chess, we'll be seeing a lot more of that in 2025. It will become a global tour comprising of four tournaments across the world. Yeah, this is this is sensational news. I'm I'm just very happy. The only problem I have with it that we have to wait till 25. Yes, <laughs> it, it's just gonna be so difficult. But if we know that it's gonna be a tour, then it's worth waiting for. Absolutely, uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun when that happens, and it's gonna be a lot of fun in just a few minutes as we will have the first moves and the setup of the position. Nick Nicholas, I'm gonna throw it to you and ask you. When Fabi played Magnus in 2018 in a classical in the classical chess, the World Championship, 12 games ended in a draw. What are you expecting when they play in the finals of the of freestyle chess? Well, I'm definitely not expecting two draws here. <laughs> we have seen so few draws overall in this format. Most of the games have been decisive, and it's because in freestyle chess the players have to start thinking from move one, the position is completely fresh to them, completely new to them. We saw Magnus and up to the tour spending over half an hour, 40 minutes on the first five, five moves and Magnus coming into a confessional booth and saying, I love this game. I love that I have to start thinking from move one. And 
and it is so difficult, it's so complex. He really loves the challenge. And I think this is why Magnus is also behind this idea and really want to see this uh, become a reality, this tournament, freestyle chess, Fischer, random in the classical format, because it is something very challenging. It is something fresh and you immediately have to start thinking from move one. So coming back to your question, I think we will see decisive games in between Magnus and Fabi. It's just a question, who can strike first? And Fabi, today with the white pieces, we saw the importance of the white pieces in these matchups. He will try. He will try to put pressure on Magnus and win that game with white. Tanya. It's so critical with the white pieces to at least get the kind of position where you can try to push for advantage and completely agree with that. So the first few moves are going to be very critical to slow down, to take your time and decide the setup. Because if you let go of that early advantage that you can try and push for with the white pieces, Magnus Carlsen will be a beast in game two with white. So Fabi needs to bring on the energy. And speaking of energy, is it a factor that for Fabi, it was such a long day in office. He played six games in his match against Levon, went down to the wire. While for Magnus, it was an easy path to the finals. Do you think energy fatigue will be a factor today, Peter? We, well, yes and no, because uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm pretty sure that Fabiano gets incredible amount of energy by reaching the final. Yeah, that uh, yesterday match against Levon, that was so close it could have gone completely in the opposite direction. So already being in the final, getting the white pieces, getting the chance to challenge Magnus Carlsen in the very big final. And we have, by the way, seen also Magnus was here in our studio when he had that grueling, crazy time uh, playoff against uh, Ali Reza. He said he's completely exhausted. This is just murderously tough. And then what did he do? He just crushed uh, Abdus Satarov in the semi-finals. So these gentlemen are such gladiators that I think that Fabi and we have, I think we, we might have. Yes. You're absolutely right, Peter. When it comes on the board, there was no love on the 14th of Feb. We saw absolute fierce competition. Magnus as well just made it look so easy against Nodebeck in that game to never gave him a chance with the black pieces. Well, for Fabi, what a different narrative it was on his path to the finals. And I'm just wondering, you know, you have got no idea what's the starting position, what you'll be playing, where the pieces will be. And perhaps it makes sense, Peter, to just get a good night's sleep and not think about the final coming in today. Yes, exactly. This is the great advantage of uh, Fisher and on freestyle chess. That was the whole vision behind it also for Bobby, the legendary Bobby Fisher, that uh, you can just prepare for the game by having a good sleep, having a good meal, having a good rest and a big walk to come to the game with fresh eyes. And there we have it. My excitement was there that we're going to see the drawing of lot starting. Peter could feel it. We're heading straight into the arena with Fiona. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Peter, up in the studio. We are ready now to draw the position for the first game of the finals day. And I would like to invite to the stage Holly and Teresa Sara, Miss Angola International. Give them a round of applause. Welcome back. Thank you very much, Holly, Teresa, Sarah. Back to the studio. Studio. The players will now get. Oof. Position number 949 is being drawn by Miss Angola. And it's such a pleasure to have her here with us, Peter. And is this position, how much of a pleasure is this going to be for the players to play? Uh, what stands out to me, first of all, Peter, we always bring this up. 
watch out for the hanging pawns in the starting <laughs> position. I can't say it enough in freestyle chess and the two targets that come to mind is f2 and f7. That said, I don't see a direct way to get to these weaknesses, to get to these undefended pawns very early on. Uh, Peter, we also see the queen on one side of the board, the king on the other side of the board. The two minor pieces connected, knight with knight, bishop with bishop. And I'm going to say it first, Peter. Intuitively, I would want to play the move e4 here. Wow, <laughs> so you are ready, ready for the first move. I'm just still <laughs> trying to understand the position. By the way, we have been uh, hearing that it's position 949, and when I heard it, I, I Im immediately got scared that are we running out of <laughs> positions, yeah? After all, what's, what's going on? But of course, no, that's uh, clearly a joke. Uh, one of the first things that when I looked at the position, clearly that queen on h1, mm. yeah, the, this queen in the corner is a very special piece because if it gets stuck there, we have seen it in, I think, Vincent's game one time, it was not in the corner on b8, but it never got a chance to be developed and it went down to, to hurt Vincent very much, Levon crushed him there. Uh, the king on b1 feels quite safe at the moment, I don't really see that king being in any danger and we might be getting some some insights from the players. And we see Levon there, I believe. He's analyzing the position. I think he's also trying out the move f4 right now, I think. The bishop pawn moving forward from the king side. I think that this is a very unique position. Yeah, we, we haven't, haven't seen anything like this. Yeah, this bishop c1, bishop d1, the bishops usually were already in the corner. The two knights together, two bishops together. Queen and king opposite side of the board. I actually really like it at first. So. Yeah, you need some true art to connect the forces, yeah, because we would love to develop the queen, activate the queen, but we should also not forget about the knights. But if if we think about all these pieces, then what about the bishop on d1 and bishop c1? How do we develop them? Take out the queen, you might think about pushing the g pawn, but Peter, that might allow black's bishop to come to the long diagonal and hit the queen at some point. Yes, that's also... <laughs> but okay, if you play b6, I can still go e4, f4, bishop, f3, maybe, yeah, but... Oh yes, but then what about the knight on g1? Should it stay there? Yeah, there are so many questions. Yeah, and the knight can even come on from the edge of the board. We've seen that so many times. And what is the line that Levon's looking at right now? Now it's e4. Now it's e4, yeah. Well, first of all, now he's switching strategy, yeah, that yesterday when he played with the black pieces, he was sitting on the white side just to get the feeling how he's... But then Fabi was in a must -win situation, yeah, so probably mm. now Levon thinks like, okay, I want to... All right, for, for the moment, I have no predictions for the first move. It just I predicted a... mine already. And the reason I wanted to move the king's pawn uh, forward first with e4, Peter, I thought it gives us the way for the, not only opening up the rook and the bishop, but that knight from f1 can jump to e3. Meanwhile, we see our usual entourage there with Vincent, Nodebeck and Fabi. They formed quite a group here. Yeah, they just love the atmosphere. Yeah, one can see that they really enjoy this process. Finally, they might end up playing completely different moves, but it's just nice to get insights from different angles. Wow. <laughs> It would be so nice to actually see the board angle there and we could see that they were discussing H4, H5. Magnus, meanwhile, by himself on the board, alone with his thoughts. It worked very well yesterday for him. Has such a big one coming. So his opponent, Fabi, he's analyzing with the youngsters while Magnus chooses to do it by himself. Yes, I, I actually like this approach very much, yeah, because, okay, Yes, it's nice to get insights of different angles from different players, but at the same time, finally, you have to settle on your feelings. Yeah, Your inner feelings should be uh, the, the real guidance because it's such a unique position. If somebody tells you maybe it might work for that person, but uh, for your 
for your balance, for your mental state, uh, for your style, something else is required. Yeah. So I would personally listen to the players. I would be getting as much uh, feedback as possible, and then I would go there, sit down, and I would still think like 10 minutes for my first couple of moves, or maybe even the very first one. And Rita, yesterday uh, when Magnus came in, you saw him, and like an expert told us that he means business. But today he's, uh, he's looking a bit different. What do you make of his look today? <laughs> well, we were already even uh, discussing. Wow, actually now Dingley then joins uh, Levon Aronian. Yes. Very nice. I just want to finish our thoughts that yeah. we were thinking that was it really meaning business against Nodia Beko or was it Valentine's Day? <laughs> yeah, we don't know exactly. <laughs> yes. Even I understand why the players like it because it releases the tension a bit. Yeah, afterwards when the clocks are pushed. Yes, you are yes, anyway so tense, it's just nice to share this kind of uh, challenge yeah, with, with other players. By the way, Tanya, you have been revealing that F7 before? square is a weakness. Yeah? Ah, F3, Knight G, I know. Knight F3, Knight F5, Knight X, F7, prepping the Queen just, for example, to, to just very quickly highlight this. For example, of course, Black should not play like this, but... Six black goes Yeah, for example, tries to activate the Bishop. You play bishop b7 and suddenly knight takes f7, but already you have highlighted with deep prophylactic thinking, Tanya. That's what happens. So watch out. Those undefended pawns are always very, uh, very big weaknesses. Yes. H5, H5, H4, yeah? keep saying h5 h4 where is that coming in? <laughs> well maybe then a desperado yeah just to make sure that the queen gets into the game but for the moment i don't really see it because imagine white goes e4 f4 the bishop on d1 beautifully protects that uh, opponent h5 uh, we will have to see Knight and be stunned if uh, that will be really a critical idea in in a practical game h5 i'm not so sure I agree, Lava, and I'm not so sure either about h5. How do you actually bring this that looks like a good move. The a7 square can be also attacked by the light square. And this Bishop. for sure is good for white, yeah? Six. Maybe there is some resource within the office. Well, actually, it's 10 minutes prior to the game are enough to confuse the players to the maximum. <laughs> That's how I feel, <laughs> because you don't get any certainty. This is not uh, not any serious preparation, it's just feelings. Yeah, you are sharing emotions. Peter, confusion is the first step to clarity. Yeah. So talking about these positions, breaking it down, and even if you don't come to a conclusion, you have these thoughts in your mind when you sit at the board. Yeah, that's what Levon also revealed us, yeah, that they talked with uh, Ding about D4, and then he felt like it was not convincing at all. Two more minutes before liftoff. Wow, and then the grand final we start between Fabiano Caruana and Magnus Carson. But yeah, it's so nice to see Ding Lian and Levon Alonian discussing the first moves. And we also have the perfect camera angle. F4 is the problem. Wow, okay, F4 is the problem. Okay, it's, <laughs> but it's kind of, I don't know that you can really state it like this, but yeah, that's how Levon feels, yeah, that F4 will be really challenging. Now the big question, will Nodia back play the move or is Levon revealing it loudly so that Nodia back <laughs> hears it, you know, and please play F1, oh, and I'm very happy about and it. Levon's very tricky like that. <laughs> yes, exactly. We're going to find out, because to me, F4, it's time for the players to get ready to make their moves now. The 10 minutes come to an end. Positions have been discussed, delved into briefly. Magnus with full focus on the board. He needs no, no one. It's lonely at the top, Peter, as they say. <laughs> yeah, and there, there was the handshake. Wow, it's, uh, it's a huge game and it's already about the first move, the very first move, we did hear Magnus also in the conventional booth uh, explaining that everybody played d4, but I was thinking like 1e4 was much more challenging, yeah? Th there are kind of these inner feelings from players, 
and uh, let's see. All right, as we get ready, uh, Peter, we've got to do our first move predictions. We've also had time to look into it. I'm sticking to 1E4. What about you? Okay, I'm uh, leaning towards Levon. Yeah, if, if Levon fears <laughs> F4, then let me go you for it. I believe a, in Lev. I'm a Levon fan. And Nicholas, share your insights. What do you think we're going to have on this board? We just saw lift off the clock was pressed. Fabiano is thinking, I'm also going to go with F4. I quite like the position that we saw in when Levon and wow. Ding analyzed. But we have a different <laughs> move. We didn't even talk about it at all. D4 by Fabiano, Tanya. D4, but also makes a lot of sense. We always look at these pawn moves in the center. You control some key squares. You open up the paths for the bishop. And let's not forget, Levon was highlighting some ideas of the queen coming into play. That's not going to happen anymore. D4 on the board. But Peter, I have a feeling we are not there. My arrows are wonky today morning. We are going to see E4 at some point. Well, now it's also... Big question, how Magnus will handle the situation. Mm. We did see that yesterday he did not fancy to go for the symmetrical d5. He was playing the Dutch. And honestly, I always feel that whenever the f5 pawn is not automatically attacked, then f5 makes perfect sense. The, the same feelings with f4 that after f5 you can put the knight on f6. Eventually you can also... Uh, Activate the queen via the g8 square. Yeah, if you push the f5, then the queen is already on this diagonal. Yeah, on the g8 a2 diagonal. You also highlight nicely that the c3 bishop c2 kind of setups are interesting. Mm. Uh, Peter, look at Magnus. I have never seen him like this on move number one. I mean, this is just incredible to watch. Apart from yesterday, I think also yesterday he was like in this full, oh, full that. concentration mood. Yeah, because, okay, in these 10 minutes, you can never get ready for anything. And we have seen that <laughs> burning a lot of time yesterday really paid off. And, uh, yeah, Magnus taking, because it's such a tough decision. He removes the jacket. Yeah. That's a Gary move. <laughs> yes, the jacket needs to be removed in order to get full focus. And uh, he might also feel like, okay, Fabi goes defo, and he knows that yesterday I played the Dutch with F5. Is this what Fabiano is now? Prepared against. Has he made a move? He hasn't, right? No, he hasn't. He no, hasn't. he just removed the jacket so that now he can groove in. And <laughs> believe me, Magnus will not make a first move in the next five minutes. I believe you. I believe you. I mean, he needs to get deep into this position, and we're see. You can almost feel the uh, the craziness that's going on in his head when he sits like that with head in hands all the different ideas he's calculating. And it's not about the first move response. It's about trying to think where you eventually want to put your pieces. It's the different branches of variation from the very start of the move. It's not just about responding D4 with the move. It's about what's going to happen over the next five moves, the setup that he wants to aim for. Wow, and we have the bird's eye view ready and we can share our... So look at these three games d4 and, and the vincent tech team and one the, e4 yes and one e4 no f4 <laughs> nobody was listening to to <laughs> love on yes uh, it was fabiano caruana nodil back abdusato vincent Kaimer teaming up going one d4 and the only player who has answered d4 is ding with g6 but is ding really a modern peers player he's a classical guy giving up the center like this uh, trying to activate that queen right from the beginning wow I, I, I'm certain that Magnus will not play the move g6 because it, it looks a bit weird. No, he does it. Wow. 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 <laughs> okay, this is the curse of commentators. I'm loving it because it just felt to me that no way Magnus is going to go for g6 and he does. And that means there's something very deep about this position. If you've got the world champion and the world number one with the exact same response and move number one, they've clearly felt that this is the way forward, but what is the breakdown? What is the point of it? It's easy to point out, Peter, that there is a one-move threat. With g6, you attack that central d4 pawn, opening up the queen. But what is the future they see? Are we anyway expecting a Dutch setup with the f pawn moving to f5 next? Probably. We also see that Levon immediately used the opportunity. He played f5. I also feel like since I was unable to even imagine or expect the move from g6, the question or the, the audience can rightly shout that, okay, let this Peter out of this studio. I mean, what is no he doing there? He does, not, he does not even understand that g6 is a good move. What's going on?
Trust me, Bira, that's not what's happening right now. But G6, and it's so interesting, like you said, that it's not just Magnus who responds with it, but Ding as well. And meanwhile, uh, on that extreme right board, Vincent has already gotten his knight out, developed the knight towards the center. Also eyeing that E5 square, which earlier you had highlighted, which could eventually put pressure on F7 in the middle game. And we've got one game with the king's pawn opening, and that's Ali Reza against Gukesh. And we kind of see an e4, e5. Finally, the g-pawn does move forward, controlling some central squares. And uh, for the lev on board, it's still move number one. f5 responded. Nicholas, we've got the first couple of moves in front of us. What stands out to you? And break down this action that we're seeing. Well, first of all, what stands out for me, the three players that were analyzing together, Nordebeck, Fabiano and Vincent, they all chose the, the same first move, 1d4, just like yesterday. And also just like yesterday, Ali Reza went for e4. So Ali Reza chose a completely different approach. And we saw just a couple of moves here in these games where d4 happened. However, in the Ali Reza game, we have quite some developments already, so let's go through the first few moves. This is also a very important matchup because the winner who gets the fifth place qualifies for the next freestyle chess event automatically. And here knight e3 was played, knight e6. And it's quite striking to me how fast the players are playing here compared to the other ones here. Already five moves have been made in how much time? Eight minutes? Less than ten minutes? Whereas maybe in the other games we'll see the players take an hour to reach move five or six. We shall see. And also it has to be pointed out that Alireza did not play the most accurate way after knight f3. According to the engine he is already a little bit worse which just goes to show how difficult this position is. If you develop your knight naturally to f3 and this is an inaccuracy, tough to evaluate that correctly c3 prompt uh, hinting at d4 g6 makes a lot of sense opening up the queen stopping d4 and now bishop c2 is played Alireza has only spent one minute i cannot really believe my eyes that Alireza has spent one minute and six seconds so far on the first few moves and has not served him well he's actually worse here after bishop c2 why is he speeding through the moves so quickly, Peter? Do you have any idea? I have no idea, especially because look at that queen on h1. Yeah, if you look at the black queen on h8, one really has the feeling that after g6, this queen already makes perfect sense. It controls the d4 square very nicely. Yeah, so it's very much in the game. I don't have any feeling like I need to move that queen next. But this queen cannot stay forever. And where is this queen going? Yes, one could argue that some queen f1, queen c4, activation could be possible but do we really want that queen on c4 will it be targeted later on but i do believe that white will need to activate the, that queen because you can't play the game with queen on h1 stuck forever tanya i'm trying to understand that i get your point about the queen still not developed but is it so bad? Because to me, it also looks like White has made natural moves, Peter. You know, you've tried to take control of the center. You've developed your knight. The bishop from c2 stops any advance of the f-pawn moving forward. The queen eventually will come into play, whether it's through f1. Maybe the h-pawn will move forward. Try, just explain this to us, that why is it that, uh, that the engine prefers black in this position? Well, first of all, okay, I would not... Uh not read too much into yeah. into engine's evaluation it's more like probably it does not feel like a very challenging way how mm. white is white has played yeah the the knight on f is an extra move yeah it's developed but it's not exactly clear what this knight is really doing yeah on f3 because it, it doesn't have good squares and we don't know yet this structure f2 g2 pawns are kind of still in the original position somehow this concept of putting that knight to e6 and g6, f7, queen on h8. I don't know, maybe something like even knight e7, f5. Eventually, of course, f5 still is kind of covered with, with the knight and the bishop. Yeah, that was also the reason why Reza developed his bishop quickly to c2. But maybe knight e7, then we have seen Magnus was the one who played rook e1 to f1 against Ali Reza. And then 
prepared f4, it would be very natural to play f7, f5, and that's all connected with this g6 pawn, this knight on f3, I feel that this has committed itself a little bit too early. And perhaps it's slightly misplaced there in freestyle chess. We've often seen that once you've taken out a couple of pieces, it's about which side gets a central break in, the first break in, which is why very often playing copycat chess or mirror chess doesn't work out for black. And if we look deeply into this position, as Peter was highlighting, that with the placement of the knights, which visually looks great, it actually feels that black will be the first one to get the central break in. Also notice how the queen from h8 and the knight from e6 stop the d-pawn from moving forward. So d4 is not going to be a reality anytime soon. The f-pawn has been hampered by its own piece the knight. Meanwhile, because as you were highlighting, black has not committed with a place for his own knight on g8. We might be seeing an early central break on f5 by Gukesh. All right, Peter. We will keep an eye out on this one. Let's zoom out to our bird's eye view and do a quick tour of the other games as well. And I think I want to go to Vincent versus Ding uh, because I see we've been talking about central breaks and there's one on the board right now. Oh, wow. The E4 move already happened on move three. All right, let's just go step by step. Uh, D4, G6. Okay, so it's a big surprise for me, but we will be also getting into deeply into Magnus's game. We might be understanding more what's in store for us. So, yes. You somehow sensed it that probably g6 will be connected in Dingland's game with f5. And now Vincent, before black gets knight f6 and establishes control over the e4 square, goes for the e2 e4 move, which clearly black will take. Yeah, black has just captured, white takes back with the rook. Normally we have been seeing this team when white's queen was taking the, that pawn. And after knight f6, for example, the queen would move to d3. That would be wonderful, yeah, because you activate the queen. Yes, it's kind of tempting to play e4, but still very much the same issue with that queen on h1, right? Now black's queen is more in the game. Black will get knight f6. So on one side, it's tempting to open up the center, yeah, before black uh, stops it. At the same time, it's also a very double-edged kind of decision. Would it make sense for white to actually think about bringing the queen to the center of the board? Uh, yes, you'll hit the rook with the knight. And I'm looking at a retreating square. It's not a happy one, but let's say I was to put it to e2, temporarily blocking my bishop. My idea is that I want to improve my knight and get my queen to e1. I want to activate my queen from the corner of the board, not only lining up with the e-file, but, you know, we've seen these ideas by Fabi yesterday, queen e1, queen b4. Yeah, one thing that also catches my attention that once you activate that rook so easily, you have already given up on one, one castle's opportunity, right? This we have to highlight, so there is no way white will ever castle short in this game. Okay, most probably Vincent feels like, why do I need to even think about this? Uh, because if he castles, then it's going to be long castle, yeah? Then he only needs to develop the bishops. As you highlight, it's also very natural, especially if you play this kind of Nice little move, rook e2, setting up already this c3, bishop c2 setup that you are dreaming of. And maybe even you can just forget about and ignore castle once and for all and go for a4, rook a3 ideas as well. Yeah, there are so many intrigues in the position. We, we do hear from Nicholas often that computer suggests that, you know what, you don't know exactly what to do. Go a4, grab some space, activate that rook. The king on b1 is perfectly safe. Nicholas, what do you think? We're talking about the queen's placement, the rook is out in the opening, open. Yes, you've uh, given up the right to castle, but you get a lot of peace activity. How would you break this down for us? Yeah, I'm not sure about this early e4 push. It was also not approved by the engine, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe to play it later, because there are a few points that you highlighted. One, you cannot castle short anymore, which let's be honest, was maybe not such a um, realistic option anyway. But other, on the other hand, you also, the rook gets pushed. I'm a bit surprised by this move d5. I was more looking at d6 here also to develop the bishop. And the big difference is that you don't weaken the square on e5 considerably as you do now. And the engine, as we can see, is also not a fan. It's giving, it's giving what an advantage. And what I want to point out, as Peter was saying it, yes, the engines in this kind of position with the rook being stuck here like to play some a5, maybe rook a6, because 
The king is perfectly placed on b1. You just need to take care of the rook and if you can bring into a game for example like this or for black like this where the sixth rank that makes a lot of sense however we have a different move on the board d5 hitting the rook also opening up the bishop but clear drawback you end up with a weakened square on e5 why is it weak no pawn is controlling the square anymore white is controlling the square with the pawn on d4 the knight is also ready to jump there the bishop is ready to go to f4 i'm trying to make sense of this move peter maybe you can help me out well to be honest, I'm kind of shocked by the move d5, especially because I know that Dinglian is a very fine strategist, yeah, who deliberately weakens the e5 square just like this. Okay, now I even don't want to be too fancy with rook e2. I can just fall back with the rook all the way to e1. We have a clear vision of getting that bishop out to f4, establish some more control of the e5 square. What is Ding having in mind? Certainly he should have something because otherwise it just does not feel right at all to, to weaken like this. Tanya, what's your feeling? Completely agree. A point very well made. This move d5, it just leaves so many dark squad weaknesses on the board. Uh, and it just feels like white will be the first one to put pressure. And also you're making your own king vulnerable. Now the idea of actually activating that bishop from d8 with the move c6 becomes that much more difficult because of the check that you highlighted on the h2 b8 diagonal. I'm not a big fan of d5 unless Ding has something concrete to show for it. But I don't really really see where that that is going to come from. Unless you've got an e5 coming in immediately with the black pieces, which is impossible to achieve because white has got three pieces defending this key square. This knight is jumping in. There's a fourth piece that's joining. d5 is definitely a very strange choice by uh, Ding early on. Yes, and... Uh... As Nicholas highlighted, yeah, there are some players who are rushing their decisions. Before, before you play d5, you have to make sure that all the strategical issues that we are talking about will be dealt uh, very effectively with some concrete move pen, move play, which I'm not seeing. Okay, this is uh, up to Ding Liren to, to the world champion to figure out what, what he has in mind. I believe we should be heading towards some other action, maybe the Levon game against Nodirbeck. And then afterwards, we will fully focus on uh, Fabiano Magnus. What do you think, Tanya? Absolutely, Peter. Pond, do not move backwards. And Ding, with this last move, has to really show what is his idea and plan for creating these weaknesses. Vincent, I think on his end, must be feeling that this is... He must be smelling it a little bit. Right? This, is, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't smell right in the position. He can perhaps start to get ambitious about his chances in this one. But Peter, we will zoom out of this as you called out. Let's head over to the Levon Nodebeck, the fight for third place. And wow, some committal pawn moves in this one as well. Yes, wow. Actually, the first thing that comes to mind is yesterday's uh, classical game between Fabiano and Levon. Right? That Levon was the one who firstly said that, you know, this is a... This is kind of a symmetrical position, not much happening, it should be equal. And then he was proven completely wrong by Fabiano's extreme precision and extreme energetic play. He never managed to stabilize. So yes, often this type of position look like, yeah, it's symmetry, nothing is really happening. But there's always this unbalance, yeah, that whoever reaches first on E5, yeah, grabs the initiative. And uh, I do like... White's position somewhat, the clock situation, yeah, more or less equaled out. Levon goes knight 8 to d7, challenging that knight. Wow, if knight takes e5, d takes e5, knight e4 happens then. After knight e4, d takes e4, <laughs> we get again a very much the similar position. Luckily, however, for Lev, then his bishops are now much more coordinated. Yeah, that bishop can go to e6, which was Fabi's bishop yesterday. And somehow this bishop also can be activated via c6, bishop b6. But very fascinating that Levon keeps on going into these stonewallish structures. Also, just pointing out a simple but important tactic that made the move knight to d7 developing and challenging this knight possible. Yes, you block the connection between this bishop and pawn, but white doesn't have the chance to actually capture this pawn because you do trade off the knight. And if you take with the knight back, black picks up the knight. You pick, us, pick up the knight, and I think you can even capture with the g-pawn, Peter. You open up the queen, and then you're eventually eyeing a central break with e5. I think the captures and the trades just work out to black's favor. If we compare this, the pieces in the position right now, uh, 
Levon will be happy with these trades on the board. Yeah, very happy. This is a dream come true for Black. We However, have moves. we have moves and A4, A5 <laughs> on the board. Both players blitzing it out, feeling that yes, actually this king on B1 is perfectly safe. First of all, also White does not have any real uh, squares for those bishops yet, yeah? So why to waste time on any castles when often when you castle long your first move is to jadoop that king to b1, yeah? That king is already on b1. So if you can activate that rook like this, the same applies for black, yeah? I'm pretty sure if white plays rook a3, Levon will blitz out rook a6 on the spot just to uh, keep the psychological game going. I love it. I love it. Also, the players are getting into the positions. He already moves like A4 is coming natural in such situations. Very... Uh... Since uh, I was totally wrong yesterday about the assessment of the uh, uh, symmetry in a classical game, uh, I'm already um, doubting my understanding, but uh, I think this cannot be worse for black. Uh, generally, I think uh, this should be a comfortable equality for me because uh, I didn't commit yet with 95 and um, I should just take it slow. So I think uh, the next move should be for white, probably e3 and then he'll try to play for queen f1 and c4. So this should be a part of the plan and I have to... Uh, understand uh, how I want to proceed should I do I want to take only five or do I want to play something like uh, g6 and then maybe take at the time when I need to so you know it's important to understand if I want to play with e6 or with g6 it's uh, mm, it's going to be uh, the right decision I actually thought the first f4 made most sense we were most worried with thinking about first f4 and then if black would go f5, then g3, knight f6, d3, this type of play. Um, d4 uh, didn't worry me so much. So, but we'll see. I think it always uh, remains very interesting in chess 960 and freestyle chess. <laughs> Levon being a little cautious with his judgment today, Peter. <laughs> Yes, uh, you know, I had this feeling like uh, maybe being an optimist is sometimes dangerous because he keeps on saying from the black side that yes, yesterday he completely wrongly judged it, but he believes it should be fine. Is it fine because the position is fine or because Levon is an optimist? This is a big question because I would love to hear his opinion if he would be right. I could hear him say that, you know what, it's a symmetrical position, but I have the extra tempo, <laughs> I have the initiative, I'm an optimist, I'm going to go for it. So yeah, very interesting uh, insights. By the way, just very quickly to highlight what Levon was saying, we have been hearing him that he was saying that F4 is a move that he's worried of, was most worried of, and the line he was giving was F4, F5, G3 opening up the queen and after knight f6 to play with d2, d3, eventually going for some quick e4 and then who knows, bishop fc or knight f3 depends, uh, depending how black will place his pieces. So Levon did reveal us some insights, mm. very interesting, very instructive, but because it's not what happened, we won't be really analyzing this too, too much depth. And F4 didn't happen on any of the no. boards. So the players did not see enough merit in this setup, uh, Peter. Uh, but also really interesting how Lev feels that here, it's a big decision for him to make right now. He needs to commit to a pawn structure, not only about def defending that F pawn, but to find more spaces for his pieces. Two big decisions, he pointed out, like you're showing with your arrows. One, what does he do with White's knight on e5? Can you allow it to stay in that central position or does he need to change the structure by taking on e5? And the point, the move that he takes in it, I think it has to be timed really well. And the second decision for Lev is whether he pushes the e-pawn or the g-pawn. If you move the pawn to e6, you give the advantage of having this vacating the square on e7 where perhaps the bishop can land in and get more active from you not only control the center but bishop e7 can be there to follow up on the other hand the move g6 peter i'm trying to understand because to me e6 feels like the move you want to make here i uh, want more pieces for so <clears throat> like 
usually in chess, uh, f7 is the weakest square in the position, um, and it's weak because it's defended only once uh, by the king. Um, and here, f7 was actually uh, unprotected from the start. I was discussing briefly with my dad before um, we started whether it's possible to have two unprotected squares in, in freestyle chess, and I feel like it's possible. I feel like I've seen it, but I cannot, we cannot like immediately uh, see how to do that. So that's something that I was a bit curious about. Apart from that, I really like the pace of the game now. Um, it's very slow. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any like really weak points in either camp, so it means that you know we can maneuver um, quite meticulously. And I think um, I don't know. I don't know if it suits me or not, but it feels <laughs> it feels pleasant. Wow, so okay, all the insights from Magnus, they are highlighting about the f7 square, let, let us even bring his game up, yeah, because uh, we have already highlighted everything what Levon has said, we will be coming back to this game as well, but when we have insights from someone like Magnus Carson, then we have to kind of explain, and he was talking about that f7 pawn, and I want to give you a high five, Tanya. I'll take it. Immediately. Immediately at the starting position, highlighting that you don't know how and in which circumstance, but that f7 pawn is a weakness, and Magnus had very much the same feelings. So that's already a big step. You are feeling everything. I am improving my freestyle chess along with our audience watching here, Peter. But I think the first thing that does strike us at the starting position is always unprotected pawns and squares. And uh, before we deep dive into this action, we've got a very special guest joining us in our studio. He's the man behind Freestyle Chess. He's the man who's made this a reality. And we welcome Jan Butler here. He's with us. Uh, Jan, we're having a blast doing this. You had a vision with Freestyle Chess. Do you feel that you've achieved it? Exactly. I, as you have a blast, I have a blast like every <laughs> second. So that's my fear, and uh, I'm trying to enjoy every moment. Yeah, the time has been really flying here. There's so much happening, and we're already at the finals today, the first game between Fabiano and Magnus. Who do you think will prevail in this one? Well, of course, uh, it's uh, Magnus and my event. It's kind of our event, so of course, I like Fabiano. Jan, uh, I'm uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt. I think we're going to hand over this mic to you. Yes, right. please Very carry good. on. So, yeah, no, I am, of course, um, you know, I, I, I got to know all of the players. I love all the players and especially Fabiano. Such an amazing, amazing performance last night, yesterday, all the way through. And, um, and it was cool, like they were sitting at a table at the, with each other, Fiamo, Fabiano and, and Levon, and we were just talking, and it was just so sweet to see. Um, but for my favorite, of course, it has to be Magnus, and it is because it's our tournament, you know, he's the GOAT, you know, and uh, of course I want him to prevail and to receive tomorrow this suitcase. Yes, <laughs> this is the you, first you brought the suitcase with you. Yes. So this is $60,000 that you're holding in your hand right yes, now. Yes, in $20 bills, so it's $60,000. And uh, the uh, the second place will get this a uh, little bit smaller case with forty thousand, and then thirty thousand and twenty thousand. So it goes all the way. But that's I thought it was funny to to bring it to show it uh, to the stage, and also like the similar like our drawing where we just decided not to have a boring pressing of the button and have a number. We have all this drawing ceremony, and so the same thing is like uh, say why are the money here? I think it's boring. So I'd like here's the money, and um, that's the reason. So. Yeah, it's it's definitely something different. Definitely something very visible. You can touch it. You can see it. And um, let's talk a little bit about well, this tournament has been going as you as you were hoping for, maybe even more. And you're already planning 
ahead. Do you want to talk about this? Yes, it's it's uh, it's it's gonna it's developing by the minute. I mean, it's insane. I mean, just uh, Tanya was forwarding me last uh, night like the most amazing rap out of a car <laughs> of somebody. Right? Well, all this we get it's like a spreading wildfire, and I even have got news last night. I was nearly on the telephone the whole night. Uh, we're gonna have some announce, a major announcement, but it's gonna take still a month or two to to finalize that. But uh, it seems like uh, for me, in any way, it was exciting and it was perfect, and I was really enjoying the whole time. And I, I was looking forward to it not ending, and uh, already thinking in the beginning, first days, that we're gonna have a second event, uh, same last year, now, next year here. I can now say it's for sure, for certain that we're gonna do that. Yay! <laughs> and uh, in addition, I was thinking about and uh, doing like a grand slam of uh, freestyle chess tournaments, like in 25, so with uh, pr uh, um, uh, stages in. India, in the US and in South Africa. And we are also well along the planning on that. We might even move the time schedule up. We might even uh, uh, remove the significant the money up again, the prize money, because we now have uh, obviously a formula that works um, very well, like exciting. I, I last This morning, after all this uh, am amazing night and all these calls and so on, I felt like um, it must, must have been like whatever, 150 years ago when the people went to uh, Texas or California or wherever, you know, no, Texas basically, and just dig in the sand and suddenly doosh, there's an oil, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, uh, it's insane. It's like, so it's, it's so exciting and so, so great to see. And uh, so, yeah, we have a great future ahead of us, definitely. I'm, I mean, your whole idea with this tournament was to do something that the world hasn't seen before, something fresh. You didn't want to do a tournament like any other. You want to do something new, freestyle chess, with, for the first time, this uh, new starting position every game, classical time control, and how do you feel about it? Has it been everything that you envisioned? Yeah, I mean, as me, as not being a chess player, I mean, you you know it because you're my teacher. <laughs> so I, I um, and you know that I, I, I'm definitely like just learning swimming and organizing the Olympic Games, so kind of things. Um, so I'm definitely not an expert. This is also why when Magnus said he wanted to play 960 Fisher Random uh, on highest level with normal thinking time, I was thinking, what is he talking about? I have no idea, you know? <laughs> but uh, I made myself familiar and I got very, very into it. And I, I was so excited that I said, we have to call it freestyle chess because that's relatable to everybody. And the underlying uh, technology kind of uh, is Fisher Random 960, but we might even evolve over the years that we have. We take out several start, static positions maybe that become boring or we see that they don't make sense. So we want to be flexible on the on the technology side. We want to be also very communicative on the on the, on the the marketing side. And so this is why it's, it, uh, this, this, it, it evolves more and more. So, for example, uh, yesterday I had an interview with the uh, with, uh, um, uh, ed editor of El País. So we have a great article even in Spain in El País. And, and we talked about, like, wh what are the advantages and disadvantages and are the disadvantages all the grandmasters like you or Tanya or Peter even, and all these people have like, spent ages and ages of learning all the opening theories. Like, it's like, so uh, they don't want to throw it away, of course, right? And they don't have to because I said it's like, uh, the transition from beach, from volleyball to beach volleyball, right? So there's still this traditional volleyball going on, but you can decide, I want to switch over to the beach volleyball side. And in addition, it leaves the option for new players to say, okay, I don't want to really be in a volleyball team and be in a hall, but playing volleyball on beach is great. So you have new people coming in and they don't even have to go through the whole uh, theory. So then you can just opening up for completely new target groups. They can have fun, they can enjoy it. And then in addition, we have Miss Angola here, not for, uh, for no, not for just for fun, but because we want to also promote African chess. You know, we are living in South Africa. So we, we know her very well from South Africa because she lives there. And we said, okay, let's promote uh, African chess. I think there's only one grandmaster in the whole continent of Africa. Right. So now with the freestyle chess, and we're going to develop a new, uh, we're going to promote a new Elo system just for the freestyle chess. So that's basically we may have grandmasters in freestyle chess in Africa much sooner than than that. So it's just, and it, this is like I could go on and on and on, but it's like develops like insane. This is why, why I, I I can't even sleep anymore because I'm so excited. Yeah. No, I totally understand. Develops <laughs> by the minute, and freestyle chess is spreading around the world. Tanya and Peter, do you have any questions for Jan? Love the excitement, the energy and your vision and the fact that we'll be seeing more freestyle chess. But I think a lot of people out there, Jan, they want to know 
What was the thought and why the name Freestyle Chess? It just came to me as from the, this idea of the sports, right? So the, the development from uh, traditional volleyball to freestyle, uh, to, to beach volleyball. And then I thought about like how did other sports develop, like for example, skiing or snowboarding and so on. And that is the freestyle associated to that. So it's more, or for example, in, in ice skating, right? You have the, the duty and, uh, and the freestyle, right? So it's like this thing is associated with the, a sport where, you, where the creativity is more, than, uh, more uh, valuable than that you have to learn everything by heart. Love it. Love it, Jan, and we're so excited to see where Freestyle Chess goes and the global tour that you have planned for us next year. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. The Grand Slam of Freestyle, Oof. I call it, right? So four, <laughs> four games, so another analogy. I would like to leave this with you because I think it's a secure hands because I don't know if I place it downstairs. <laughs> Somebody has to watch it. I think nobody will come in the studio unannounced. <laughs> so I'm going to yeah, we'll leave it with you. The guard, yes. <laughs> so, the so then, and uh, you can leave it with Peter. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes Peter. exactly. We need security right out there. <laughs> Right, perfect. <laughs> we hope we've got some bodyguards placed perfect. outside, Jan. Enjoy your time and thank you for your fantastic oh. commentary. I mean, yesterday, like how many hours were you talking? Like seven? Yes. Uh, uh, awesome. uh, really, really amazing. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, Jan. You, the chess here is making our job so easy. We're loving the excitement here. We see the tour being planned for next year as well. The Grand Slam of freestyle chess. And I like it, Peter. Freestyle, it just is so descriptive about the action that we see, the rawness of a chess talent on display. Yeah, it, it suits it uh, perfectly. Well, we have been hearing, yeah, of course, we have tremendous respect for Do the you fish. Hide this <laughs> I'm absolutely fine with it. It's, I will be fighting for it. Yeah, if somebody comes, I'm ready the to fight, fight for it. So yes. this is between these two players, Peter. Yes, exactly, because one of them, one of them will get it. It will either be Magnus Carlsen or Fabiano Caruana who will walk away with this briefcase after the finals. Uh, Peter, I think we need to deep dive into the chess because we've had some moves. Um, but first, finish your thought, what you were saying. Yeah, well, okay, that, of course it, it belongs to Magnus or to Fabi, whoever wins, but as long as they are not winning, we have to keep the guard. We have to make sure that it's in good hands. Yes, I hope that everything works out to perfection and Let's uh, get back to the chess action. Fabiano Carnegie's Magnus Carsner. Do see Magnus nicely regrouping. This is the typical pawn structure, this G6, F6, E5 pawn structure. Let me just quickly highlight that I feel that this is very much in the, in the Peart uh, spirit because Black's Knight is going to go to E6 and again we're going to be seeing that White's Knight on F3 is slightly misplaced. Clearly Fabiano will try to use the D5 square. He's also setting up some quick long castles. Most probably he wants to get that look into the game from A1 as quickly as possible. We might also see some quick development on the D file. Very, very sharp position here. I love it how it's developed and perhaps we can just uh, go through with Nicholas, uh, back up from where we left it last and uh, take us through how we got here. Because we were quite impressed with Magnus's uh, and Ding's approach with starting with G6. So what was the deep idea behind it? Yeah, let's have a look from the top. We have some time now to deep dive and interestingly the players have been playing much faster than in the previous game, so maybe the position is a bit clearer to them. So g6 opening up the queen, hitting the pawn on d4, knight f3 made a lot of sense, and now Magnus immediately played for the center. Ding went for f5, which also is a very sensible move here to control center squares. d6 is to prepare e5 is another approach. We see e4, e5, so interesting moment here. White had to react to attention in the center and could either close the position with d5, which might result in some kind of King's Indian structure, however with the king on the, on the queen side quite unusual. Instead, however, Fabiano took on e5, which also is very sensible, d takes e5, and now developed his bishop to b2, b3, bishop b2, to put more pressure on this pawn on e5. Knight of 6 was played in every move, by the way. Either the computer always wants to go a4 or a5 on every move. It's, it's very interesting to me um, to see that. Now bishop b2, human move, attacking the pawn on e5. The knight dropped back to d7 to defend the pawn. The bishop goes to e2. The bishop is developed and clearing the way for queenside castle so that the king and the rook can end up on these squares. f6 was played. 
stabilizing in the center. Again, a5 is the computer's choice. Knight e3 was Fabi's choice. Bring the knight into the game. Now probably queenside castle will be next. The rook will be on the open file. I like white here. White has more peace in the game. I'm still worried about this queen. That's that's one big question. The queen is a very important piece that's not in the game so far. But other than that, I like it for white. The computer also likes it. Tiny bit better. Bishop e7 supporting... Um, Bring the bishop into the game, maybe to c5, and it's getting closer and closer, Tanya and Peter, to a normal chess position. Yes, uh, but with the big question, where is Magnus actually planning to hide his king, or is he thinking like, my king is perfectly safe there on b8, now we do see that instead of developing the knight to e6, which I highlighted like being a thematic move, Magnus wants to make sure that his bishop gets to c5 as quickly as possible. Probably he will be playing a5 at some point, but the point of a5 was that after a4 we would love to play rook a6, activate that look if we already keep the king on b8, but look at that bishop on e2. Like Fabiano has sensed it, he is ready to stop that idea, mm -hmm. yeah? The bishop is guarding the a6 square, so after a5 we're gonna block it with a4. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to also... Uh, think about that. Is Magnus, for example, after long castles, planning to include the moves uh, bishop b4, for example, hitting the rook, trying to provoke a weakness with c3? We don't know exactly if it's a weakness or not, but the first human feeling is that a c3 move should be, a, should be slightly weakening. And then after c3 is falling back with the bishop to c5, trying to hit the rook, uh, trying to hit the knight, and then activating the rook with a5. A very double-edged position. As Nicholas very nicely highlighted that everything makes perfect sense from white, sand, from white side, but the queen on h1, and the queen is the most important piece. It cannot be stuck forever in h1, but how do we ever get it into the game? Tanya, do you see some ideas, or should we simply not worry about the queen for the moment? I'd go with what you just said, Peter. I think right now the first question in this position would be, there are two plans that we're highlighting, right? A4, not only expanding on the queen side, but also eventually when the knight a piece lands on C4, it's just so much more powerful once you commit A5 because it might even force you to play the move B6. I'm putting pressure on A5. Uh, or do you keep that A pawn on A2? Because once you go A4, I don't know how much you really want to go long castle then because after bishop B4, will you further push C3, weaken your queen side pawns? So it's, it's a choice between these two moves for me. For the moment, I think it is about finding the squares for the other pieces. I wouldn't be surprised if we actually saw, I'm dreaming, Peter, of this knight landing on D5 and this knight landing on C4 one day. If I can get the structure with these knights, I would be really happy. And then eventually an idea that you uh, alluded to about a year ago, trying to push these pawns and get the queen out from f3. Yeah, that would be lovely, but how much time does it take, right? And, and we know that uh, Magnus Carlsen is sitting on the opposite side, yeah? So <laughs> I'm uh, actually imagining at some point, because one of my very first uh, question was also that really bishop e7, so does it mean that Magnus invites knight d5 with the tempo stepping in, hitting the bishop, but clearly Magnus uh, wants to continue with bishop c5, hitting tempo the pawn, tempo. yeah, and then already getting ready for c6. The reason why Magnus did not want to play c6 too early, that, uh, for example, also he after bishop e7, whenever black plays c6 while the knight is still on e3, then as you highlighted the c4 square, let's just show this, for example, oops, let me try to make the long card, yeah. For example, if black prematurely would take care of the d5 square, then we are jumping knight c4 and we might be heading toward that weak d6 square. And if we ever get the dark sweat bishop, yeah, this dark sweat bishop is the soul of black's position right now. Uh, that, that can't be traded off unless, unless this is also very important to highlight what we talked about when long castles bishop b4, C3, bishop c5 happens. If we ever give up that bishop, then by, by spoiling white's pawn structure, bishop takes c3, f takes c3, then we understand that, okay, the damaged pawn structure will compensate us for giving up the bishop, but otherwise never. Yeah, I would want to play with the bishop pair in this position, eventually open up this bishop from the a3 diagonal. I think black has to really be careful about going for this trade. Sure, you destroy the pawn structure, but destroyed pawn structure can sometimes have its own advantages. The pawn from e4 might even control some uh, squares and also give activity on the F line to some of the major pieces. 
Peter, I from a human perspective, to me, Long Castle looks like the move I want to make. More than A4, I want to get the rook onto the open D file. I want to reinforce that D5 square. But I'm still not sure if C3 would be the way forward. Yes, it's kind of ugly to move that rook from E1. But I always find pawn moves so committal in chess. Coming in the way of its own bishop, you have two squares to move the rook. Rook F1, rook G1, and exactly the idea that I wanted to show. I am really wanting to get f4 going because I want to open up my bishop on b2. So I'm just wondering if in Fabi's, if on Fabi's radar, he's also thinking about a future possibility of not pushing the c-pawn, but trying to get the central break in. Yes, uh, basically I also don't want to push that c-pawn. It's like I'm just highlighting that black would love to provoke the move c3. Yes. And especially if we know that black plays the move bishop b4 in order to provoke. Then what do we say? No, thank you. <laughs> we are not going along this uh, path. And you very nicely said, yeah, look F1, and then this knight E1, knight this looping F2, F4, then suddenly everything makes sense. The bishop from B2 comes to life, because right now it, that's also Magnus' strategy. Eh? He wants to make sure that it uh, bites on granite. That's, that's the problem of the bishop on B2. But if ever F4 comes, that's a whole different story. A whole different story. And Fabi, in... Uh, a big think right now. It's also if he commits to the move a4 uh, in the current position, then you don't know how comfortable he might be to go long castle. And he does it, Peter. It's on the board. And I feel this is the human approach. This is the move you want to make. You want to get your rook into the game. Uh, and for Magnus, head and hands one more time, fighting for this $60,000. Peter, you had to get your samurai sword for this tournament, so we could have guarded it with this. <laughs> yes, uh, I didn't know that we will be put in this uh, position. We did came with my wife by car, so I could have brought it if it would, uh, if it would have been needed. Yeah, next time, next year, I'm gonna be prepared. <laughs> and also, uh, Jan Wittner has highlighted that might be, next year, the prize fund might be even increased. Yeah, so all the more reasons for the Samurai Sword to be with us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are missing that sword right now. But you also have some uh, boxing skills, no, Peter? So I think we can count on that. Okay, some, uh, some kickboxing skills from, from my youth. Yeah, before I started to play professionally chess, between the age of six and eight, I was, uh, I was doing like two, two years of uh, kickboxing. I was also visiting training camps. I was uh, getting belts and things like I was doing the exams. I feel safe now. Okay, <laughs> good. And I was also doing Tai Chi between 97 and 99 and the martial art direction of it. So not just this, uh, not just the health stuff, but even some other things. But that's about calmness. That's, uh, that, that's, that's a different story. You know, all this while I was thinking you're Mr. Nice Guy and then you play all these badass sports, you're a kickboxer, you've done Tai Chi, it's like you're full of surprises. Yeah, well, I also played uh, 25 years football, yeah, on uh, quite a good, uh, quite a good level until my knee got injured, and unfortunately, not. I was also doing squash, uh, table tennis, tennis. I was playing in competitions as well, uh, not on absolutely professional level, but uh, in a very good amateur level. So yeah, I have many very nice uh, memories. Is there anything that Peter Leko cannot do? Apparently well, not. I'm not a good swimmer. Yeah, just before <laughs> someone says that ah, Peter is bragging. No, no, I have my weaknesses. But luckily, I had had quite some good feelings for many sports. And Jan was comparing freestyle chess to, you know, how you have volleyball, then you have beach volleyball. I think freestyle chess can be a little bit like chess boxing as well. And like kickboxing as well. Sometimes you've got a kick coming from one side, then you've got to handle another punch from the top. And it can be quite a mix of uh, the two sports. Yeah, well, it's a total mix. And uh, we are talking with the players and everybody's saying that, yeah, it's so demanding. Yeah, because when you study chess for like 20, 30 years, depends on which, uh, gen which gen generation you belong to, then it's so incredible that there is not a single position, not a single move that you can make one move routinely, yeah, which would be so natural you just rely on your class. It's a completely different game with its own rules. You, you have to have, of course, the classical education. It will help you. But because every position is so different, yeah, finding the right method to each position is uh, the, re the real true art. Well, and we're seeing some art on the board as well as the players are into the first few moves of the game. And those, for those of you who are just joining us for this grand final between the world number one, Magnus Carlsen there on our screens, and the world number two, Fabiano Caruana, 
it is going to be a big battle and wondering what are we doing with $60,000 on our table. It's not for us. We're just guarding it for the time being. One of these two players will claim the grand prize and, of course, the bragging rights of being the first ever freestyle chess go challenge champion. Freestyle chess played in classical format. I'm loving it, Peter. The world is loving it. Uh, and we're really excited to see the tour expand. Meanwhile, on the boards, we do see the action expanding. Long Castle on the board. We're talking about potential bishop moves, and that is our extreme left board, Magnus. It's Magnus to play right now. Bishop to b4 is a mover, considering the knight from f8 can jump to e6, controlling central squares. So a decision for Magnus to make. Meanwhile, Lavon has taken a decision to not let the knight on e5 stay, which has resulted in a trade on that e5 square. We see double pawns for Nordebeck on the e file, but very often that's a strength in such positions. We might even be seeing further trades in the center and a symmetrical pawn structure in that one. It promises to be uh, an explosive game. Ali Reza against Gokesh. Peter, I am liking that knight which has landed on f4 and also that king on the queen side. Ali Reza deciding to go long castle with the c file open. To me, it feels like this could get dangerous for white. Yeah, also this lovely d5 square, yeah, which uh, Gokesh is eyeing with his knight on e7 and knight on f4 and queen g8. Yeah, it's all about occupying that d5 square. If that knight can sit there, it, it can sit forever because there, there is no, no white pawn which can kick that away. And black's king on b8 feels perfectly safe. This is again, once again, a thematic position for eventual a5 moves. By the way, Magnus has made up his mind. Yeah, he activates that knight from f8 makes perfect sense. It was the move that I was expecting earlier on as a natural routine move, but yes. he made sure that first he developed that bishop to e7. Both players are taking their time. It's... I'm going to leave the choice to you, Peter. Where do you want a deep dive? Yeah, well, because now we have been already highlighting quite a lot of action here in Fabiano versus Magnus, and there is nothing really exactly move pen move tactical lines going on. It gives us the chance to maybe catch up with Ali Reza's game because White has played the move d5. We talked about that, that it's all about the d5 square. Black wants to occupy it. Ali Reza made sure that no, just before Black can land the knight on d5, he himself pushed the pawn to d5. He might be planning to kick that knight away from g3 and eventually get that knight to d4. But clearly g3 can be met by knight h3, putting some pressure on the f2 pawn because the bishop from c8 protects that knight, the rook from f8 inserts pressure on the f2 pawn, so this is again one of those very special positions, nothing common with normal chess. Interesting position. And you know, when we had the bird's eye view, to me it felt like that knight on f4, the king on the open file, perhaps feeling vulnerable. At first sight, uh, I felt black is doing well, but now that we have it and we're deep diving it, it's far from clear. I'm loving that bishop on b2 right now. As you're pointing out, that d5 pawn, it does take away a lot of important squares from black's pieces, stopping jumps, the rook placed on open files as well. But Peter, what about moves? So d5 was the last move by white. How are we expecting this game to further develop? From Gokesh's side, I think he played... Did he play d5 already, yeah? Yes, he played d5. I just want to highlight why it was so important. We talked about this, that black was just getting there. By the way, let's go back to the very beginning. That, let's do it. Let's take yeah. it from the top. Let's just go through. We have been seeing this. It was already quite unbalanced right from the start. Bishop c2, knight. Wow. Gukesh actually plays exactly the way how we discussed that knight is going f8 going for f5 plan could be. Yeah, I was thinking about b3 like being white's kind of only idea, bishop b2 and then going for d4, mm -hmm. f5, I'm loving black at this moment, but yeah, Ali Reza very energetically opted for d4, takes, takes, e d4, c d4, queen g8. So basically we're sensing correctly that black was setting up everything to be in time to occupy the d5 square. Look at this, black sidestepped the monster bishop. Yeah, there was a lot of pressure. Oops, uh, that was not the diagonal. Uh, the, the queen on h8 was under pressure, so he moves it to g8. Long castle happens. Yeah, so white has basically uh, finished 
development, but the queen is not yet in the game. And just when black goes knight f4 to occupy the d5 square, white was in time to go d4, d5. That's a game changer, and it would be very interesting to get, in, to get uh, Nicholas's insights here to understand where does this really lead us to. That's a good question where it leads us to. Well, what I can say, first of all, is that Gukesh was doing really well for most of the game in the, here when the tension was resolved as well. And also Queen G8 was a nice move to, well, step out of the diagonal. That made a lot of sense. And here again, we see it over and over in this kind of starting position. The computer loves to involve the rook going A5, going A4, also opening up this king, which is already lacking some protection. A pawn is missing here. So A5 might have been a more challenging way than knight F4. D5, a very important move that we also highlighted, had to be played before black occupies the square, opening up the bishop, and now we just have another move. Bishop f5 comes in, trading the bishops, and black still has some questions to solve. What to, what to do about the rook, what to do about the bishop, but black does have the better structure. This pawn could be a potential weakness. It, it is an isolated pawn, it is not protected by other pawns. So, now bishop f5 threatening the bishop, and White would probably trade either with the knight or with the bishop. That's a big question right now. If you, well, if you trade with the knight, then you potentially lose this pawn on d5. I was just mentioning it. It is a, it is a weakness in the white position. Also, this pawn is suddenly attacked <laughs> by the knight and the queen. Watch out. So maybe it makes more sense to take with the bishop after all. And black has the choice to take with the knight immediately or to take with the pawn. I think taking with the knight makes a lot of sense to open up this bishop. Let's say takes again, takes. And we had some changes, uh, some trades. The bishop can come out. Then castle can happen. And I think black is looking fine here. White is still dealing with this queen on h1, not in the game. This seems to be dynamically balanced, as they like to say, Tanya. Really nice line. By the way, we do have the trade on the board that you're pointing out, and he does it correctly. We'll first head over to Lab. So I kind of like the development in the game. It's, uh, you know, it's a disbalanced position because I didn't want the total symmetry. I mean, the point of my last move that um, I don't think he can play c5 because of bishop h4. I mean, the c5 square is needed for the knight, for, uh, for knight e4 to work. And I'm basically asking him to commit. So if he takes on d5, I take, and then <laughs> knight e4. If he seems like um, I have uh, the most essential squares, and then uh, taking only four for him, of course, it's uh, is more or less uh, admitting that what he did uh, prior to, to this is wrong. I don't expect that. Um, because then I get the uh, rook of faith at temple. So, uh, but other than that, I feel like um, my play has been so far quite solid. So, I'm expecting a move like knight h5, I think. Uh, well, it looks very dangerous for white, but at least it's, uh, I think, psychologically not easy to, for white to admit uh, that. Uh, his uh, moves are not the best, so he, he will definitely not take on e4 or take on e5 soon. Maybe something like bishop d3 or knight h5 is something that will follow. Uh, some sort of a neutral move. But uh, I think I have a decent uh, amount of uh, play. I, I actually, objectively, I think black should be slightly better, so I'll try to try to prove it. Yes, uh, that, those were Levon's insights. Uh, for the moment, we are still having this uh, position on our analyzing board between Arya Zafiruja and Gukesh. A very important position, a very big decision from black side, because there is this very big weakness on white's camp, the d5 pawn. So yes, there are different temptations to take with the rook on f5, mm. hitting some more the d5 pawn or going g takes f5, then try to set up a double 
attack on the d5 pawn. However, I believe that white just wants to forget about the d5 pawn and somewhere some knight d4, knight e6, oops, uh, knight d4, knight e6 ideas are very much in the air. Uh, finally, when white will play g3, the queen will be opened up. So yes, it's a, it's a pawn sacrifice, but it's a very dynamic pawn sacrifice. Black has not yet castled. Black still needs to get that bishop out from d8 in order to get long castle going. Many very interesting possibilities. However, since we got the insights from Levon, I think it's absolutely fair to jump right in there and try to explain to our audience what Levon really meant. I was uh, following his comments and uh, I would like to highlight it. Yeah, this was the moment last time we saw. Uh, he was telling us some things that white will play e3, queen f1. He, he's thinking about going e6, so g6. Well, the game continued queen f1. White is activating the queen. Black plays knight e4, so it, the symmetry is still kept. No one really wants to capture anything. White plays the move e3, playing the waiting game. And then it was Levon who took on e5. And white captured with the f pawn. This is certainly something new compared to yesterday's structure where we have seen all these uh, trades happening in, uh, with d takes e5. Yeah, so we get f takes e5, now Levon played bishop d7, bishop e2, e6. White played the aggressive c4 move. Levon played bishop e7. One thing I heard, Levon thinks that he might be slightly better, so he still is an optimist. And he says that he is definitely not worried of any knight takes e4 because he will capture with f takes e4 and then he will get rook f8 tempo hitting the queen and he will be the one winning the battle on the f file. And what really uh, surprised me was that Levon was saying that what he thinks is kind of principle is knight h5 from white side to maybe try to transfer the knight to f4. But when the knight gets to f4, black will have still the move g7, g5 to kick that knight away. To my eyes, this is just a very complex double H position where I cannot really pick any side. I have no preference here. Uh, Tanya, Niklas, uh, what are your thoughts here? It's a very complex position. And to me, knight H5 would not be uh, the move that I would be putting it as, well, the most critical move in this position. Levon has his own. He's so creative with these ideas. Peter, and he just seems to find uh, these resources these plans which to many of us would not even occur in our head and that's why he's truly like he's called the artist in the chess world exactly because of that reason again knight h5 took me by surprise uh, you know you put the knight on the rim but not only that i i i feel that this knight has to challenge this knight at some point you will perhaps have to trade it uh, I don't know how long white can allow the knight on e4 to stay. The biggest problem in this position for white is the lack of connection between the rooks and the queen here. You need to find a way to still improve the position of your own rook. The one move that I was considering here, Peter, was perhaps to push the c-pawn forward. You block the center, but what I'm dreaming of from it is eventually I might even put my bishop on b5. I want to try to take my rook out from a3, the problem that I've been highlighting. I disconnect your bishop from this diagonal. The reason I want to delay is because I don't know if I want to take your knight right now, play it on h5. I, you keep your options open. You keep the position flexible. What do you make of taking this decision of fixing the center with c5? It's a very interesting idea. Certainly, I like it because it changes the character of the game and I very much agree with you that I want to keep this tension. I, I want to challenge that knight on e4 with the knight on g7. I don't want to take it because that releases the tension. It uh, kind of gives a very clear way for black to play on the f-file. Exactly. We, we don't need that. We want to create play for ourselves. And that's why I'm loving your suggestion. c5, get that look into the game. Hint at bishop b5. And I think this is the right moment to pass it on to mm. Nicholas. Tell us what's really happening here. I will try my best. So bishop e7 on the board c5 is quite interesting. However, now black has the tactical idea to go bishop h4. And the first question that I asked myself is, well, why did Levon not do this immediately in this position? He might also play bishop h4 instead of going bishop e7 uh, to, to pin the knight. However, here white can go knight takes e4 Bishop takes e1, looks very logical. And here white has to move knight c5. Hitting the bishop on d7, the bishop on e1 is still attacked. White will get another minor piece and will be up material. Once c5 is played, you can imagine, 
now after bishop h4 there is not this idea to go with the knight to c5 so you don't have this tactical solution for white to go knight takes e4 you have some pressure here you might even lose a pawn so this might be one drawback of c5 otherwise definitely a very interesting idea the computer would like to see a trade on e4 but honestly from a human perspective as Levon also pointed out black goes rook f8 queen f7 next i don't see a lot of trouble here for white maybe you could play c5 now or you could play bishop d2 but it doesn't really seem like white is playing for an advantage here so i think levon being optimistic is is correct well he's maybe not better but he's definitely fine here with black why do the computers always kill these <laughs> ideas peter it's so hard to fight them <laughs> yes and actually, the moment it's pointed out, it makes so much sense. You know, you play c5, you take away this tactical idea of the square being important for the knight, and suddenly bishop h4, and we need that knight to keep challenging, keep that tension against the knight on e4. Uh, bishop h4 would be a really nice resource. And also very instructive how, in a way, Levon's provoking white to play c5 before he goes bishop h4. Yes, well, if uh, Levon has really foreseen it, yeah, that, uh, okay, because it's kind of also interesting, yeah, he was highlighting that in general he's very much looking forward to knight xd4, f takes e 4 structure, so one could even give the argument that, okay, then bishop h4, knight takes e 4 if we can't take the look on e1, why can't we just fix then the structure with f takes e 4 isn't this what uh, Levon is looking forward to, yeah, he will get look f8, the look is hit, clearly white will probably use the tempo with g3, I'm guessing and probably this is what Levon dislikes because now Rook F8 just to highlight the tactical justification from White's play Queen H3, not only the bishop is attacked on H4, but suddenly there is a pin on the D7 bishop and once Black retreats with the bishop to E7, suddenly we can play C takes D5 winning a pawn based on the pin on the H3 C8 diagonal. So many things to take into consideration if this depth was already in Levon's mind, then it would have been fair from him to reveal it, you know, that I played bishop e7 with the idea that I'm provoking c5, then I want to play bishop h4, but uh, that wasn't the case, and we have already seen Levon being very honest, yeah, so yes. I, I believe that if it was on his mind, he would have revealed it, maybe anyway, things like, okay, please go c5, uh, fix the structure, I'm happy about it anyway. Mm. All right, Norderberg has to make some decisions. Does he keep the tension? Does he fix the center? Or does he trade on d5? Also, what does he want to do with the knight on g3? Levon suggests to move knight h5. Uh, I'm not sure I'm Norderberg. It will be the move of choice for Norderberg. I think it, it, the player he is, he wants to keep as much tension on the board. And that knight on e4, will he trade it? Which is, according to the com computers, the best move in the position to take on e4. Uh, Peter, let's zoom out while Norderbeck handles these thoughts in his head. We can see him on our screen. Definitely all of these uh, variations that we're pointing out going on in his mind right now. Fully focused, fully involved in the game. And even though it's the fight for the third place, we know exactly how competitive Norderbeck is and Levon. They want to win this match. They are motivated for this. Of course, only for third place. Okay, this is a fantastic tournament with eight brilliant players. Uh, third place would be a very good result, uh, winning tons of cash plus qualifying for the next event next year. So there is uh, already, yes, the fourth place player also. Uh, qualifies, but let's also not forget about the format. Whoever finishes fourth will feel like he has lost the last two matches. And uh, as you highlighted, yeah, these, these players are very big fighters. They want to win every single match uh, for Levon. If he wins this, he can probably forget about yesterday's uh, marathon match against Fabi so much more easier that so he bangs the door. Yes. Yeah, bangs the door behind him. Yes, I lost there in Armageddon, but otherwise I have won all my matches, right? And Nodia back on the same time has won the, the preliminary the round robin rapid with fantastic performance, I plus agree. four. And uh, he lost to Magnus, but he wants to finish also on, on high. But I, I do believe, just sorry, that this pawn structure slightly uh, favors Levon because he, he as a D4 player might have more experience. Mm. 
And I fully agree with what you say, Peter, about the psychological mindset of Levon Aronian. It's the difference between shutting the door behind you and the door shutting on your face. This game for Levon, if he wins this, because it was so dramatic, the action that he had against Fabiano Caruana. And I think many people underestimate the kind of effect that it has uh, on your mind space going into the next game. We're seeing moves come in. Uh, as the players are not only fighting the battle on the uh, on the board, but chess is also an inner game. It's also a mind game. He does go for an immediate trade. So Nadebeck, as always, very precise, finds the best move in the position and then immediately places the bishop on an active diagonal, creating a threat with a pin on the e6 pawn to trade on d5. Now, knight takes knight was a move that Levon was happy to take. And I'm just wondering if suddenly he feels that did I overestimate the position or can he still go with the move rook to f8? Does he have time to create activity on the open f line? I feel that Leon is kind of happy. He mm. got his structure and I feel like Abdus Satov is also feeling uncomfortable about this uh, situation because he's a very energetic player. Yeah, He loves to play with pieces, he likes to attack the opponent, but this structure, this position doesn't give you the chance of doing this. Yeah, it slightly reminds me of his yesterday game against Magnus when he also ended up in some type of position which did not suit him at all and was not able to create any problems. In fact, got into trouble. Uh, I feel like there is something, the, for example, the move that comes to my mind, yes, somewhere Duke F8 or maybe somewhere Bishop C6, but I want to hand it over to Nicholas. I feel that there is, Nicholas wants to share something with us. <laughs> Yeah, bishop g4, the last move by Norderbeck up to the turf, was not a good move. The computer wanted to do something else here. b3, maybe, bishop d2, something of this sort. Bishop g4 looks active. There is the threat of c takes d5, but it is black who is going to activate every piece with tempo now. So first, rook f8 makes a lot of sense. Occupy the open. Think about something like rook a6, rook c6 to involve the rook in this manner. I mean, this must be one of many choices also playing maybe long castle here looks looks quite decent would be another choice in either case levon has the chance to to go for the initiative here and take over because his piece play flows more natural and white has promised to involve the piece on the queen side in the game yeah i feel very much uh, the same way yeah there's undeveloped bishop from c1 that, that's the piece that really hurts my eyes, because let's just imagine that White's bishop would be already developed on d2, yeah? then we would not be dealing with this bishop b4 tempo move that Nicholas highlighted. Whenever black gets tempy moves uh, and uh, they are hunting you down with one tempo after another and your opponent improves his position, this is a nightmare scenario. So what is Nodia back really that's and right. on the board already? Bishop b4 played great call there, Peter. I for me, when you mentioned bishop b4, playing the devil's advocate here, I just felt, but doesn't that actually allow the white rook? Do you even rook lift, Peter? But how? On e2, of course, there's only yes. one rook lift possible. Yes, no, My I understand. Point here is that when you go rook f8, I want to go rook to f2 and actually challenge you for that f file that you wanted to win. Yes, but the c4 pawn is hanging. Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm full. I'm I mean, always full in love with, with the rook lifts, but no, rook f8 and then we trade the rooks on f2 and I take right, dc4. Alright, so let's see, because this uh, was... Uh, it's also possible, but you can maybe play rook f2 or something. Rook f2 and also there are potential d5 someday that I'm looking at. Yeah. Alright, but let's see your line, Peter. Rook e2, yeah, rook, rook f8. f8, rook f2, you trade, I trade, and now, I take and now you take out the pawn. Honestly, with this pawn structure, I don't care, but I have to play my next move. Yeah, you have to come up with and, some... Oh, he doesn't rook left, by the way. So, rook to d1. All right, maybe he didn't like giving up the spawn. Yeah, and here I want felt... to highlight that bishop c6, bishop d5, cemento is in the air. Which is why I was hoping yes. to get in d5, but I don't know if this really helps white that much, Peter. Yes, your and king. He... Yeah, so in general, I felt like from the start, the starting position was already kind of dangerous for black simply because after d4 white will get to play e4 quite quickly um, he chose a very direct approach like with playing uh, g6 f5 followed by fe4 rook e4 d5 which i absolutely didn't expect because it weakens the dark squares especially e5 very much 
but yeah, it had some idea because also like d4 was hanging and c3 is not really the move I want to play because I also opened up my king on b1 with this bishop f5, f1, yeah. So I think the way I played was kind of okay right now. I'm pretty happy with my position. I think I should be better. I'm not exactly sure about how much, but for now the position in itself is good. Time, yeah, my time is not great, but I would say it's still kind of okay. So also since the position now kind of has cleared up, I think it will be easier for me to play maybe a few faster moves and then also have no issues with time. So yeah, overall I would say quite good start to the game, but still a lot of fight ahead. Wow, I feel like Winston's the real freestyle rapper here. <laughs> I mean, his lines, he's just on it, Peter. Uh, let's quickly jump over to that, then we will check in with our marquee matchup. Uh, what was Winston talking about in this position? Take us through the analysis. Yeah, he just revealed that he was as surprised as, as we here in the studio that Ding followed it up with this knight f3. f5, f5 might have been still normal, but this d5 move, uh, we, we talked about it, unless black shows some true brilliancy right away, this is a very committal move. And uh, Vincent just said, I continued normally, naturally. I was playing against the dark squares. I was making natural, simple moves. Yeah, black is going for this c5 break, but no, 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 this, this can't be correct. Takes, takes, bishop f4 check, so black loses the right to castle. But okay, that's not an issue because black gets quick development, but white is always having the upper hand because he can't coordinate his forces. Beautiful, bishop c2, long castle is coming. Yeah, it's, uh, it's happening. Long, queen f6, long castle, clearly, if after rook a d8, it would be black to move and he could play e7, e5, it would be a game changer, black would be fine, black would have uh, compensation for the damage pawn structure, but white plays the move knight d4, hinting at the f5 pawn, and also there is a hole on the e6 square, potential b4 moves are happening, so black had to play the move e6, Vincent plays the move f3, very stable structure, he is happy, he did spend a lot of time, but made sure that everything is coordinated, he can speed up, and he is very much looking forward to the rest of the game. Yes, and uh, I think it's clear why. You look at the position and the queens that we've been highlighting on every single board, whether it lands onto G1 on this really nice diagonal, setting up some eventual tricks, or even comes into play from F1 to B5. White spawn structures, white piece play, the control in the center, this beautiful knight on D5. Sure, you can kick it out, but will you ever be able to do it without creating your own weaknesses? I think the answer is no. Although with that last move, perhaps Liren is hinting at that. He defends the F5 pawn, and now he wants to start kicking the knight. But Peter, now I'm already looking at the idea that yes. I was mentioning. Exactly. Maybe this little move, Queen G1. Lose pieces, drop off. LPDO, E5. I don't know if the check works, but at least I'll have knight takes f5. Yes, and with queen g1, you are already setting up this deadly knight b5 check. For example, even if black stops it with a6, we still go knight b5 check, mm. most probably. Yeah, because that king on c7 is feeling uh, awkward. Maybe even the tactic with knight takes f5 works. The key move is queen g1. Yeah, once yes, you see... Yes, I really like it. Yes, you highlighted queen g1. I was leaning back. Tanya knows what's going on. That's the spirit. Black is in a lot of trouble here. Peter, commentating with you, I think uh, the chest rubs off on me a little bit. Once in a while, I can uh, get it right, but Queen G1 is not yet on the board. And I'm just wondering, how do you continue attack with after B6? Because you create so many weaknesses. I'm already smelling blood against this Black King. Yeah, even uh, some B4. Yeah, B4 is not a weakening anymore because we are getting Bishop A4 in as well. Where's the knight even going? You yeah. have to fall back to some really ugly squares here. Yeah, and uh, B6 weakened all the light squares. Yeah, very very scary. I don't know how Lidan is uh, planning to continue. I think he's trying to play quickly in order to compensate for his ugly position by putting pressure on uh, the Vincent's clock. But uh, the position is so nice from white side that I don't feel that uh, clock will be any issue here. Yeah, Ding just can't seem to catch a break in this tournament. It's been so difficult for him and I think... Uh, he just wants it to be over. He's, you see him coming out of trouble in so many games right out of the opening, not getting the kind of stable position. I think it was just yesterday with the black pieces against Ali Reza, the first time that you saw Ding actually get a position to play for. It ended in a draw. It's been a tough one and this is going to be a tough battle for Ding, but let's go back to our main battle. 
uh, the finals between Magnus and Fabi. And Peter, before we deep dive into the live board, I think we should go back, take it from where we left it, uh, because this position is now definitely exploding with a dark squared bishop trade being offered and potential weaknesses on the dark squares. Exactly, yeah, with bishop on a3, queen f8, black has improved his position. I really like this. And also this knight b6. This is a very nasty move because you are challenging knight on d5, you are hitting the bishop and knight takes b6, a b6, never an option for white because then you're going to get checkmated on the a file. The position is extremely complicated. I do like how the game has progressed for Magnus. If my intuition would say that I want to be black, but in order to understand and to, to, to see what really had happened, let's hand over the floor to Nicholas. Please, Nicholas. And Nicholas, maybe you can just take us through the last couple of moves that happened that we missed out on? Absolutely. So we left around here of the bishop e7, castle was played, and now knight e6, the knight was developed. Kawana want to solve this issue with the queen, bring the queen into the action, goes queen to f1. Carlson mirrors him, also going queen f8, hinting at a potential bishop a3, which we're going to see in the game. Now bishop c4 activating the bishop, hitting the knight on e6, which was responded with knight b6, protecting the knight, also potentially trading on c4. And Fabiano played knight to d5 forward. Here Magnus could have traded on c4 immediately, instead he goes for another approach. He wants to trade the dark squared bishop so that these squares, the dark squares on the queen's side are more accessible, are weakened for the black pieces. And this is the current position. Fabiano is thinking and Peter was already saying he intuitively he likes the black pieces and Andrew agrees. Well, what is, what is white going to do here? Can trade on a3, the queen takes, king goes to b1. Now this pawn on f6 is hanging, so maybe you even want to bring your queen back or you can defend in another manner. Maybe you can even go for the attack with a move like knight c5 and saying if you play knight takes f6, then I'm going to checkmate you in just a few moves. Knight a4 takes, knight takes a4 and queen b2 is unstoppable. So this is probably what Magnus is going for here. I could imagine it. King b1 and knight c5 to, to immediately use the weakened squares around the white king. Fabiano must be feeling the pressure here. The bishop a3, just that black is having well-placed pieces. This knight is really not in the game. This knight looks active, but it's not doing so much. This bishop can be traded at any moment. The only downside is this rook on a that I can see, but maybe even black has the potential at some point to involve it via a5, a4. Magnus is looking good. Tanya. It's looking very scary for Fabi, uh, Nicholas, as you're pointing out. I mean, especially allowing that queen on a3, the knight jumping onto a4, I, I don't think there's any reality <laughs> in the universe. There's any alternate alternative universe where white actually takes on a3 in this position. <sighs> Even if there's a way to save that, you just don't allow that queen on a3, knight c5, knight a4 ideas. Unfortunately, there is also no reality in the universe where you can actually avoid the trade of the bishops because of the king on c1. If white had an extra move and the king was on b1, you can perhaps fall back with the bishop if you just point that out. Imagine if the king was already on b1, you don't ever trade your key bishop. Peter, it just feels like Magnus has managed to get the game going, the attack going, the queen, which was stuck on h8 at a very active square, already putting a lot of pressure on the white king. Meanwhile, white hasn't really achieved a central break that we were talking about early on. The queen from f1 still blocked by its own bishop. The knight on d5, it sure looks like a pretty piece, but there are no active targets for it. The more I look at it, the more I like it for Magnus. It's not only ideas against the trade, as Nicholas pointed out, a5, a4, I'm trying to think of a way that white can actually keep the defenses up. I would love to make the move bishop b5, but I think you just go c6 there. You're not even coming in with a direct threat. Taking on b6 opens up the file for the rook. I'm struggling to find a move for white here, Peter. Yeah, I think in order to handle this situation, white has to acknowledge that he got absolutely nothing out of the game and should already be forgetting about trying to fight for an advantage. Yeah, Because once you understand this, that 
wow, yes, I did start with the white pieces. I was hopeful because it felt like I got something, but Magnus just masterfully, really, basically when, again, one sees this position, somebody might be thinking that I'm always overstating the case because it's Magnus. No, it's not because of this. Look at this after d4, he played the move g6, and I was very critical that, yes, it's, what is the idea behind g6? And when now after move 12, we look at this position after bishop a3, everything makes perfect sense. This pawn structure with f6, e5, this is, this is fantastic stuff with knight on e6. Against White's knight on f3, that knight on f3 is doing absolutely nothing, is shut out by Black's construction. There is feeling like, all right, you are getting the center control at first, but I'm going to challenge it with e4, e5. This is the true peer spirit. And we do know that Magnus likes to play the, the peers, uh, especially in online chess, but also he has played it in classical chess as well. And d takes e5, d takes e5. This is common knowledge in the peers that releasing the tension actually helps black because you regroup the pieces and that knight comes to e6. But how he did ma magic, how did that knight go to e6 and another knight to b6? <laughs> Just one more time, knight f6. So yes, once again, he knows that the pawn belongs to f6, mm. but before he pushes it, he is not in any rush. That knight from g8 is getting transferred to d7 to have all this flexibility. <laughs> this is true art, and that's why Magnus is also taking his time at the very beginning, invests all the time, envisions all these kind of scenarios that how do I want to place the pieces in long terms. That's, uh, that, that's really unbelievable to see. White is making natural moves, but it's slowly getting outplayed. It really is, uh, Fabiano is getting outplayed. Yes, the situation is of course normal for white. White plays the white pieces, but lo look at everything makes perfect sense from black side. And the chess of freestyle chess, Magnus's pieces just land at the right spot. We saw it in his match with the black pieces against Nodebeck. Again, a game where it felt he just outplayed with black. When B5 arrived, it was... It was a Magnus Carlsen show. He has this incredible ability to piece these different, uh, different concepts and ideas on different sides of the board. This understanding of where the opponent's weaknesses are, what structures he wants, where are his own piece placement. We often talk about Magnus' raw chess skills when it comes to the middle game play or, of course, his very famed endgame touch. Peter, do you think when we take out the opening element from chess, when we go into... Freestyle chess, when we completely remove wow. any home preparation. By the way, Bishop is on the, on the board. Yes. And we might be seeing some checkmating ideas because I don't believe King D2 is possible. Has to run. Big moment for Magnus. Knight C5, Knight A4 looks like a huge threat on the board. I see our eval bar says that there's still a way for White to keep it together. But the question I wanted to ask you was, Peter, as Magnus thinks, that do you think if we take away the home preparation element away from chess and go into freestyle chess, Given Magnus's raw chess skills, how he just feels he's better than everyone and every single, a little bit better than every other chess player in different parts of the game, do you think there's a bigger difference between world number one and world number two in freestyle chess than in classical? Well, I think it's too early to call. At the beginning of the event, Magnus was suffering, yeah, but also he was always highlighting that he wants to play classical. Fisher and on freestyle chess, yeah, because he, to my eyes, and we have been commentating now rapid games, blitz games, and also classical games. To to me, it looks like rapid freestyle chess and classical uh, freestyle completely is different. too completely different. Because if you are like a perfectionist, yeah, you want to find this harmony, symphony of every single position, yeah, then you need time, yeah, you need time. And in the rapid portion, we have been seeing the youngsters outmatching the, the kings. And I feel that that was very much connected with the time control, yeah? That the younger generation, they don't care so much about perfect, they, they just make moves, they are very happy, they enjoy the playing element. And in this classical uh, portion, we have all this true art, this finesse, these delicate moments to the maximum. Understanding And, and this, this suits Magnus, of course, perfectly, but... That's what I thought. Let's not rule out Fabiano bouncing a comeback here, because White is still fine. Absolutely. It, there is no taking away that. And also the chest that Fabi has shown in freestyle. I mean, it's been incredible at an incredibly high level. But one just gets the feeling that Magnus 
it, I wouldn't even put it on his top form, but his normal form, his usual standard form, not even Magnus at his best. It just feels freestyle chess really plays to Magnus's strengths. Fabi, of course, you know, he's also an extremely universal player, one of the greatest in chess. Uh, but we often talk about also how opening preparation, I think it was Anish who said that he believes that Fabi is the one player with the best opening preparation amongst the very elite in the world. I wonder how that dynamic also changes with freestyle chess just taking it away. Magnus right now though on the screen looks a bit, sh he's shaking his head. He's got no reasons to be unhappy about the position. Well, I think that we have seen after the trade on a3, he was very much focused, like he had foreseen that maybe I have this knight c5, knight a4 ideas going for the attack. Let's just highlight once again what already Niklas showed us, shocked us with this uh, sensational attack. But at the same time, probably Magnus has found a way for white to deal with that. Maybe that's the slight disappointment because Magnus already is trying to get something out of this game. Just equalizing is is not really the the task that makes him happy uh, i'm trying to make some sense and since it was nicholas who invented the knight c5 knight a4 sacrifice i think it's fair to hand it over oh we have a move wow and magnus goes back wow. so nicholas just tell us what was really happening after knight c5 well knight c5 was definitely a tempting move to to initiate these checkmating ideas on b2 around the white king, but black, white has ways to deal with it. Either maybe go rook d2 or maybe also to go rook e3. And now it wouldn't work because once you play knight a4 immediately, the queen is hit by the rook. So you're not really able to checkmate white here. And Fabiano would have seen this idea coming from very far, of course. So instead, Magnus said, all right, well, I'm not going to checkmate right now. Let's just bring the queen back. Let's play this positionally. Queen f8, protect the pawn on f6, which was hanging. Maybe c6 can come next to push this knight away to provoke white taking on b6 when the rook is opened up and just play on the dark squares here and enjoy this position. Typical Magnus move, he, he just wants to press this position. Peter. Tranquilo, yes? Tranquilo. I think, uh, to my mind, I feel like sometimes Magnus' chess is just from another planet. I mean, your queen is on a3. You know, we're looking at these ideas of knight c5. And then he just finds this. He just wants to keep the tension on the board, comes back, defends that f6 pawn. That knight will come to c5. To me, it's really surprising, Peter, that he didn't go knight c5. Well, but it's probably the move in the spirit, yeah? He just wanted to make sure that the dark square bishops are traded. Yeah, as Nicholas uh, pointed out, yeah, c7, c6 will increase the pressure. So at the moment, it looks like queen f8 is a calm move, like nothing is happening. Black is agreeing that the game is more or less equal. Yeah. <laughs> but after c6, yeah, if white has to retreat with that knight, then suddenly you will really have some very unfortunate pieces. Knight e3, knight f3, not... Uh, doing much. Yeah, that knight on FC is the big problem, the, the headache. I keep on uh, highlighting this because it really is. And then eventually, once you kick that knight away, A5 will come. Yeah. And Magnus will wow. say, why should I castle if I can activate my rook like this and uh, ask so much uh, questions to your king? A hundred percent. This is the calm before the storm. And a move like Queen F8, this is such a deep understanding of the position. Magnus calculates it through, says Knight C5, tempting. He finds the resource, as Nicholas was pointing out, wants to keep all the tension on the board. Once A5 comes, it's going to be a nightmare for uh, Fabi to handle. And meanwhile, Fabi's still struggling to find his own counterplay in the position. The bishop, the other piece which hasn't been developed, is absolutely fine there. It's doing a great job of defending the king, keeping everything safe on the king's side. Uh, Peter, Queen F8, big questions to Fabiano Caruana. He's still got 26 moves to make. He's 35 minutes on the clock. There's no increment. And when Fabi will come even, will burn even more time, have less time on the clock, I think there will be bigger critical uh, questions to be answered once that apon starts moving down the board. Let's bring up our bird's eye view as Fabi goes into a big thing. And uh, wow, a lot has happened, but what catches my attention... The rook lift by Nodirbeck, no? Not a Didn't back. he do your rook lift? 
Rook e two, rook after. I thought he played rook d one in that situation. Yeah, and then bishop d two. He traded first ah, the bishops and he was forced to rook left. Yes, but it's it's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, now it seems like he controls like the f file now, or he, he challenges. At it. least he doesn't need to worry. Yeah, because we were already kind of slightly worried for him. It looks like his position stabilized. Not about doing the rook left. It looks like his position stabilized. Meanwhile, with all of uh, black spawns on that e file. They are weak, long-term weaknesses, questions to be handled. It looks like Nodebeck is in driver's seat. On our extreme right board, I think, Peter, the idea that we were pointing out that eventually did happen. Black was forced to play b6, create more weaknesses on the king side. And Vincent, look at his pieces. The rooks lined up on the d line, the queen and the knight eyeing the queen side where the king is. It just looks like a Vincent Keimer party in that one. Uh, Peter, things... Looking good for Winston there and for Ali Reza. I see our eval bar seems to say that the white king on d2 is not going to be safe despite white having... No, white has an exchange down as well. Yeah, he sacrificed an exchange. It's a position exchange. Sacrifice the knight on e6 is a monster. Yeah, that that is not a pawn on c7. It's a bishop, yeah? So black has this... Uh, Slightly damaged pawn structure also, so that's why the king on d2 feels quite safe, that pawn on d6. Maybe if we would remove that pawn, the king would be mm. much more un unsafe. Then rook a6 would hit the knight on e6. Yeah, it's some kind of a magic play by Ali Reza. On the other hand, uh, probably it's, uh, it's a very complicated battle because black has so much to play for as well. Uh, the rooks are uh, active. Highly yeah. yeah, without really going it's, into the depths of that position, it's impossible to really judge what's going on. We will in a few minutes from now as we go into a short break. But before that, a big reminder to everyone, today is the last day to submit your entries for the Freestyle Rap Challenge. Come up with a crazy, a fun, a creative rap on freestyle chess. You can make it as long or as short as you want. Do not forget to use the hashtag Freestyle Chess and you will win this uh, very cool, I'm reaching out for it right now, but this very cool set of playing cards which are signed by the players themselves. It's a limited edition and you also get, Peter, help me out with this, one lucky winner. We will be announcing the lucky winner at the end of the broadcast uh, on the final day. It's always tricky, it's yeah. Always it's tricky. so big. Yeah. This is what you win from the Weissen House, a very special edition freestyle chess goat challenge. Tavel, I believe, a microfiber tavel. Peter, some amazing prizes, signed playing cards, and we've been getting some incredible entries. Have you heard of the rapper called uh, Lil Giri? Well, I did, did hear something from Anish yesterday. Yes, yes, sounds good. Peter, we're getting some amazing entries, including um, including this one. He's one of the rappers, one of the 10 rappers that Eminem is scared to diss. Uh, and Peter, we did promise that we will be, that you will be busting out the bars. All Please right. take it away. All <laughs> right, so Mr. Anish Giri, the Twitter king, as I like to call him, a part of that a top 10 player, a fantastic person. And his rap goes, his pawns are pretty, knights weak, rooks are heavy, there is bishops in the corners already, queen's pathetic, he is nervous, but on the surface he looks calm and ready to draw games, but he keeps on forgetting what the theory was, because it's freestyle chess and not classical. Whoa, and you did it, Peter, that was amazing. I survived, yeah, let's just say I survived. <laughs> By the way, at night, instead of going to sleep at around 2.30 a.m., I started writing my own rap, you know? Oh, you're coming yes, up with an uh, entry. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm coming up, but I already have some kind of uh, ideas, yeah? I think, uh, let me even uh, find it one of my favorites. But it was now I'm under pressure. Now I'm under pressure, but Peter, I'm loving time. it. Yes, we are waiting for your uh, entry into our freestyle rap contest. So come on, chat, get going, bust out those bars for us, and one lucky winner will win some very cool prizes at the end of the finals. Today is the last day of the entry, uh, so do not forget to use the hashtag freestyle chess. We'll be waiting it out. That was awesome, Peter. That was amazing. Well, thanks to Anish, yeah, <laughs> because he was really helping me out there. And then we've got our signed cards uh, by the players as well. A little bit of art on Magnus. It's 
drawn by Magnus himself, the glasses on him, the hot shaped glasses. All right, chat, as the games heat up, we will go into our first short break. Uh, get ready, get on Twitter, send us your app, and then come straight back for some freestyle chess. Day six marks the final day of the semifinals of the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge in Weissenhaus. It's the players' last opportunity to showcase their skills and secure their spots in the finals. It's a very exciting day. It's uh, Valentine's Day, but there's going to be no love on the chessboard because we've got the elimination day for the semifinals. Uh, so Noderbeck and Fabiano Caruana have to strike back against Levon Aronian and Magnus Carlsen. We'll have our two finalists today, and I'm really looking forward to the action. Chess is more than an ancient board game. It's a highly complex sport, demanding strong memory skills to process information efficiently. With countless variations and moves in each game, players must remember and apply specific strategies to gain an advantage. This could be the primary reason why millions of people worldwide stream this game every day. The live stream that we produce here is like the most extensive one we've ever done. We have like all the small cameras that look through the pieces. We have a professional booth, we have heart rate, we have like touch screen. There's all kinds of elements. And to be honest, only like the software part where I'm very involved with, uh, it takes up months to actually like prepare and then develop and stuff. 48 cameras in total are installed to capture each move of the games. Today, Magnus Carlsen, Nodirbek Abdusatorov, Levon Aronian and Fabiano Caruana are fighting for the top positions. However, by the end of the day, it's Magnus Carlsen who claims the first spot in the finals. Nodderbeck is good at you know, uh, adjusting to new positions. Like I've seen in several games that he plays the opening relatively well. He knows how to use his uh, queen, sometimes in non-standard ways. And I feel like I'm hitting my form at least a bit, so regardless of my, my play, I'm very optimistic. Magnus Carlsen's opponent will be the Grandmaster Fabiano Caruana, but who will emerge as the ultimate winner of the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge in Weissenhaus? Stay tuned and follow the finals on freestylechess.com. Gukesh Domaraju, a chess prodigy born in 2006, has already left an indelible mark in the realm of chess. At merely 17, he boasts an ELO rating of 2743, securing him the 16th position worldwide, not just India's youngest grandmaster, but also the second youngest globally. Gukesh's precocity knows no bounds. His historic triumph over Magnus Carlsen in 2022 established him as a formidable force. More than just a chess enthusiast, he represents the dawn of a new era in Indian chess, surpassing the legendary Viswanathan Anand in rankings, a feat unachieved for over 37 years. His journey, a blend of innate talent and relentless dedication, continues to inspire, cementing his status, not just as India's pride, but also as a beacon for the next generation of chess maestros. Gukesh Domaraju, born in 2006 from India, currently holds the 16th position in the chess world rankings with an ELO rating of 2743. His career peak so far, an ELO rating of 2758 and the 8th position on the global stage. Please see more at the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge at Weissenhaus. Alireza Firuzia, a chess prodigy born in 2003, represents France with an ELO of 2760 as of January 2024, peaking at 2804. Ranked sixth worldwide, he's lauded for his meteoric rise, becoming the youngest to surpass 2800 ELO at 18. Beyond the 64 squares, Firuzia intrigues with a dual career in fashion design, merging strategic finesse with creative flair. Despite not clinching the world championship spot, his prowess earned Magnus Carlsen's respect, leading to a mentorship. Ferusha's multifaceted life reflects in his achievements, 
including a FIDE Grand Swiss victory and top finishes in Rapid and Blitz World Championships. His journey symbolizes a blend of traditional mastery and modern versatility. Ali Reza Firuzia is a chess prodigy from France, born in 2003. His current ELO rating is 2760, placing him sixth worldwide. His highest ELO was 2804, and he achieved his best world ranking position at second. Please see more at the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge at Weissenhaus. The top two chess players in the world are locked in a battle for the finals of the Freestyle Goat Chess Challenge. It's all happening at the stunning Weissenhaus and we are being treated to some stunning chess. Positions are being stabilized. Let's bring up our bird's eye view and jump right in as the action does heat up. We have our first result of the day and Winston Keimer gets the job done against Ding. Once again, a battle where Ding was in trouble right out of the opening, Peter. Yes, yeah, somehow whatever Ding comes up with somehow doesn't feel right. And I think this is the typical way when you get confused. Yeah, when you get confused right from the beginning in his very first game, he lost the control, lost the, the balance. And freestyle chess became his enemy. I, I really feel like that he, while the other players are enjoying, they feel like they are getting all the energy from the position. Yeah, whatever poor Dingran is doing here becomes, uh, turns into dust, basically. It just, Completely insane to see him go d7, d5 or move for again a very committal decision. Why on earth do you do that? Yeah. And everything that happened afterwards is the logical punishment on the highest level because these guys will not give you a chance to come back to the game. They know this is the chance. Ding is a very strong player. We have to use this moment. And uh, Vincent masterfully, we have already seen all this. So let's just go back to the position where we left. Yeah, knight h6. Uh, the game featured the move we discussed. Yeah, Tanya, you also highlighted Queen John. You're loving it. The tremendous pressure on the c5 knight. Knight b5 is threatened. Uh, we were already debating how to protect this position. b6 was played. Vincent followed yeah, it move. up with b4. Our moves are on the board. Knight d7. Queen e3. Just a simple little move, but a very effective one hitting the e6 point. There is no defense. Also, that knight on h6. Everything is uh, disorganized. E5, 
which is already total desperation because it loses the d5 pawn, and probably there was already nothing better. Knight b5 check, king b8, rook takes d5, white collects the pawn, and not only he wins material, but he's having a completely winning position. That's why uh, Dingrian did not even manage to put up some resistance, because, okay, takes, takes, simple and effective, queen d3 hits the pawn on f5, that bishop on c2, a6, kicking the knight away, but white even has the intermezzo with queen d6 check, and Ding said enough is enough, because he will lose some more material, queen takes d6, knight takes d6, the pawn has to move to f4, and this is a catastrophic structure, yeah, you, you will just end up losing all your pawns, the knights are dominated, white has beautiful pawn structure, a great win for Vincent. Classic display of transformation of advantage. Your opponent makes this early mistake of d5, strategically weakening the dark squares. Vincent tactically responds to it, creates play against Black's king by piece, placing his own pieces at the ideal square, finding that g1 square for the queen, a dark square, jumping in eventually on all these uh, e5, d4 points that we are highlighting. A weakness that's only possible. Take that d pawn and put it on d6, Peter. Let's just hover it. If you just show that. If this pawn was on d6, there's so much more to defend here for black. But this early move caused so many weaknesses. And in the end, using tactics to win a pawn and eventually trading it off into a winning endgame, a crushing victory by Winston Keimer. But the job is not over as the players will fight it out in game two for Ding. He has to win on demand. Uh, Peter, while this was a blowout, things have eased out a little bit on the Magnus board. And if we just quickly jump to our marquee matchup to get an update, very different from where we left it last. And I want to start from the move queen to f8. How did uh, Fabi manage to navigate the storm? Yeah, by acknowledging that he has nothing in the position, yes. Yeah, so he shouldn't be playing for advantage. He needs to find a way out to stabilize. I do believe that he finds a very nice way by going a4, just making sure that he's already anticipating blacks. Uh, a5, a4 moves. Uh, he's also asking some question that, okay, yes, you're going to play c6. And we are also seeing some live moves. Knight takes b6, a b6, also very nice because now black's b6, b5 move is uh, covered. We see a trade on e6. That's surprising, but uh, white is activating his queen immediately. That's the justification. King c7, queen c3, queen c5, rook e3. Protecting the queen and here things heated up because the players played a couple of trades, rook e d8, yeah, fighting for the d file, Fabiano has captured on d8, Magnus answered with rook takes d8, and that's exactly the current position. It does look like, to my eyes, tiny bit better for black, mm -hmm. yeah, to my eyes it's tiny bit better for black, while we see the evil bar slightly maybe preferring white, but to my eyes, whenever I see this structure, I'm just biased, yeah, this, I'm, I'm so much in love, Nicholas, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Yeah, I want to highlight a very important moment. Magnus had a chance to uh, achieve a great advantage, or at least a clear advantage, in this moment. He played the most natural move anybody would probably play. He took back with the bishop. However, to take back with the rook would have been much stronger. And you're probably wondering, why in the hell would I take back with the rook? And the idea is that after queen d3, black can go b5. And now if white takes on b5, now you see the purpose of the rook on e6. The rook can swing over to the a file and black can develop a very dangerous attack here and is clearly better. So you want to play this b5 move and here, well, if white cannot take then already black is definitely asking some uncomfortable questions, threatening to take on a4. What does the computer want? Maybe queen d8? to go for the end game but even going into this end game and take on a4 looks good you could also keep the queens on the board this looks really dangerous for white so this was a very important moment because after bishop takes e6 queen d3 now if you go b5 we see another advantage of the rook being on e6 here black can a uh, white can excuse me trade the queens for example with queen d6 check go into his end game and doesn't have to worry about much. So that was a big miss for Magnus and maybe we get a chance to ask him about this moment later. Now in the current position it is fairly equal. Uh, White doesn't have to worry about king safety anymore. We'll probably go into an endgame soon and 
I would expect to draw in this one, Tanya. To me, it's just amazing this line that you pointed out because it just feels like you recapture with the bishop almost instantly. Yeah. It's a bishop that hasn't been developed and instead the computer points out just how strong it is. Do you even rook lift, Peter? Yeah. Is the point. Wow. <laughs> to be rook honest, takes it, bishops so yeah. it's just spectacular. If uh, Magnus would have played rook e6 and then he goes on to... F well, basically, if you... F See Rook e6 and you understand the idea behind it, you go for it. He would be so proud of himself, yeah, because this is one of those double, triple exclamation mark moves which are possible due to the freestyle chess, yeah. In every other classical, traditional chess, Bishop takes e6 is from 100 times, 100 times the right move. Yeah, this is all this very special scenario. He will be kicking himself if, if the game ends in a draw, which is the most likely right, right now. By the way, we have a current position Just, after rook d1, rook e1. Yes, and this was the critical moment. Such an unnatural recapture to take it with the rook, with the idea to strike on the A file would have been a completely different game for Magnus, but he makes the most natural move. And it would be interesting to know how much time did he really spend yes. on this? Because I have a feeling that perhaps it was quite instant to take with the, the bishop. And wow, we are seeing maybe a setup of a repetition because rook yes. d1, rook e1, rook d8 had been played. We're just rushing over to that. Rook d1 controlling the last, the, uh, the rank, the first rank getting the rook into activity, being offered a trade. Magnus says no, comes back. So that's Fabi offering a draw, essentially, and offering a repetition at least. Yeah, it's a silent draw. And he goes in. Magnus goes for it. He knows exactly that there is nothing in the position. Yes. Yes, look at No e1. weaknesses, Peter. No clear activity for the bishop. If you trade on c3, white's king comes forward. The knight equally strong as much as the bishop. And I think this one will end now. And we see Magnus. He comes back with the rook to d8, rook to e3. I think it's going to be handshakes. And there we have yeah. it. The players looking at each other just to get a clear sign that, yes, is it true? Yes, it is true. Yeah, they don't mind. The well, if Magnus would have said, no, it's not true, Fabi would have been arbiter. <laughs> rook to e3 is a three-time repetition indeed. Uh, but Fabi really navigated through those complicated moments, especially queen takes a3 and queen of it. But can you imagine if, because his idea, and I was praising him, understanding that he is not fighting for advantage anymore, and a4, bishop takes e6, he is just in time to shut things down, and if rook takes e6 would have appeared, and that, that's hard attack time, yeah? It's the rook takes e6, b5, b6, b5, creating threats against your king, the players discussing. Yes, and we've got the players still analyzing. out trying to see on the board what line they're looking at yeah i think he's highlighting that he was very happy with his structure yeah that this structure is so but i wanted something more out of the position but i was unable to well if he will be told that rook takes e6 was a golden opportunity that will be a game changer then i want to see magnus here in the studio and when nicholas tells him <laughs> you know you had a chance rook e6 how magnus will react i'm already all for it I don't think he even realizes it until now because they would be analyzing that line. It's so easy to miss that moment because nobody's tapping them yes. on the shoulder and saying, you know what, there is something in this position. And you always recapture with the bishop just almost instantly. And we see Magnus and Fabi there still involved in the analysis. But at the end, Fabi kept it under control. He managed to find the way through a difficult start in the opening, but also Magnus really achieving that desirable setup with black, getting that knight from g8 all the way to b6. Yeah, that uh, knight f6, knight fd7, knight 6, d7, because there was a knight on f8, yeah, just to be precise. And now all lies on the, on the Nodier back Levon Aronian game. Finally, the position heats up, which means that this is very much Nodier back steady. Rook c5 was the last move. Where did this rook come from? Probably from c1. Look at beautifully the arrows. Tanya, tell us, what do you think here? Can black defend? Peter, there's a threat on the board. Well, first let's point out, you can't take it. It's pinned. The queen on e6 is hanging. And because of that exact same reason, white has uh, not only winning a pawn, but winning the game if you arrive on that A file, because there will be checkmate to follow. So the big question, and I'm looking at a potential trick here, Peter. Can black actually go back to c8 in this position? And you want to trap the rook on d5? Yes. But if you play c6, I have the d6 square, yeah? So I can probably take on c8. 
I want to just highlight the point that if you, well, you can't take ah, on A. Ah, no, I mean, I take, take on, on C8 A5. and on D5, but yes. you want that to look. But you can't you because B A6, no, it's just, yes. but my idea was to get even more fancy, but let me just show the main line here, Peter. Queen C8, you take, I take, you take, and I come in with the rook. I'm just scared Yeah, then the E6 pawn, right pawn. yeah, and C6, I have rook D6, yeah, it's uh, so easy to. Yes, and C6, exactly, you don't trap the rook there. Yes. As you very quickly saw, Peter, yeah, rook that D6. this just leaves the square here. Yeah, okay, if king c7, you can put up some resistance because no, the rook on the, the pawn. Yeah, no, of course. I think rook e8 kind of feels like the only move to protect that queen to stop this rook takes a5 trick. But then there are ideas like queen, queen b5? b5, exactly, queen b5 hitting that pawn. And if rook d8, then rook c6. And I don't know, I'm very worried. And this pawn might even be moving forward. Okay, queen e7, yes. Okay, it's ugly, but we are still holding on, but white is in the driver's seat. Uh, besides, maybe we even uh, missing some other stronger op option, but Levon in the trouble and Abdul sort of up on the clock as well. Maybe it's time for Nicholas. Nicholas, are you ready? I think Nicholas is ready as always to highlight some more finesses here. Yes, of course, always ready with the help of the computer, of course, it's not so difficult. Yes, not about putting up the pressure, also in general with the structure, with the protected pass e-pawn, that is really a huge trump in Nordebeck's position. In the last few moves here, rook c1, now b6, allowing the queen to come in, king b8, and now this surprising move, rook c5, as you guys point out, white is threatening to take on a5, and what is and also what is threatening to to play rook b5 and queen takes a5 and it's not so easy to do something against it the computer is suggesting queen d7 rook b5 following up now what it wants to take on a5 just grab a pawn and maybe here's the moment to to activate the rook in some manner rook f1 rook f2 even though i'm not really seeing what rook f1 is really doing aha maybe to play queen c6 queen c4 something of that nature but even here queen takes a5 queen c6 queen c3 looks quite solid however maybe now king b7 followed by rook f2 and black is getting the counterplay that he needs however however once again after rook f1 there's not only queen takes a5 there's also the move e6 and you also have some something lined up here so for example now after queen takes e6 oh, even rook takes a5 using again this pin threatening the rook threatening checkmate black can still defend with queen c6 but it's not it's not a good situation so after rook c5 there's really no clear way forward i was just wondering about this move rook f2 but i could imagine that here Yes, queen takes a5, queen c6, queen b4, some a5 ideas. Also, the black king is feeling quite unsafe. And Nordebeck, from a worse position, turned this one around, is now putting up pressure, and Aronian in a, in a very tough spot here, Tanya. Nicholas, can you uh, take, it, uh, take us through what just happened in the last couple of moves? Uh, all right, we will get to this game, because we're, for now, being joined... Uh, by very special guest, Magnus Carlsen is in the studio with Nicholas. Uh, Magnus, a draw in the first game against Fabi. Did you feel that you had some chances in this one? Um, I did feel from fairly early uh, point that uh, my position was slightly more pleasant. Uh, I don't. I don't really know. I don't really know why, but it's 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 the old like the. Pawn on f6 is really effective against the knight on f3, and that it felt like that knight was having difficulty finding um, finding work. I also I also did not feel that his plan was uh, uh, with b3 and bishop b2 was particularly good. I, I I thought the bishop is not doing that much there, uh, and going for quick development doesn't really doesn't really help when there's just nothing in my position to attack so i felt that i felt that i was a bit better uh that i could uh play for an advantage but uh, at, at a certain point i just didn't um i don't know i i think i didn't find the um the critical 
point, I, I, I'm not sure there really was any, um, but I think I somewhat rushed with my move bishop a3 because I realized after taking that I probably have uh, have nothing now and the game is just going to peter out into uh, into um, a draw. Uh, but um, yeah, maybe I, I didn't see anything really after other moves as well, but it, it it felt like with accurate play that I could definitely have gotten something. So in that sense, it's a bit disappointing. Yeah, let's get into the details together. Maybe the first question for you. What opening did you write on your score sheet today? Well, modern, since I s replied uh, with uh, g6 and d6. Right. Against uh, an e4 setup, yeah. Exactly. And uh, yeah, were it, you expecting this, or were you happy about the uh, opening phase here? I had no idea what to expect on, on move one. Honestly, like d4 surprised me a little bit, but... Uh, I was just, you know, um, trying to to think on my own, and and I mean, it's it really is. It really felt like such a solid starting position that um, that I could make common sense moves and be and be and be fine. And here, like, I've already opened up for my my queen here, so it feels like he has to be like a little bit careful about the position opening up. And once he sort of uh, defines the structure in the center by exchanging. Then I, I think I'm just, um, I'm, I'm just completely, um, completely fine. Yeah, yeah. As you said, um, B3 is probably a structural mistake. Maybe he needs to try and and go for a setup with C3, B4 at some point, and then possibly castling kingside at some point. But it's, um, yeah, it's it's not so it's not so easy. But I think yeah, B3 is, uh, it's just not a good plan, and. Okay, um, it felt as, yeah, this felt normal, um, getting the knights to decent squares, getting the bishop out. Um, not here. I mean, the engine is showing that white is slightly better. It felt to me that I was slightly better or that it was at least easier to you play. You were but, soon better uh, here after but, queen f1, I think, already, queen f8. Yeah, maybe this is just low death. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Uh, bish yeah, bishop c4. I think bishop c4 was clever, actually, because um, the trend in the game was not so good for him. It, it felt, at least to me, and I think to him as well, um, that my position was easier to play. So this was an attempt to... Um, uh, to force the game a bit, uh, since he's threatening something, now he's jumping in with the, with the knight. And I, I'm just curious as yeah. to whether this move is any good. Uh, I was thinking that he was going to play a4, and the problem is I cannot play c6 because of, because of this. Um, just to show this real yeah. quick, queen takes, bishop takes e5, wins the queen. And if I if. If I don't play, if I don't, I don't, if I don't have the move c6, I didn't really see. Like, can't be showing that black is better, but I have no idea how. So uh, let's have a quick look. Uh, should I go like a5? Computer wants to take the bishop also on the previous ah, move. I wants to take and then a5. Oh, this is actually, oh, this is actually instructive. And white position looks excellent, but in fact he has, yeah, he has no no plans. I can go like bishop b B6, Bishop, B7, Long Castles, something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah in general, and, this unfortunately, I was not good enough to realize this. Yeah, in general, this A4 or A5, the computer very often want to do that, to involve the rook maybe without uh, yeah, yeah, of castling. Yeah, course. of course. No, no, yeah, that's, that's true in, in many lines. Um, like, as soon as you see a starting position with the king on B8, A8, or G8, uh, sorry, uh, g8 and the rook on h8, uh, or vice versa with white. You you have to consider the move a5, a4, h4, h5 on every on every move. Um, uh, for me, it was simply a case of I didn't want to necessarily define the pawn structure too early, since I thought in some cases I might might want to go c6, a6, and go for b5 after he. Um, uh, at least after he castled, so I didn't feel like. Uh, but Go yeah, many. this is actually very instructive. Uh, I like this. I like this a lot that you can just um, that you can just trade on c4. I somehow didn't consider that properly, but my position is just so just so solid that there's just nothing he can do there. Um, it is very solid and sorry. yeah, yeah. My my thoughts didn't reach much longer than I take queen takes bishop c5. Uh, 
and I'm not really threatening to take on f2, so I thought king b1, and I kind of stopped here, which is really stupid. Just to show if black takes yeah, on f2, there's yeah, too much this play is, this on, is the, insane. on the Yeah, this is insane. Uh, so I kind, of, I kind of stopped here, concluding that white is fine, which is um, clearly a positional mis misjudgment. So, yeah, it's very interesting. Well, bishop a3 is also very logical to trade the bishops, and we are expecting maybe that you want to follow up with, follow follow it up with some attack with knight c5. Yeah, knight c. This looked uh, this looks looked quite pointless to me. E d5. He goes queen e1 exactly. next, threatening b4, and honestly, I have no idea what I'm what I'm doing. Like I'm just misplacing my pieces. It felt um, so. Yeah, I was in no mood to to go for murky lines like this. I was kind of, I mean, knight c5 was my original intention, but I was kind of upset with uh, the fact that, um, yeah, rook e3, um, yeah, it was, uh, I, I was considering lines, lines like uh, a5 yeah. here, but once again, yeah, okay, knight d4 maybe, but queen once e1 again, also. just queen e1, and yeah, can't be showing that black is better, but this was counterintuitive to me. It, it seemed to me that the queen is the queen is out of play, and um, yeah, I, I didn't I didn't like it at all. All right, uh, we, but but maybe I, I mean the game was not so interesting. That was just mass there was there was one interesting moment like, which we would like to to hear your thoughts about. Um, after a four c six knight takes b six a takes b six. Did you consider rook takes e six here? No. So this seems I mean, to yeah okay that's uh, yeah sometimes you know your like positional filters um, yeah didn't even occur to me yeah the idea but is to push b five yeah. immediately so after queen d three b five and then to start an attack yeah of course um, I, I I mean I see it as soon as the move is on the board but no I didn't consider it but it I mean I'm not gonna argue with uh, the engine evaluation and it, it is, it is very logical. Uh, and if I'd spent more than one second on taking back, um, yeah, then okay, yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, bishop takes e6. Peter also said a hundred times out of a hundred, a normal standard chess game yeah. you take with the bishop, but here this was probably the last chance where you could, where you could have claimed an advantage and then it just petered out to a draw. Yeah. Still, solid game with the black pieces, draw in the first game, good result after all. Maybe feeling, a little, feeling like you missed a little bit of a chance here? Yeah, I, also, I mean, I have to say that I felt pretty shitty and energetic from the mo morning today, so mm. uh, that was part of some of the decisions that I, I made that I didn't, you know, didn't feel like taking a uh, taking risks because I was worried I was going to start missing things. Right. Tanya and Peter, do you have questions for Magnus? Well, the move that you played there with knight g8 to f6, I felt like, can we just pull that up? Because I thought that's true mastery. Yeah? That uh, We know exactly that black wants to place the pawn on f6. Yeah, you highlighted also that pawn on f6 against knight on fc. But then finding this composure that first you even maximize your uh, harmony by developing that night. Uh, please tell us what did you think here and how did you find this calmness to go for it? Um, yeah, I uh, just felt that uh, it's such a quiet position that I that you can afford to maneuver very, um, very slowly. So yeah, the it's clear that uh, the knight needs to be out of out of the way. I mean, maybe it can go to f6 and then uh, h7. Um, h6 f7 but it's clear like from e7 that the knight has no prospects so i just felt that it's a slow position let me uh let me take let me take my time like you know what you look at the black position like what can go wrong <laughs> as, as long as you like meet a4 with a5 then there's just nothing that white can do uh nothing much that white can do so um yeah um it just felt very very natural to uh, to bring the knight first, and it's it's of course like a very pleasing <laughs> way to to play when you have so much time to uh, to maneuver, especially when you don't feel like 100% sharp. Then it's better to take it easy. 
Thanks for sharing your insights on the game, Magnus. Just uh, was wondering if you were following the semifinals between Levon and Fabi yesterday. Um, yeah, it was a crazy match. <laughs> um, obviously, you know, Fabi had a million chances to um, to decide it, so it was extremely deserved that he went through um, in the end. But yeah, great show. And uh, it's really fascinating to see what happens with the uh, with the polls when you know when it's up that. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I'm like I wouldn't say I'm calm when I play, but I know that I cannot play with that kind of polls. Like you just stop, you just stop thinking, <laughs> and everything goes uh, south. I mean, no, we've rarely been... seen you over a hundred. Honestly, you're always very low. Even even this one time you were playing against Ruja, you had like. 30 seconds on the clock, and you were still at 80. Hard yeah, rate. but the th uh, oh, was that when you were losing in the room? When, when I was losing, yeah, because I was uh, sort of mentally resigned. So mm. <laughs> that was maybe the explanation for that. How do you manage to keep so calm in these crazy positions? Um, I have a lot of experience, but I, I don't feel I don't feel calm. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> all right, Magnus, thanks so much for joining in and sharing all your insights from today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Magnus Carlsen, he will be back for his uh, final classical game tomorrow against Fabiano Caruana. It ended, the first fight ended in a draw. And Peter, as you we were discussing that mo moment, Rook takes on E6 is so difficult to make. And this is what we were talking about. From a human perspective, you instantly capture with a bishop. Yes, exactly. Like, he called it the positional filters. Yes, like Magnus highlighted that, yeah, if he would have spent more than one second on bishop takes e6, because that's what we are talking about, yeah, that in freestyle chess, you can never really just lean back and rely on your class. Yeah, that's, that's what makes this chess something special. And here, Magnus felt fell victim he fell victim of his super class that he knows that bishop e6 is a, tem a tempo move. Uh, you have to take with the yeah. bishop, of course. You don't even consider it. Yes. And he said if he had just paused for a second, for a moment there, it might have come to him. Of course. But you don't even do that. You immediately just pick it up. And that was uh, sort of the decisive moment. But also Magnus had this feeling intuitively that perhaps he did miss something. Yes, because he he was highlighting that he was so happy with his structure, yeah, that Fabi couldn't do anything to his uh, construction. That f6 uh, pawn against the knight on f3. We talked about this team, uh, but yeah, I believe we should be heading right to the life back to the live action because level nine is done to 13 minutes. Wow. That's not a lot of time without an increment, and he's under some pressure. Under pressure and with major pieces still on the board and the king feeling a bit of the heat with the rook and the queen lined up. Also, I want to highlight a potential future plan at some point, Peter. White might get another piece to the party, in this case a pawn. The move b4 and the idea is not even to capture on b4 but actually to just really break open the queen side. Yes. You have to watch out for this. Yes, exactly. It's such a scary position because this pawn on e5 is such an asset and look at that pawn on c7 yeah this is a backward pawn white has perfect coordination the c6 square yeah so white can land something on c6 which will support the e pawn also end games these ideas on pressure on the b6 pawn yeah and b4 a5 is just a direct way of busting open uh, black's uh, king side I'm just going to back up to rook c5. Yeah. This is when we checked in with it last. So we were talking about the idea of rook a5 and Levon, he needs to respond. He did. He fell back with the queen, so he sidesteps the pin. He keeps the queen connected to the d5 pawn, also eyeing an inf infiltration at the right time. But Peter, the problem that I see with this move is that it actually comes in the way of the rook getting activity. And once the queen does leave the seventh rank, the e pawn gets a free pass to roll down the board. Levon does step up, he doesn't move the rook, so there's another pin to deal with on the board. Also, the attack on d5, now defended with the move rook d8. And finally, we see Nordebeck rook c2, controlling the second rank, not allowing black's queen to f2. And Levon, has he made a move? Not yet. Peter, despite material balance and such few pieces on the board, I think it's far from easy for Lev. 
Yeah, very difficult. And we do see that the computer's evolution dropped after the move rook c5 to c2. So maybe there was something better Nicholas can reveal us soon. But I just want to add before handing it over to Nicholas that humanly speaking, rook c2 makes so much sense. Levon is done to back then when he played probably 50 minutes. You make sure that black has zero counter play. And we know that Levon is very dangerous. If there is something to be found in the position, he will find it. And we are setting up b4 because exactly, we are covering Peter. queen f2 check. Correct. This is the whole point that Rook C2, it's such a natural retreat, keeping things under control and setting up, like you're saying, the idea that will open up Black's King. Nicholas, we're loving the move Rook C2. It doesn't even matter what the eval bar is saying because practically it poses such difficult questions to Levon. Uh, what's your opinion on this and was there something better in the position? Rook C2 is a natural and a good move and... No, I don't think so. The engine is also not sure. It, it, it is first saying rook c1, but after queen g6, uh, going for the pawn on g2, I don't really see what the, what the follow-up is here. Rook c1, yeah. Yeah, it's so just... let's focus on the game. Uh, rook c2, queen protecting d7. pawn on g2, queen and we have happens. a move. Yep. Queen d7, going for the queen trade. However, this rook endgame is still quite uncomfortable because white has this protected pass pawn on the e file. So white could trade now or allow black to trade. That's also a big question. But let's just say for simplicity, white trades. Of course, occupies the only open file in the position, going rook f2. And we do have a move. He plays immediately rook f2. He says, I'll let you trade. I'll let you trade, goes rook f2. And yeah, if... if Black takes on b5. This is just improving the white structure. All of these pawns are fixed now. The pawn on b5 is grabbing a lot of space. This rook is active. Black cannot take. Black should not take now on a b5, but should probably go queen e6. All other moves are clearly worse already. And again, we can consider moves like b4 and maybe open up the, the queen side and with nine minutes on the clock, this is a tough position to defend for Aronia, Tanya. Yeah, really nicely explained there. But that move that you were pointing out, rook c1, I, I don't see that happening. It, it's just so hard to understand. Rook c2 is the move that you want to make. Ironically, Peter, after Levon having both heavy pieces on the f-file, it's not a back who lands up with the control of the f-file. He says, sure, you want to trade queens, you're going to trade on my terms. If black takes on b5, it might feel like you're actually ruining the pawn structure, but on a deeper level, that's not true. Because this, these two pawns now really fight against the three queen side pawns. You take care of any advances. There's no way to actually actively get to the b5 weakness. You can't really attack it. Meanwhile, white has a free hand on the f file, the e pawn combining that. Eventually, we might even see the king side pawn moving. This is far from over, Peter. Well, it's it's almost over, but in Black's uh, <laughs> from Black's perspective, because yeah, you just roll the pawns on the king side. You can also play b4, a b, king b3, and then you are advancing there as well. And Levon did absolutely right. He found it. Yeah, he did not trade queens, of course. He plays queen e6. Now that White's look shifted from the c file to f2, the queen on e6 feels much more secure because there is no more rook c6 coming. Yeah, hitting uh, hitting the queen. I won b4. Yes, but at the same time, the rook is now not uh, fully focused on mm. the queen side, right? But y you might even not need the rook, yeah, just to cause some destruction because that black queen will have to guard the f7 entry. Let's just highlight that entry square, that f7 square. And if you go b4, a5, your idea of breaking Should we there. Should dive into this? Yeah, let's, let's take do a that. Look, Peter. So b5, I, I think you have to take, you ha right? Yes, I have to take, and you push a5. Yes. What's going on here? And we see that black screen on e6 can never move because then rook f7 will decide the game. And how do I coordinate? Do I play king b7, trying to get rook a18? That would be kind of a natural human reaction, king b7. And let's point out that queen d7, white simply takes on b4, right? Yeah, but even just takes, takes on b6, king b3, that looks also looks... so nice. Yeah, oh, hopeless. that's super professional. So you just trade into a clearly better endgame where black's the one who's got to deal with all the weaknesses. Peter, you're pointing out the resource king b7, getting the rook onto the a file. This uh, makes a lot of sense. By the way, we have a move and yes. it's not b4. It's on the other side of the board. So keeping the tension, flexibility on the queen side. 
uh, Nordebeck first trying to provoke some more pawn moves on the king's side, provoke another weakness is perhaps weakness on the king's side. Yes, yeah, so on the other hand, uh, the only reason why I'm not sure how to evaluate this, clearly he's trying also to play against Levon's clock, yeah, he, he still has oh, half an hour kind mm -hmm. of, and he almost yeah, true. automatically played h4 to keep on the pressure, but from left's perspective, I feel like king b7 is a move that yeah. you feel like, okay, that gives us stability, we don't have to worry about b4, a5 anymore, because then we are in time with our rook a8 counterplay. On the other hand, Levon has to not think that, do I stop that h4 pawn with h5, mm -hmm. but then maybe white will play b4, you never know. So, and if king b7, h5 will do some harm, there is so much to think, and he doesn't have time. And not a bad, he's such a practical player. He doesn't take too much time to make this decision. He's not only playing on the clock, but the position as well. Levon, meanwhile, does play King B7. Nordebeck immediately responding with the move H5. There are still nine more moves to be made to make time control. And Levon is touching the seven-minute mark. There's no increment. That's less than a minute per move that he's got. And there's still a lot of pressure on the board. For, no for Levon, he would love to trade queens, but the problem always, the moment you move the queen from E6, White Rook infiltrates to the seventh rank. Nordbeck, he's posing some practical, objective challenges for Lev, Peter. Now, h6 is not a threat on the board. So what if I make a quiet move? What if uh, Black decides to play a quiet move? Can you try to actually challenge but the rook? then already h6 comes. Yeah, be careful. Let's Whenever, see that. Rook yeah, look this on h6 and... I can't take with the queen because yes. the rook is hanging. And gh, and, oh, look at wow. six. Okay, this is amazing. Yeah. That you actually clear the f6 square for, for your rook to land into. Yeah. And the queen is just overloaded, having to defend the c6 square, the rook. The pawn on h6 will fall. This is bad news. Really nicely pointed out. So even though it would be Black's dream to actually trade off the rooks, you don't have enough time to do that. h5, Peter. So what would be the response for Lev here? But you know, the line goes on because after h6, you have c6 intermezzo, yeah? Because once now with king b7, rook d7, queen e6, you can eventually try to kick white's queen out from, from b5 when h6 happens and then you can take with the queen. Mm. So yeah, the, the point is that Nodier back practically tries to put the pressure on, on Levon, but on the other hand, Levon is stabilizing. We have a move. He decides to actually not allow h6 under any circumstances. So after h5, he blocks the h6 or the h pawn. And Peter, I think it is with this idea. It would be a dream for Black to get rid of these rooks. Rooks off the board, I really think you can hold this position. You put the pawn on c6 and you're looking for queen activity. Well, but still, I want to go rook d7 be, be, next. Yeah, yeah, of course. No, rook d7, rook f7, if you can do that. Now with king on b7, that's why this rook f2... And then rushing with h4, h5, it's it's a bit strange because there was this possibility to push b4 before black gets his king to b7. Is Nodia back maybe uh, getting carried away by the fact that Levon has little time? Yeah, that's the illustration why black really needs that king on b7. And Levon found it. He realized that uh, it's a threat he needs to fight against. And Nodebeck now goes into a thing, but perhaps a big missed opportunity there, not going for the immediate forceful b4. Yeah, and I think now it's the right time to involve Nicholas. Nicholas, do you have some updates for us? Yeah, Nordebeck took a slow approach with going h4, h5, but maybe it would have been more challenging to, to, to try to go b4, a takes b4, a5, a line that we highlight in king b3 here in this direction. However, objectively, it should also be fine. Rook a8, let's say rook a2, and now well, this is a difficult move to play c5 here to use this diagonal, this potential if white takes this d4 check. This would have been, I think, more challenging with little time on the clock for, excuse me, for um, Levon. Instead, we saw a slow approach and a new move, rook f4, maybe preparing g4 next maybe trying in the future to open up something but if you ever move the queen away black also is getting the counterplay by moving the queen to c6 so not easy really for white to break through or make progress levon still has to make eight moves however to reach the time control to get another half an hour to get also the 30 seconds increment per move 
And rook d7 was the move we were looking at, but I was thinking maybe white can maybe white can come in here to f8 now, and I was a little bit worried about that. F7, rook e8. Rook f7, maybe rook e8 then, yes. And, and, and uh, the e-pawn. Oh. If the e-pawn is off the leash, then it's looking really, really dangerous for black. After rook c8, uh, after rook f8, you could play in a different way, maybe play c6 here. However, Nicholas, these are... just a second. Can you highlight, please, the queen c6? Yeah, that why after rook f8. Yes, that what absolutely. What is the devilish trap also? Queen c6, uh, you cannot play because of rook b8 check. The king is deflected from defending the queen, and white wins the queen. Did you have another question, Tanya? Or? No, no okay. that was. We this just wanted we to highlight, okay. yeah, for the public. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so rook f4. What did Levon play? C5. Whoa. Whoa. That is a very committal move with five minutes on Whoa. the clock. Objectively, it's okay, but big decision, Tanya and Peter. Big decision by Levon. And it was a voluntary decision by Levon. He had uh, no reason to go for it, but perhaps he didn't like the lines exactly that were being pointed out. Rook d7, the move that you want to make, but once the rook steps into f8, uh, it just forces black into more passivity. Not easy to find moves in those positions. Levon trying to break free, but the clock... It's going to be a big factor now, especially after this move. Yeah, this is now escalating. Uh, however, Levon is also highlighting just what Nicholas said a couple of minutes ago, that in this crazy B4, A, B4, A5 line, there was somewhere some stunning C5 computer move, yeah. which was probably very much on uh, Levon's radar. Yeah, If he's signaling to us that, guys, tranquilo, I see all these crazy ideas. I'm a maestro. And he goes for c5 with there less than five minutes on the clock. There's no tranquilo in this position anymore, Peter. And I want to jump in straight with the line that we need to look at. White can't take this pawn. You can't recapture because it's pinned. What Lavon has in mind is to give a check. Of course, he's not going to take this pawn because the queen needs to stay connected to b6. Just highlighting that point. You give a check. And I believe that if you fall back with the king... Somehow this move doesn't worry me so much because you can just trade and even just take on c5. If you were to fall back with the king, black just perhaps keep advancing, keeps coming towards uh, that uh, key square on d1. Well, well, intuitively I wanted to go up with the king to a3, for example. I feel if... like we've seen that happen before as well in Levon's game. Yes, <laughs> yesterday, yeah. I'm, I'm learning from those games, but I'm uh, f quite afraid from the white side to play d takes c5, to be honest. Yeah, opening yes. up all these lines and I have lost enough games against Levon, you know, to be worried if I see Levon, I want to shut the game down, not to open my king up. One idea I want to just quickly highlight is that after d3, maybe there is something to be said for the move c6 because black isn't able to recapture. There's a winning check on f7, forcing the black king to lose connection with the black queen and you'll just end up losing material in this position. King yeah. a3 is a nice resource, Peter. But after c6 check, you black can just play king a7, for example. Yeah, I don't know. And we always have queen e7 yes. check against c7 and this d3 pawn. That d3 pawn is advancing. Yeah, forget about our beautiful e5 pawn. Yeah, that was a protecting passer. Now black has a one on, on d3 and this one is way too out of control. Completely out of control. I mean, you're just not stopping it yeah. at all. There's nothing defending this pawn from queening. So taking on c5 would be very dangerous. You win a pawn, but you might be down a queen very soon. Yes, and I'm trying to understand how often did Nodia back already played against Levon because he might have underestimated Levon that okay Levon has a passive position and so on to my mind if I connect Levon with this position it was clear that he's only waiting for the chance to somehow jump out of it and c7 c5 is on the board and Nodirbeck is not taking his time to try to understand things but black already has something to play with he found is a big move with little time on the clock uh, and I think you see d takes c5, you see d4, and intuitively, you don't need to calculate it all the way through, but intuitively you feel that you're going to have enough for this pawn. Yeah, absolutely. And okay, after c5, Nodiabek is taking his time. He was insisting on, I'm just going to slowly improve on the king side. Yeah, h4, h5, look f4, g4, and, and try to play on Levon's nerves in the time trouble. And all of a sudden, c7, c5 comes, and intuitively for me, it's not so difficult to add something, because I just feel like black gets counterplay, and I'm not happy about it. All right, my question to you. If white just waits, I want to understand how does Levon actually plan to... Uh 
go ahead with this move c5. What what are your de decisions going to be with the tension in the center? Let's say that I do follow it up with g4. Well, for example, I play c4 and I trap your queen on f5. Uh, I mean on b5. It's also, and I'm just sitting and waiting. Mm -hmm. How do you improve your, the position? Yes, the queen on b5 is actually a wonderful piece. I just, uh, and the computer hates my c4 move. I don't like the moves myself. Just wanted to highlight, yeah, no, that you, you have to deal with such questions, yeah? And the queen and the rook are so disconnected from each other, it's hard to find a coordination between them. Yeah, but here white will, what I'm worried of, that eventually white will break up with g5 and then put that rook away and h6, and the queen will be overloaded because if that queen ever has to move black position for the part. Yeah, so and that's the let's danger. show that. You can't go h6 right now because rook is hanging. Yeah, but the point that you want to make, Peter, is that in this position you'll have the f6 square. Yeah. And uh, of course, we'll first go back with the rook. But this idea you have to watch out for. And the queen is overloaded because there's a check on f7. So there are threats on the king side as well. C5 currently on the board and Nordebeck now slows down. You know, he rushed in with H4, H5. He played in Rook F4 quickly, playing against Lavon's clock. But this move has not only taken us by surprise, but Nordebeck as well, Niklas. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is a... You were saying it's such a bold move. I think most players wouldn't even have it on their radar suddenly to open up the seventh rank, to weaken the Black King, to... To, to change the character of the position, but this is Levon, he's always looking for active, dynamic play. And I think it was a really smart, practical decision because he's getting the counterplay. And, well, Nordebeck has to decide. He can keep the tension with a move like g4, maybe queen b3. But now that you allow a trade on d4, and black, after this trade, has also a very strong pass pawn on the e5. Very, very unusual pawn structure that we see here with the pawns in the center of the board, both sides having a protected pass pawn on the e5. And now there's the threat of rook takes e4, watch out because of this pin, but black can avoid it, for example, defending the queen. And it looks pretty, pretty equal, especially because black always now has counterplay. And the rook end games, for example, that we saw earlier were bad for black are probably now not not critical anymore because you have this strong trump as well. And if you do take on c5, the lines that you were highlighting already were, were absolutely correct. Black plays d4 with check, king drops back, d3. Now rook f1 makes sense to, to stop the, the d-pawn. And maybe d2 would be too early, maybe this pawn could be captured eventually by white and white might have an advantage instead you would need to play the move rook d5 which is not that difficult to find you pin the pawn you want to win the pawn c6 check here the king goes to c7 as tanya mentioned queen takes c6 allows rook f7 check and you cannot do that at all so king c7 and one line i was looking at was queen a6 here to infiltrate with the queen but black can take on c6 this looks pretty scary actually that i look at it because the rook can come from both sides but apparently there's nothing to be done rook c1 there's rook c5 and black always has this huge pawn on d3 which is really really important and this should end up in a draw and rook f7 check then can be answered also by rook d7 you have to be careful about these lines it looks very scary but in the end Black is safe and this, this is also equal. So Nordebeck is calculating and he has to make a big decision if he wants to go into complications with d takes c5 or if he wants to allow black taking on d4 but then at least structurally he doesn't have any advantage anymore and this is a big moment for Nordebeck. Very nicely explained that. And I think it's just hard to walk into allowing these lines, even if the computer shows that white is doing fine. You have to be so careful because you could be completely lost after grabbing on c5. And uh, we're zooming out for just a moment. We see that Magnus Carlsen, Fabiano Caruana in the big final. Their first game ends in a draw. Fabi kept everything under control, but Magnus also finding the creative way out in the opening. But in the end, it, it was not enough against the world number two. Winston with a destruction on his game with the white pieces. Tingleren went wrong in the opening. An early mistake, D5, and Winston never gave uh, the world champion a chance to come back in the game after that. Ali Reza Gukesh. 
Peter, the board is on fire. Yeah, that's a fascinating battle. I feel like... Uh, Should we jump in? Yeah, let's jump in very quickly because after we will have to jump back to Levon. Of course, he is in time trouble, but now Nodia back is taking his time. We also see on camera that he's getting nervous because he understood that it's not that one-sided affair that he was really hoping for. But this is a golden opportunity and what on earth is happening? Yeah, Gukash is also down to 8 minutes versus 14 of Aliza. But look at that king on a8 and the rook on a7. That rook on a7 is the one that, yes, guards the king but it's out of the game. White has total domination. Knight e6, queen d5, rook, d5, rook e4. And the king in the center feels so secure. We talked about this, that the d6 pawn, this backward pawn, gives the shelter for White's king. On, on the D file, mm. I feel like uh, Ali Deza is very happy here. Let's do a quick material con first, Peter. White is down an exchange. You've got a pawn for it. You've got a knight and a pawn versus a rook. Now, mathematically, that doesn't go in your favor. But look at the pieces and the piece activity here. That rook that you pointed out, is that even a rook? It's got no targets at all. And I like this move because Gukesh is trying to change, again, the dynamics. When you're worse in chess, when you're on the defense in chess, you want to look for trades. You want to look for pawn sacrifices. You want to look for ways of even giving up something in return just to create a chaos and a mix in the position. Another trump in White's position is the F-pawn. Peter, with this knight guarding the F8 square, at some point, this pawn will start marching down the board. And the queen and the knight combo that we're seeing in the center really just takes care of the whole position, makes it impossible for Black's major pieces to line up on the C-line to try to infiltrate against the White King. And it's one of those rare occasions when the king in the center is feeling absolutely safe. The best move for black would be pick up this pawn, throw it out of the board, but that's illegal in chess. Yeah, however, there is good news for Gukesh and for all the Indian fans rooting for Gukesh and everyone else who is rooting. He's such a great player and such a gentleman. We have had him in the studio. After trading the dark squared bishop, exactly. Now he has some ideas like queen f6 going against White's king. We, we talked about it, that White's king is safe. But now that the dark squared bishop has been traded off, suddenly there is a hope, there, there is real hope for black to eventually get to that king. I intuitively feel like g4, g5 yeah. would be the thematic move, of course, to stop queen f6. But somehow we feel that now let's just go back to two moves. We were told, look at that bishop on c6, beautifully guarding the king. And Gukesh very nicely using the moment, going for bishop a5. Mm -hmm. Ali Deza basically blitzed out his next couple of moves, which indicates that he thought like this is a fourth sequence of moves. We do see the Evil Bard claiming that there might have been something in the air. Doesn't matter. Peter, Doesn't matter at says, all. Yeah. At all. Because this is again a routine move. You take, take, look before making sure that that black look on a5 still gets completely stuck out of the game. And after queen e7, we are expecting g5 to follow up because you can't really allow queen f6, queen c3. Yeah. All right, well, Gukesh finding his chances, trying to get, because it's all about the white king. Gukesh needs to get his heavy pieces to infiltrate. Meanwhile, big updates coming in from our fight for third place. So, Peter, with Levon solo on the clock, let's rush straight to that. We left it at c5 and Nordebeck, he took his time. He took about seven minutes to think this out and goes for the most critical line on the board. These young kids, they're always playing concrete chess. They rely on calculation. They don't care about intuition that much. And for Nordebeck, he does take on c5, d4 check on the board, and now, Peter, he doesn't make the hand move of just coming back. And I'm thinking if he's thinking like you right now, which is good news for Nordebeck, <laughs> might be time to step up on the board to a3. Yes, on the other hand, I would also highlight that I very much trust Nicholas's uh, analysis, and <laughs> he was highlighting this king b1, d3, rook f1. The move that intuitively felt to me like, if we have to retreat and black gets this pawn to d3, on the other hand, Nodirbeck has decided on d takes c5, clearly knowing that d5, d4 will be his, Black's next move, and he's posing again. This scares me, yeah, because mm. it, it shows that he doesn't have an absolutely clear vision uh, how to follow things up. It's not that he missed d4, that's yeah. for sure. What often happens is that you have a clear vision of you want to play, and then you see another alternative for your opponent, which perhaps you didn't see at the first go, and then you slow down to calculate that one. So... 
not a bag undoubtedly sees this pawn coming to d3. But uh, w one thing let me highlight, yes. how on earth do you have 78, 77 heart rate in such a position? Okay, this is incredible. Nodia back seemingly quite nervous. Yeah, black is getting comfortably and apparently he's still kind of calm. It's like Magnus in crazy positions, is keeping his calm. And this is such a critical part of a, of a champion's mentality, to be able to keep that mental fortitude, to keep your nerves in place, even when the position is blowing up. Though Magnus did reveal that they don't really feel calm <laughs> on the inside, but somehow uh, the nerves are still under control. Yeah, not a back. He's taking his time to decide. Let's point out that you really don't want to make Queen B3. We can eliminate this move. And the moment I say that, I also feel that if it happens on the board, I'm just going to look like an idiot. But No, but takes, takes d3 and immediately black spawn gets extremely dangerous. d3, c5 is hanging, d2 coming in. It just looks white will have to waste another tempo defending it and then you can at least capture yeah. on c5. You're doing great in that position. So queen b3 can be eliminated. King a1 just doesn't feel like a move you want to make. It makes no sense at all. So not about currently thinking about king b1 or king a3. b3 is another move you really don't want to make because it gives an additional option for black to actually capture on e3. Not think about queening, but about checkmating the white king. Yeah, it's somehow... Okay, one should never... One has to be open-minded yeah, all the time, true. but but still, b3 looks, humanly speaking, such a weakening move. Yeah, it's uh, it does not feel right. But king a3 also runs into any kind of rook d3 checks at, at a later stage after, for example, d takes d3. d3 is looming in the air. I just feel like, okay, these youngsters are completely fearless. Thinking for 15 minutes, going d takes c5, and after d4, burning again time on the clock, getting very close to a very serious time trouble uh, himself. And Levon still kind of controlling the clock, and whenever Levon gets counterplay, then Levon sees millions of ideas in fraction of a second, yeah? So this is, this is not anybody's game. A game for three results, and that's seven moves to be made for 10 minutes for Nordebeck and for Lavon Aronian in under five minutes. No increment on the clock. Yeah, Nordebeck's really slowed down after this decision of allowing d4. Yes, and I'm feeling that, uh, Nicholas, can we ask you the question that is, is b3 only our fear that this is really weakening, or is that still a candidate move? Well, white has a lot of moves and they all lead to zeros, as we like to say. All equality according to Endrin. B3 is one of them. King A3 is also uh, similar. So after all of these moves, B3, King A3, King B1, black always goes D3. The rook is supported in a pawn. The pawn is two squares away from promoting to a queen. So quite a dangerous pawn. White can play the rook back to rook F1 and here, for example, we can see this idea again with rook d5. And I wonder, does it make any difference if I play c6 first, maybe? c6 check, king c7. But I guess even here, after rook f1, black could theoretically play rook d5, also d2 becoming an option. This is... black is having enough counterplay. Just and genius. King B1, yeah, king b1 just had been played. King and B1. the heart rates were by both players over 100. Uh, just 30 seconds ago. I'm very happy because this is exactly the impression we are getting that both of them are very, very tense. Maximum tension on the board. King B1, these pawns looking so scary right now. I don't believe that you want to take on E3 and spoil the pawn structure because white will at least always have the option to capture on e4. You have to watch out for some checks, but I'm not that worried about them with the king hiding on c2. Yeah, Nicholas beautifully highlighted that with d3, the rook always supports that d pawn. Yeah, that's why we fear that d pawn so much, yeah, because there is so much power behind it. Uh, th yeah. That's why the taking on e3 is not, not of any priority here. I think it can be just um, eliminated with rook takes pawn. You you don't really care about this pawn that much. And it's also not even a threat because the queen on b5 actually guards that square. So there might even be more options And I that. find it fascinating that what uh, Nicholas yeah. highlighted this line, yeah, that the black king after c6 check after this d3 always goes to c7. Then in this rook f1, rook d5, queen a6 line. After king c7, sorry, Peter. Sorry, yes. no, complete your thought. Yeah, then queen a6, yeah, always, ask yeah, it, it always scares us so much. Yeah, yeah, but this queen c6, queen takes c6, and we then, have... yeah, d3, I think it's, it's obvious that it's d3. That was the hand move, yes. And he comes back with the rook Look at one. Nicholas line is on the board. 
and we're gonna see that. Wow, okay, this is this is completely insane. Levon down to three minutes, thir 15 seconds. Rook d5, c6, king c7, <laughs> queen a6, I queen have a look c6. At this because craziness. This is just, yeah. you're threatening a big check on b7. Yeah, so black takes, queen takes c6, obligatory. I don't believe you can take with the king. No, Peter, no. queen c, no, no, queen c8, not rook c1. Yeah, queen h, okay, millions of checks. No, queen it's takes c6. It's very scary. You yeah. take with the queen, so the idea is after rook c1, you still have rook c5. c5. Against rook f7, we have this scary rook d7, but apparently holding. It's total madness. Less than three minutes on the clock. Please, whoever finds, uh, whoever navigates this is a true genius. It's craziness. It really is, and especially with just this much time on the clock. And Rook F8, you really can't make it because Black's got his own checks coming yeah. up on C2. Insane action. All right, let's bring Rook up our F1. live board. This is the current position. Rook D5 is the move that's highlighted by Nicholas. Nicholas, is that the only move to keep the position balanced? Yes, it oh, is. Wow. So, wow. Oh, wow. Then it's a, big a moment. super critical moment. And Levon almost below two minutes. He needs to play rook d5. The next best move would be d2. Yeah, what's but, wrong with d2? But d2, rook d1. And now, what is your follow up? And it feels like at some point I'm going to win this pawn. I might be a pawn up. I mean, maybe this is also playable and to, to go rook d5 next. Maybe this is a more human approach. But just as a sample line here rook d5, queen b3, rook takes e5. Now the queens are traded. We go into this rook end game. Wow. I have rook d7 as an idea. And. To win the pawn g7, this looks promising and for white. And a minute and a half. Yeah. Rook f1. Wow. Rook f1. Yeah, to go into these lines after rook d5, c6, from a human perspective, it's not easy at all because you're so afraid of all the different checks. Oh. After c6 check, you can also play king a7. It's also a possibility. But he needs to make a move. He it's one minute. He needs to make a move soon, that's for sure, because five. he still has to make no, five moves. No, still six for Black Steel six, oh, because six it's the 35th yeah, move. Exactly. Levon, make a move, there's no increment. But he needs to conquer, he wants to make a move when he has the total vision of, but how do you get the total vision? Uh, Peter, you remember, even in the Armageddon we felt Levon was so slow when there was no increment on the clock. He keeps looking at the clock, but he's not making a move. He plays D, D. Yeah. No, D what did two. he play? D2. D2. No. Yes. Yes. And you mentioned that that's the second best option in this position, uh, Nicholas. It does make this very strong pawn a potential weakness now. Yes, but at least you deflect the rook from the f file, right? Because this rook d5, c6, and then you always have to worry about rook f7 check or whatever it was too much to handle. And rook d1 looks forced to me, because d1 is a big threat. I don't think you want to go king c2. You don't want to try to distract <laughs> your pieces defending d1. Nordebeck slowing down, wondering if... Uh, what alternative could he be looking at here? Yeah, well, I'm also looking at Levon. If you look at his 48 seconds on the clock, eventually going for a worse rook end game, but hoping to hold it would make sense, yeah? Because that line that Nicholas highlighted with rook d1, rook d5, queen b3, rook d1, had been played. It's Rook driving D5. me crazy that Levon is still riding down. <laughs> yeah, this is the old, yeah, old guard routine that you automatically, you, you want to feel how your score sheet. But yeah, he has to forget about it. Rook D5, this is now Nicholas's line. Queen B3 could lead to a very nice look end game, but is that the maximum or is uh, Levon then happy to at least be trading queens? Yeah, that is the maximum. Queen b3 is strongest. Queen takes b6 is also an option, but not as convincing. This should be, this should result in a draw somehow. Yeah, the pawn on h5 is also hanging. King takes b6. You have some counterplay with rook g5. This should be okay. So the best try for Norderbeck is to go queen b3. And you pin the rook. You also keep the, keep attacking the pawn. We have a move, do we? Yes, queen b3 on the board. So let's see what Levon's reaction is. He, yeah, he will trade on e5. What else can he really do? Here he, he cannot take on c5. He needs to take on e5. It's absolutely clear. And at least he should make time control. And yes, he takes on e5. The queens will be traded. And he only needs to make two more moves than going into rook in game. But it is looking tricky here. Queen takes, rook takes, rook takes d2. This will be on the board in just a moment. And there's the direct threat to bring the rook in and take the pawn 
on g7. So if you take on c5 now, then the rook comes in, white wins the pawn on g7, has very good chances. So after rook takes d2, maybe black should play a move like king c6 or rook e5. This will be very interesting to see what Levon decides on after rook takes d2 here. It's on the board now. 24 seconds. Two moves to play. So this is the rook endgame. 17 seconds left. Two moves to make time control, but it looks like the worst is behind. Yeah, but Lavon. not easy. Yeah, rook e5, because you still have to make a decision. But rook e5 eliminating that h5 pawn is, I believe, essential. Levon, even with little time on the clock, might be finding, but this is still very unpleasant because... So if you give a check, you come, come ahead? Yeah, you take on g7. You have to take on h5, otherwise white plays g4 and, and wins. Then white probably takes on b6, and this e4 pawn Extra is vulnerable. Pawn. Yeah, and the e4 pawn is still alive. If we would remove the e4 and e3 pawns, I think the drawish margin would be very high. Mm. But with this extra element of this tension, I do believe that white has excellent winning chances. So, Bida, you're saying that the g7 pawn will be traded for the h5 pawn. These two pawns will be off the board. And the fact that this is a weakness for black, which will be much easier for white's rook to target than the black rook to target the e3 pawn. White has uh, winning chances in this endgame. Yeah, very good winning chances, yes. Uh, I, I'm really worried for Levon. But at least he makes the time control. But on the other hand, it's so frustrating. But yeah. it'll remade quickly, especially if it's a check. Yes, then king c6 is automatic. 10 seconds. But... If you reach the time control, you realize that something went wrong in the last couple of years. And we see rook d7 check, king c6 blitzed right. out. So time trouble is over, yes. but the trouble is still very real for Levon. The board trouble is on, but Levon does make uh, the 40th move. And we see this line is being played out. Peter, let's switch over to our other game as this ending. It's going to be a long grind. Levon out of trouble on the clock, as you said. But the end game remains very difficult for him. Gukesh... 40 seconds, he's got three moves to make, now two, but wow, this is looking scary for him with that knight on e6, the g pawn moving forward, the rook defending the h4 pawn, the queen still not finding its way towards the black king. Let's point out that queen f7 is never possible because the knight jumps in with a check and you capture the queen, so you can't really bring the queen into the play. Yeah, and look at this also, the evaluation bar jumped in White's favor, apparently there is now a knockout blow, which is by no means any surprise. It just looks like uh, Black has no coordination. Yeah, the rook on a5 is loose. The rook on h8 does nothing, as you highlighted. Look from c4. The b5 pawn is protected because of knight c7 fork. Mm -hmm. can Maybe you... even just push, yeah? Yeah, yeah can push. you just ignore everything yeah. and go g6 here? Yeah. Niklas? Yeah, absolutely. The most natural move, g6, is also the strongest. And the pawn will be will be on g7 in just a moment. And what do you do then? King, I, I'm not sure what to suggest. King b8, g7, rook g8. But here, very strange move. A very strange move. Rook c5. Wow. Rook c5 to just protect the pawn <laughs> and say black doesn't have any on moves. The g6 on the board. Still two more moves, 35 seconds for Gukesh. Well, he, he will play king b8 most likely because he yes. needs to get out of all these forks. Yes, yeah. king b8 on the board. And now rook c5, huh? That's a... Well, first g7 and then you rook c5. You move the rook away, but, but just But then it will be this. move 41. This is very good news for Ali And, Reza and g7 is a natural yes, move to make. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I don't think you need rook c5. There must be other ways. Yeah, yeah should be. <laughs> Also, it's somehow time just time. going uh, g7, rook g8, rook c7, trading queens, and then going rook, rook f8, and rook, f, uh, rook f7, rook f8. Also tempting, but maybe black sacrifices the rook, then tries to go rook b2, rook takes a2, and then switches to, to the attention of the h pawn. We might not want to see that. Uh, in any case, good for him, for either that he just needs to make a natural move g7, and then he reaches time control. And this match is a critical one. The player who finishes fifth in this event automatically is invited into the next Freestyle Chess Code Challenge. The Grand Slams of Freestyle that will happen uh, all year, that will happen globally in 2025. So a lot to fight for and of course a bigger prize pool as well. Yes, okay. Knowing uh, what a big success Freestyle Chess has become, it's understandable. Yeah, the sponsors are, sponsors are stepping in. 
the attention is enormous and that's what we want to see. We are spoiled with hit stunning action and then if the sponsors are happy, what else can we, and the spectators are happy, what else can we ask for? So Chad, keep your love coming, keep it going for freestyle chess, tell us what you enjoy about it because this is becoming a reality and we all, it's so entertaining as well. Meanwhile, entertainment on the board as well, G7, Gukesh has to decide a spot for the Rook in under 15 seconds. Yeah, and the Rook G8 square is also undefended, yeah, it's so difficult, down to 5 seconds. Yeah, okay. Rook G8 played with five seconds on the clock. Alvarez didn't even wait for Gukesh to make his move. He played G7. He knew that Gukesh will make time control, gets up, leaves. This is good strategy for players because there's so much tension that has brewed over these last few moves that even if you know what your next move might be, well, in this position, it's complicated. But it's just good chess advice to just zone out for just a little bit, get your refreshment, uh, you know, go do your thing, get your tea, coffee, whatever it is that you want to drink and come back fresh on the board with fresh sight. Yeah, very important because uh, you can't carry all this uh, excitement with you after move 40. Yeah? You yeah. have to calm down, you have to calm your nerves, go to the bathroom, wash your face, get a drink, calm down, wait for your heart rate to stabilize and then with uh, fresh head uh, you get into new challenges. It's looking very promising. I, I do agree with Nicholas that there should be more than one way. Of course, Look C5 is the merciless computer move. That's why we hate and we simply don't play. We ignore the machines. Yeah, we don't play against the machines because they are always brutal. Uh, but Nicholas, can you just tell us, is it really Look C5 or, or there are more options? There are more options, yeah. yeah. Rook B4 also makes a lot of sense. In general, you want to deal with the black threat, which is Rook takes B5 or maybe Queen takes B5. And if you play Rook B4, I mean, nothing of the black piece can move. The computer wants to immediately give back the exchange, but you still end up with the Rook out of the game and White should be winning in the long run. Also, Rook F4 is a very sensible move to prepare Rook F8. Maybe here as well, Black would take on G7. Now, Rook F8 check, first of all, the King goes to A7. We can even win a full Rook here with Queen D4 check, B6 and... I would also consider going with, uh, taking on G7 with the Queen. Yeah, going not? into the end game, but you could also take off the knight, which looks a bit scarier, but is also winning. So, the good news, like you said, Peter, is that Fuser has now half an hour on the clock to figure mm. it out, and he will figure it out. He will take this one. I would be surprised if I see if if Gukesh was able to save this game. Yeah, but look at look at Ali Reza. I, I don't get the feeling that he wants to pause for too long. Yeah, it yeah. seems like he has a clear vision. He's very nervous. He wants to to already deliver the final blow. It's also understandable, but he's trying to hold back. Yeah, he knows the old wisdom that you should be taking your time. At the same time, his excitement is there. So lovely to have all this video feed. Yeah, that we get access to the players' emotions. I mean, look at the position. Yeah, Peter, you got your queen and lined up against the rook on g8. The pawn on g seven this knight on e6 with a potential jump you feel like there has to be something stronger than simply defending your b5 pawn you're calculating all sorts of knight jumps in the position ideas of knight f8 knight c5 and you want to look at these lines because it's so tempting especially with this rook on g8 but Peter, i think the problem with all of it is one is the b5 pawn but also once this knight moves to any square black's queen can actually jump capture the g7 pawn, get out of threats and also defend its own rook on g8. Yeah, that's... Let me just uh, highlight that with, with a potential yes, move. Like knight yes. c5 and this attacks the queen. You attack the rook. You're also eyeing this b7 pawn, but queen takes pawn, actually defends everything and queen takes d6 is just, just one check, it, Peter. Yeah. It doesn't get anywhere and suddenly it's the white king feeding the heat. Yes. Finally, the d6 pawn had been eliminated oh. and, <laughs> and black screen gets to the diagonal. Of course, this will never ever happen. The knight on e6 stays alive. And yeah, Lukash in a lot of trouble. And I also feel like Aliza thinks the, the way the tournament has gone, okay guys, everybody is praising Magnus Carlsen, he's in the final, but I defeated him. I played these fantastic tie breaks and now I have to fight for the fifth place to stay in the race for the the, the, the qualify, direct qualification for next year's tour. So he really wants to get that, yeah, because he feels that it, it's, 
it belongs to him, yeah? He, he was challenging Magnus to the maximum. He was almost knocking him out. And uh, Gukesh is in a tough spot to mm. trying to hold Alireza off. Absolutely, Peter. There's so much on the line for these players. And also just how competitive these youngsters are when they're playing against anyone, but especially when they're playing against each other. <laughs> they always want to one-up and uh, Ali Reza there. He knows he's close to getting this one in the back. Moves like Rook C5 and Rook B4. Also just keep everything under control. And next, apart from Knight jumps, you're also just simply threatening with the H-pawn moving forward. Peter, but I want to just dive a little bit into this idea, which we were so impressed with. To me, again, it's uh, it's a very genius move in the position. Easy for the computer to highlight, but not that easy for a human to work. And I'm looking at a potential queen e7. I sidestep my pin. I'm threatening to take your rook, but now and I'm attacking h4. And now you play rook c7, and oh, and this That's is it. not coming in with a check. <laughs> it's, it's checkmate and now the b5 pawn is not hanging anymore. The same applies that if you play rook a4 trying to activate the rook in a smart way. Again, rook c7 comes, yeah? So this rook c5 is a tsukzwang, it's a total packet of which you want <laughs> h5, h6, nothing moves. Yeah, nothing Insane. moves. Nothing moves. Because Insane. it's like every black piece is in its ideal position. So just to highlight that point, if the queen or the rook moves from this square, you lose control of the b5 and rook c7 jumps in. You can't move this rook because there are all these ideas of the knight moving, the g-pawn queening, and also where are you going to move the rook? I feel there should be a complete blowout to rook e8 as well. Maybe just knight c7? Is that a move? It's a move. <laughs> Is it's that a, a good move? move? <laughs> it's a good move. We, we see the evolution bar perfectly agrees. Uh, it just feels like, uh, yeah, this is, this is completely hopeless. Uh, and I, I want to highlight one thing, yeah, because Nicholas is always standing here and he's very modest and he's saying that, yes, of course, thanks to computer, it's easy to say the truth, but it's such a tough job. I just want to highlight this, that sit, standing there and making sense of all the engine's lines. So difficult. And whenever we suddenly speak into some line, it's just for the fact that we from a human eye want to also ask that what happens in that one. We are yeah. stunned with, with Nicholas's analysis, so happy about our team efforts. I just wanted to make it that we are loving it all together. I couldn't agree more with you. I think uh, the ability to break down and make sense of AI from a human perspective, it's a skill. And we all need that to really get to the truth of this position because it's so easy to see the evaluation bar or a move if you're sitting at home and analyzing and saying that this is win or this doesn't work. But really how difficult it is or what is the actual thought behind it, uh, it's really important to have that. Nicholas, um, yeah, awesome. Thank you, Peter <laughs> and Tanya for the kind words. Yeah, and it's also, we have to remember that a move like Rook C5, it even has to cross your mind, first of all, right? It's such a strange move in a way. First of all, we didn't talk about this yet. Black cannot take on C5 because the queen on D7 is unprotected. So this is why this move is possible in the first place. But it looks so weird. It looks so strange. You're just defending the pawn. However, you keep this idea alive of playing Rook C7 at the right moment. And also if Black plays King A7, Suddenly there's this b6 check move <laughs> and you're losing the rook on, on a5. You're losing the rook on a5 and this is resigns. So what else is there to play? I was thinking maybe maybe king sorry, maybe king a8, but well now you're running into this <laughs> check. Uh, <laughs> Crazy. Yes, you're always running into something. So, well, not only is it somewhat of a tsuk-tsung, also the h-pawn can run up the board. And yeah, rook c5 almost immediately forces resignation. I think the only human move would be rook takes g7, and then knight takes g7, and... Yeah, well, and where is the mate? Yeah, let's just see. King where takes, is the mate? And yeah, there is a mate, apparently. Queen takes king d6, seven. king a7, b6. and b6. Yes. Yeah, king, king a6, six. and queen d3. Queen d3. And then king going oh, back. Six. Yes. Oh, yeah, then yeah. coming back. Oh, yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. And then coming back, and then... <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic yeah, stuff, yeah. Nice. Awesome. So yeah, rook c5 would be a stunner if Uza uh, finds it. Uh, but it's not the only only win in the position. Also rook b4, rook f4, maybe other moves as well. But you got to do something about this threat against the pawn. So 
I would expect him to either play rook b4, maybe rook f4 is also an option, and Fusa should take this one. He's really, it's really good timing for him that he can think right now mm. after move 40. Yeah, actually, uh, this has come at the exact moment that you needed because g6, g7 were moves that were easy to pull out, but now to think about how to defend this b5 pawn, imagine having to take that decision with just two minutes on the clock. You can just easily slip up on your uh, advantage as well because both rook b4, rook c5 are not moves that you want to make in this position. You have to force yourself to play this. Yeah, exactly, because you are hoping for a knockout blow by four sequence of moves. So, be the h5, you just take rook b5. Yes, I take rook b5, and I'm very happy that suddenly I'm creating some chances and kicking that monster queen away from d5. Mm. Yeah, just no time at all to get h6 in. Because rook b2 threats are there, the queen is under attack, the knight is loose. Looks like with the process of elimination, Ali Reza will arrive at one of these two moves. And if he's thinking about defense, rook c5 also feels like the more active square. Placing the rook behind the pawn is also something that you're not very happy doing in this position. You want that rook on the open file. Yes, but I think if we go back a little bit, there was one moment when, when they traded on a5. Bishop takes a5, rook a5 and... Ali Reza blitzed out the move rook b4, yeah, just mm. protecting that b5 pawn. So it's very much on his mind that he knows that rook b4 is possible. However, he wants to find a knockout blow. He wants to finish this game by force. Taking his time, he also cannot believe it, yeah, that, okay, there should be something winning on the spot. But nobody tells him, nobody signals him what, what that could be. Yeah. He has to find it, but it's not that trivial. He has already burned more than 10 minutes. For his decision, he's down to 21 minutes on the clock. And also, but, there is no knockout blow in this position. Yes. You have to take a breather here. The, the knockout blow is the quiet little move. <laughs> Look, see, ah, yes, that's, uh, that's kind of a very special situation. Honestly, I believe that, uh, especially after taking this time, he will be mm. finding it. But I want to highlight Gukesh's heart rate. And this is what also Magnus highlighted, that when you already know that it's not in your hands, yeah, then you are already somehow getting used to the thoughts of losing the game. It's not anymore this crazy tension. Then when you are still hoping for something. Absolutely. And Bira, as Ali Reza takes his time to decide, we will uh, quickly bring up our bird's eye view. And we've had two games that have ended already. Winston taking a win against Deng Liren. Meanwhile, Fabi Magnus ended in a draw. We've got two very different kind of action going on on our live uh, boards. Nodbeck trying to grind down, grind down a rook pawn ending. He's up two extra pawns in the position. So definitely a lot to play for. Love on Aronian trying to get that king active, trying to get some uh, peace activity going for a compensation. It's going to be an uphill task for him and the Ali Reza board. It's time for him to realize that he needs to take a breather, defend that B5 pawn, keep the trumps in the position and as the player, think out their next move. We're going to go into a quick short break and we'll be right back from Weissen House in just a few. Day six marks the final day of the semi-finals of the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge in Weissenhaus. It's the players' last opportunity to showcase their skills and secure their spots in the finals. It's a very exciting day. It's uh, Valentine's Day, but there's gonna be no love on the chessboard because we've got the elimination day for the semi-finals. Uh, so Nodebeck and Fabiano Caruana have to strike back against Levon Aronian and Magnus Carlsen. We'll have our two finalists today, and I'm really looking forward to the action. Chess is more than an ancient board game. It's a highly complex sport, demanding strong memory skills to process information efficiently. With countless variations and moves in each game, players must remember and apply specific strategies to gain an advantage. This could be the primary reason why millions of people worldwide stream this game every day. The live stream that we produce here is like the most extensive one we've ever done. We have like all the small cameras that look through the pieces. We have a professional booth, we have heart rate, we have like touch screen. There's all kinds of elements. And to be honest, only like the software part where I'm very involved with, uh, it takes up months to actually like prepare and then develop and stuff. 48 cameras in total are installed to capture each move of the games. Today, 
Magnus Carlsen, Nodirbek Abdusatorov, Levon Aronian, and Fabiano Caruana are fighting for the top positions. However, by the end of the day, it's Magnus Carlsen who claims the first spot in the finals. Nodirbek is good at you know uh, adjusting to new positions. Like I've seen in several games that he plays the opening relatively well. He knows how to use his uh, queen sometimes in non-standard ways. I feel like I'm hitting my form at least a bit. So regardless of my, my play, I'm very optimistic. Magnus Carlsen's opponent will be the Grandmaster Fabiano Caruana, but who will emerge as the ultimate winner of the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge in Weissenhaus? Stay tuned and follow the finals on freestylechess.com. Gukesh Domaraju, a chess prodigy born in 2006, has already left an indelible mark in the realm of chess. At merely 17, he boasts an ELO rating of 2743, securing him the 16th position worldwide, not just India's youngest grandmaster, but also the second youngest globally. Gukesh's precocity knows no bounds. His historic triumph over Magnus Carlsen in 2022 established him as a formidable force. More than just a chess enthusiast, he represents the dawn of a new era in Indian chess, surpassing the legendary Viswanathan Anand in rankings, a feat unachieved for over 37 years. His journey, a blend of innate talent and relentless dedication, continues to inspire, cementing his status, not just as India's pride, but also as a beacon for the next generation of chess maestros. Gukesh Domaraju, born in 2006 from India, currently holds the 16th position in the chess world rankings with an ELO rating of 2743. His career peak so far, an ELO rating of 2758 and the 8th position on the global stage. Please see more at the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge at Weissenhaus. Ali Reza Firuzia, a chess prodigy born in 2003, represents France with an ELO of 2760 as of January 2024, peaking at 2804. Ranked sixth worldwide, he's lauded for his meteoric rise, becoming the youngest to surpass 2800 ELO at 18. Beyond the 64 squares, Firuzia intrigues with a dual career in fashion design, merging strategic finesse with creative flair. Despite not clinching the world championship spot, his prowess earned Magnus Carlsen's respect, leading to a mentorship. Ferusha's multifaceted life reflects in his achievements, including a fied Grand Swiss victory and top finishes in Rapid and Blitz World Championships. His journey symbolizes a blend of traditional mastery and modern versatility. Ali Reza Firuzia is a chess prodigy from France, born in 2003. His current ELO rating is 2760, placing him sixth worldwide. His highest ELO was 2804, and he achieved his best world ranking position at second. Please see more at the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge at Weissenhaus.
And the positions are heating up on our current two live boards. Uh, two games have ended, two are still on. We're back live from Weissenhaus. The action is on, on our screens. Gukesh, deep in thought. He is in big trouble against Ali Reza Feruja, who after a very long thing, Peter, almost a 17-minute think exactly. in this final time control, he does find the accurate move. He makes the move rook to b4. So not looking at any knockouts, any knight jumps, but simply defends that pawn on b5. Keeps the h4 pawn also uh, under his um, uh, insight. And now, all the ideas of the h pawn moving forward. It's big trouble for Gukesh. Meanwhile, troubles for Levon also continue. Peter, even though Levon are extreme left board, he's down two pawns, but... I don't think it's that trivial for white. The g2 pawn is hanging. The black yes. king is extremely active. And in rook pawn endings, they often say that king activity is worth a pawn. Yes, and I'm actually shocked that uh, Nodiabek has missed or blundered this king c4 move because there was absolutely no reason whatsoever to let that happen. Maybe you can tune into that position. Let me bring that up and, and look at this. What was move 40? Okay, let's go back. Yeah, so rook d7 check. That was move 39. We talked about the players are reaching time control. King c6, rook takes g7. Rook takes h5. C takes b6. King takes b6. Yeah, black is pawned down. But the problem is black is not yet activated with the king. So white is in time to target the e4 pawn. Now black had to give up. The, the second pawn, the h6 pawn, because the e4 pawn is very important, rook e5, rook g6 check, collecting the pawn. Maybe Nodia back felt like this should be a technical win or an easy win, but after rook g5, he should have activated. We did talk with Nicholas in the break that white probably has to play a move like king c2, give that, give, give that pawn up with a check, and then go king c3, rely on rook h5 check, Eventually getting the king to d4 looked like a very promising endgame. It was far from clear if it's winning or not. We, we did not really have so too much time to deal with this. But rook h4, allowing this stunning king c5, c4 it. Black is sacrificing the third move pawn. With a check. With a check. But what a game changer it is. King c4, rook takes c4, king check. King b3. King b3. And all of a sudden, everything is isolated. But Bla play on, Peter. Okay, how? G4? Yes, okay, G4. Because I see it, the white king is trapped on the back rank, but what is the move here? Because you're down three pawns. Well, but also I see some stalemating ideas. The king, hang on, I Go can take it. rook G4. <laughs> wow, oh look, take G4 gosh. stalemate. This is, and look at now, Nodia back, he is, he, he is looking, oh my he is God. completely out of his, that <laughs> how could I have missed it? This stalemate was the trick. Levon immediately using the opportunity and it will hunt Nodier back that he did rush with his decision. This wow. is this is just sexy. I mean this <laughs> idea that you're just pointing out, if we just back up to the live board, King to C4 played. He's walking into giving the third pawn in the position, in a sense, not to just try to put the white king under some checkmating ideas, but trapping his own king into a stalemate position. If not, a back grabs it, which perhaps was on his mind, which is why he felt king c4 is not even possible. Mm -hmm. I simply pick up another pawn and defend my g pawn. But you're not defending it. And after rook takes pawn, you're forced to go into the stalemate. You can't keep the rook alive, Peter, because there's a checkmate on yes. white's king. Yes, yes, it's it's really heartbreaking. At the same time, all the oh my uh, Levon fans are not jumping, jumping at home, uh, dancing around because this is a this is gonna end in a draw. After King C4, if you can't capture that E4 pawn and Black activates that King, this is this is humanly speaking very much a zero zero position. Yes, I'm just highlighting to perhaps newer chess audience here why this is a stalemate. Black has no next move in the position. So Levon will sacrifice his final piece, the rook, to walk into a stalemate. Yeah, wow. And and we have seen Nodier back winning that rook and game against Magnus Carson in the round robin, that last game with very nice uh, precision, with little time on the clock. Now he had the 30 minutes extra time, and to his horror, he realized that he rushed with Luke H4 and blundered one trick. All it takes, one mistake, 
and everything that he has done in this game just vanishes. Did you see Nottebag? He was adjusting his collar like he's suddenly feeling the heat. He's like, what have I just walked into? Because if you don't actually pick up, this is the live position. If you don't pick up the C4 pawn, black is anyway coming in with the king. Yes. And if the E3 pawn was to fall, Peter, this pawn becomes more powerful than any of the extra pawns that uh, Nodabek has on the board. Yeah, this is the real horror for Nodabek that basically rook takes c4, check is forced. Yeah, you, you can't stop the king with king c2 because that runs into rook takes g2, check, yeah? That's kind of the impression. Okay, all kinds of king a2s are very strange. I, I, I'm not a fan, king I'm not a believer. King, king d3, d3. rook h3. It's way too passive. Rook take g2, king a3, I know. I, yeah. Uh, humanly, absolutely no. Uh, rook take c4 check, but king b3, so... It's game over. Rook, rook well, if g4, we have to, we can give okay. the pawn with rook d4 takes, rook d3 check. But then you just... give a4 as exactly. well. Exactly. It's and, not just one pawn. And that is very little, if anything. Yeah, for example, rook d4, rook take g2. Yes, we do avoid the direct draw. King takes a4. White's king is stuck. That's the that's the real problem. Yes, we are still pawn up, but just one pawn with black's activity. This should be a draw. Nicholas, can you tell is, us some yeah. more hidden secrets? Is there a way to keep the game going? I think you already talked about all the secrets in the position. King c4, just a stunning move and just goes to show how tricky Levon is and also maybe a lesson for all the viewers and certainly for Nordebeck which is going to be a very painful lesson. Here, he was winning before going for rook h4, and he probably thought it's over. I play rook h4, black takes the pawn, I take on e4, I'm two pawns up, and sooner or later I'm going to convert it. And that's when he rushed. He thought it was over already, maybe, and then he was hit by this move king c4. Instead of playing rook h4, it was time to activate the king, king c2, rook takes g2, and you can play this slowly. You, can, you still have the pressure on the pawn on e4, maybe a pawn on a5, and this should be a technical win for white. So after rook h4, king c4, what a move, giving up another pawn of check, easy to miss, but if you're such a top player like Nordebeck, you should not miss this, especially with 25 minutes on the clock. And here, like you guys said, if you defend this pawn, for example, going g4, then black already comes in with the king to d3, and you intuitively know immediately this is not the way forward. I mean, maybe even at some point white can risk something, so you're not going to do this. And then after rook takes e4 check, king to b3, it is really a comical situation in a way. White is three pawns up, but cannot win this position because of the activity of the black pieces and the stalemate trick that you highlighted g4 just rook takes g4 and an immediate draw after rook takes g4 because the black king does not have any squares so if you cannot play g4 what else are you going to do and well you have to give up more pawns and after rook d4 yeah this position is not promising anything to white because the the king is just too passive rook e2 and it's just one pawn reduced material white is not active this is also a very simple draw for for black and it's painful in a way you know you make this blunder rook h4 and you don't even get a chance anymore to try for anything here apparently mm. he will try to do something but it doesn't seem like he can really create huge challenges to live on anymore, who has shown his trickiness with King C4. And this wow. is this is the blunder that Nicholas is highlighting. A move that you really want to make. You just want to come towards the E4 pawn. And here, instead of getting the king out, he did go into rook H4. And this, and we see the eval bar immediately drop, Peter. Mm -hmm. And Levon. I mean. Levon finds this stuff. This is Levon's chess. Yeah, very he much. He finds this creative way of uh, defensive. And look at Norderbeck on the camera. From predator mode, you know, we often see him, the way he is. He, it's sinking in now. It's sinking in that he's let this slip. He's allowed this trick of stalemate on the board. Yeah, King C4, stunner. And he's kicking himself because he was clearly considering rook h4 and king c2 but then convince himself that okay king c2 
let me just bring it one more time, rook take g2, king c3, it's probably a technical win, but it will take time, and if it takes time, then why don't I go for the more direct option, yeah, so he probably convinced himself because he was only thinking for three, four minutes, he, he didn't really spend too much time, opted for rook h4, and then suddenly the move king c4, the point is, I instantly saw the stalemate that hang on the king on beastly, but it's it's crazy that after g4 it took me quite some time. I was how do I get rid of the rook? Yeah. Was my question, and <laughs> and I was looking like rook d5, rook d4, and then I gonna I just but no, then it already does not work, and then it hit me that come on, <laughs> all we want to do is to get rid of the rook, then take it. Yes. Just incredible. And undoubtedly, Nodebeck is seeing all of this now. Of he realizes that he can't just pick up that e4 point. You make them a rook h4, almost feeling like you've got this in the bag. Yeah. It's done. It's, it's over. You're two pawns up, you're going to pick up the third pawn. And then it all crashes. Yeah, and I think that uh, he was also very unlucky in the sense that after rook h4, he convinced himself that after rook takes g2, rook takes e4, my king is not cut. If white's pawn would king be on b3, it would be cut, and you would say, no, I'm not so happy, I don't want... But he sees that I can play king a2, I'm going to go then king b3, I'm going to give a check, it should be completely winning. And then he compared it quickly uh, with the situation like this. Okay, yes, model has the same idea, but I can play the same position basically without the pawn on e4, why shouldn't I? And Levon king hitting him with king c4, that's that's the heart attack. Yeah, when whenever your opponent hits you with a move like king c4, and all of a sudden in a fraction of a second everything becomes clear, but you can't change it already. It's too late. It's one move too late. And he just simply wow. missed he simply missed the stalemate trick. Meanwhile, We've got a result on the Ali Reza board, and I believe Ali Reza has won what? his game. Nicholas, what happened? If you can just quickly show us. We left it at rook b4. We're seeing handshakes. Yeah, not much more did happen here. After rook b4, protecting the pawn on b5, white is ready to push the pawn forward. Black really doesn't have any moves. If he takes on g7, knight takes, queen takes, white takes on d6, and... If you move the king, it will be checkmate very soon. King a7, uh, b6, for example, king a6 and queen d3, check and checkmate. Next move, rook steps in, queen takes. So that means after queen takes d6 here, instead of moving the king, you would need to play queen c7. But this rook in game, for example, is horrible. Or yeah, queen f8 even first to, to put the king in a worse position than h5. And it's just... Such a re such a sad rook on on a5. Or it is going to win here. So instead, Gukish played b6, and now that the seventh rank is weakened, Ali Reza put a rook on f4 in order to play rook f8. And here, Gukish resigned because with the king weakened, he cannot take on b5 anymore. There's rook f8 coming, and before he could simply play king a7, but now this is running into checkmate. Queen to a8. There we go. So after rook f4, well, what are you going to do about this threat of rook f8? Really not anything. And that's why Gukesh resigned. Aliriza takes an important first win. And we should remind ourselves they are playing for the fifth place in this tournament in the top five. Do qualify for the next freestyle chess go challenge. So quite an important win for Aliriza to get this qualification spot potentially if he does draw or win the next game against Gukesh Tanya. And Alireza has been awesome in this freestyle chess. Starting from the round robin, then even in the quarterfinals, he's the one who got the one win against Magnus Carlsen and he did it, did it in great style. It was a tough, tough fight. Eventually going down on the second day of the match. Uh, but Peter, he's striking back in this one. He also took down Vincent. He took down Vincent in the uh, yesterday's matches, so it's no, no, wow. that was Gukesh. He, that was Gukesh. He took down Ding. Ding. My bad. Yeah. He took down well, the world champion Ding, and uh, it's been quite, quite the tournament for Ali Reza, and it looks like he's on the way to beat at least 
one foot in to get that fifth position. Meanwhile, Nodebeck, he said he wants to keep the action yeah, going. Yeah, but let's not forget that Vincent also won his first game against Gukesh, and Gukesh was bouncing back, yeah? Mm. And even with the black pieces, so and Gukesh at least knows that it's possible. I mean, of these, course, these kids, they never give up. Yeah, never give they up, never and give it's going to be incredibly difficult, but it's it's doable, yeah? That, that kind of mental state is important. Now we have seen some development in the Nodia Bags game against Levon after being so angry with himself he burned 50 minutes or something like this is done to 30 minutes 43 seconds opting for king a2 king dc duke h3 Levon picks up the pawn on g2 and he will be going after the e3 pawn He's, he has threats of rook e2 rook takes e3 Peter let's look at the most direct line from a human perspective of a race what yes. actually happens and I think we'll have enough time to make the moves on the board as the players are thinking. And this is definitely what they're calculating as well. White has to create a passer of the A pawn. The only way to do it is to get the B pawn rolling. Black goes after the E3 pawn. You go B4. Black trades. Yeah, takes. takes trades. And takes on Takes. Machine. Rook takes rook. King takes rook. And this is the race. And black is in time, Peter. In yeah. fact, maybe more than in time. No, okay. The, you even secret. give a check. Yeah, you, you give a check. And I'm just wondering if instead of king here, can actually white be in danger in this position? Wow, so. even like this. Okay, but we should be happy with the draw, but you are ambitious. I'm just trying <laughs> to finish this line for a moment. And you queen and black just needs okay, to, white king needs to B5, watch out. I can Don't go, go king, to b3. Yes, I can still draw with king b5. And then king a6, yeah, after queen b1 check. Well, then the path is pretty clear for Levon on our live board. And let's just bring that up. The position as we have it, king a3 on the board. Has this been played no, yet? Not no, not yet. No, so after. rook into g2. And this is the current position. So it seems like the most direct line does not work for Nodderbeck. We are being joined by a special guest. Ali Reza is in the studio after his win against Gokesh. Niklas, take it away. Ali Reza, thank you for joining us. Congratulations, first of all, for your win against Gokesh. It was quite an exciting game, quite... Difficult probably for you. How do you feel about this win? Yeah, I mean, I'm playing uh, like ambitiously because um, there's nothing to lose. So I've yeah, I was not taking so much time here even. Like yeah, uh, you're playing really fast in the opening. Like yeah, the first yeah. five moves, you took about one minute. <laughs> yeah, I think like the first six seven moves, I took two three minutes because it felt natural for me. And yeah, but of course I'm much worse. <laughs> <laughs> But you did fight back and then you found a way to sacrifice a pawn here. So d5 was very important and you sacrificed, no, you first sacrificed a pawn then an exchange. Yeah. But it was also a very, I think, good practical decision because the position is difficult for Yeah, black I to felt play, it's yeah? very dangerous for black because um, I pushed my pawn and I thought the best case he could make draw here, but maybe computer finds some ways. So... Um, let's just, let me ask you, what do you think, where were the critical moments here in the game? Where, yeah, where did it go wrong for him? It's maybe? hard to say where he went wrong. Like, I liked my position a lot, but maybe he needs to try to go queen g6 here, I don't know. Like, and then I go queen d5 maybe. Queen exchange is always interesting. Mm -hmm. But maybe queen d5. And then he could castle. Ah, he could castle. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. easy to forget. <laughs> yeah, maybe but still, he this knight is powerful, uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, still I F4. go f4. Yeah. But okay, now at least he could go away with his king. So. At least his rook is in the game. Yeah, and then rook c8. Yeah. Maybe he forgot castle. Uh, okay, so going back to the position. I think a5 was fine. Okay. King d2, bishop b6. But somehow here he lost the threat at some point. A4, this was all actually pretty good. Yeah, he's good. better probably here. Yeah. He's even better here. And then I think he maybe missed this. Yeah, uh, he has to go queen g6, right? I think yes, queen g6, like then h3. Um, I couldn't see what he has to do. Like, all right, let's have a look. Quick look, what he should do. Bishop f2. Yeah, bishop f2. Ah, to ah, yeah, involve yeah. the rook. Yeah, of course, this is the line. Yeah, bishop f2, rook e4. Yes. 
Rook and then rook c6, c6 yes. and then I wanted like bishop g7 or something. Bishop g7 and the king, <laughs> it feels very dangerous yeah, for the rook king, yeah? <laughs> rook c2, king d3, but then rook c1, yeah? Ah, queen g7. Oh, wow, queen g7. Uh, yeah, and then it's made. And then it's made. Let's just show this for the viewers. Uh, now. Rook. <laughs> okay, but yeah. it feels like there should be something Yeah, yeah for of it. course, he blundered. Um, he yeah, blundered? queen a4 is the bad move, yeah? So... Sorry, right. yes, there, queen d5, uh, yeah. queen a4. Yeah, he blundered rook e4, now you're suddenly yeah, yeah. winning. He blundered rook He thought b5, rook takes c3, and uh, it's winning. This line probably he was calculating. Yes. Takes queen d1, and it's like I was calculating this, but. Ah, d5 is a nice d5, finish. yeah. d5, and. King d4, rook bishop f2. Exactly, and black wins yeah. the queen. So well, rook e4 is very easy to to play. miss. Rook. Yeah, to miss also to play, <laughs> and then it's very easy because I just push pawns. Yeah, yeah. Here again, I made five. Uh, you gave him just two moves. Yeah. 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 So I what mean, happened I there? I thought I had, I could take on d6, but it's just so unnecessary to take on d6. And maybe I'm lost even. Yeah, rook a5, rook b4. I missed bishop a7. Rook C6. Oh, rook, yeah, rook. Okay. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, it is better. I mean, very difficult. So, it, I mean, it must have been a difficult moment for you to just yeah. say, okay, I come back to C3. It's completely like I misunderstood the position. I should never think about D6 pawn. Because it helps them. Yeah, yeah. It's my, it's a benefit for me, this pawn. So. Yeah, so but here it is still. Yeah, I couldn't see what he has to do. Bishop here. A5 was so Guys, easy. sorry, sorry, just yes. breaking news. We the game has a... ended. It's a draw between... Okay. Okay. Oliver Kabdusatov and Levon Aronyan. And right. now that we announced it, please yes. go okay. on. Yes, yes, carry yes. on. Okay. All right. Thank you. So Bishop A5, you took on A5. Oh, it's a mistake, this. Yeah, you're supposed to play bit Rook C4. Ah, okay. Rook C4 ah, to yeah, trade it's the easier. Rooks. Of course, yeah. Because my king gets active, goes to B4 and defends the B5 pawn. Yeah. But how he needs to so defend? Bishop Rook takes. You played Rook B4. Queen e7 was good, g5 was h6, good, h6, h4. Yeah, takes, takes. I really like that you took with the f pawn so he doesn't yeah, get yeah. active with the rook course, via yeah. the h file. Yeah, very instructive moment. And now queen f7, rook f4, this this phase you Yeah, both he missed rook really c4, well. but still he's okay. Yeah? yeah, he has to trade. He has to trade and play king a7, but it also looks very scary. Yeah? This is really scary, yeah. Knight d4, I, I mean, knight you have d4, the pawns. Yeah. Ah, and I mean, then the king b6. Okay. Yeah, king b6. Queen d5. It looks very scary yeah. still. But your king is also in Yeah, he has good chances. Yeah, mm. yeah he was in time trouble. So it's, without increments, it's, you always think about keeping the pieces for now and then <laughs> think. Yeah, but this just gave you yeah. tempos. And yeah, and then it was easy. Yeah. Here. It's very difficult to play with the knight on e6 over the board for him. Yeah, <laughs> it's the knight is so strong. Yeah, yeah. And here, were you considering this move at all? Just wondering, rook c5? Uh, no, I was <laughs> calculating one line. It was so interesting. Like, I was calculating this. Rook four. Takes. Yeah, check. check. King a7. Check. Rook b6. Takes. Takes. Queen a4. Yeah. Rook a6. Queen b3. I was calculating. Uh-huh. Wow. Then, he it can takes. take and he can play a2, yeah? Yeah, and then rook a8. But, but it's still, it's insane, this is draw. <laughs> because oh. you check first, but you don't have a checkmate. Yeah, yeah. but it, it's so strange. It's check. King b6. Takes king b5. And when I go queen e6, he goes king a5. Did you calculate <laughs> this entire line? Yeah, I was, I, here I was sure I have to win. But, but here I couldn't <laughs> see king a5. <laughs> because king b5, queen c4. But king a5, I couldn't. But it's so unnecessary, this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have a simpler way. And rook b4 yeah. was a very yeah, good before, choice. Yes. And he just doesn't have any moves. Yeah, yeah, yeah because this rook game is lost. Uh, if he plays rook g7. Yeah, I, mean, I think right? this rook game should be Yeah, losing. yeah, it's lost. Queen d6. You can even play queen I, I f8 wanted to first. Take. You can play a queen f8 is even more precise. Because he has to take on c8 then. But ah, okay, even this yeah, is but also, it's, it's, it's yeah. all lost. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, yes. Wow, what a game. Uh, quite exciting. You must feel relieved now or happy that you won this first game against Gukesh? Yeah, of course. But uh, yeah, he always has a good comeback streak. So 
Tomorrow will be tough. Tomorrow will be tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Tanya and Peter, do you have any questions for Alireza? We haven't had you in the studio, so I'm going to use this opportunity. Alireza, are you enjoying the event? Uh, what do you think about freestyle chess? Yeah, I like it a lot. We don't uh, spend so much energy before the game, but we spend it on the game. So <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, I think it's, it needs to be played more. It doesn't make any sense. We play the same position <laughs> all the time. When we talk about standard chess, one of the things we always associate with you is creativity and intuitive play. Do you think having those strengths, it works to your favor in freestyle chess because you have to think from move one? Yeah, I think um, I'm easier to play mm. with, like freestyle chess because I don't need to worry about opening and the headaches. <laughs> um, for, I like it a lot, actually. Awesome. Peter? Yeah, and we, we noticed that you are always playing the openings quite quickly while other players are spending quite a lot of time. Is this strategy or you just feel like, okay, you are so happy to play that you want to make those moves? Yeah. What are your thoughts on this? It's, I think it's really energy taking like, uh, to think from move one for me because uh, still we will get some playable position at some point and then uh, I want to keep time and energy. So... Um, I don't like to think in opening. I don't know why, but this is maybe the reason. And uh, speaking about openings, we saw usually opening with one e4 yeah. in many of the games. What's what's the reason behind it? Did you just feel this was the most ambitious move? Yeah, it makes it makes a lot of sense for me. Like e4 always, but uh, I started d4 also one time I think. But yeah, I like e4. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, wonderful. one time for many games, right? Because always <laughs> yes. E4 is associated with you, and we are very happy to see also different type because we see much more often D4 played by players. Yeah, yeah. And there was a moment when Magnus was saying that yeah, everybody plays D4, but I felt like E4 is more challenging, and you were the one who played yeah. E4 on, in that occasion. So very nice that you are sticking to your principles. <laughs> and yeah, today's game was, was stunning. We, we did not have so much time. It, we really felt bad that we did not uh, have enough time to uh, delve into all the complications. But the impressions we are getting that with that monster knight on e6, you are controlling the situation. How did it feel that you are hiding your king on d2 thanks to that backward pawn on d6? What kind of feelings did you have? Yeah, I felt my king is really safe, actually, because... Um, I was even thinking to go King D3, go like advanced because uh, <laughs> he cannot even give a check. So um, yeah, his knight is very good protector of the king always. So it's and you did reveal that you have seen long castles for black with a knight on E6. To my mind, knowing that when a knight is on E6, long castle is impossible yeah. in normal chess. How do you keep all these uh, motives yes, in your yesterday mind? Yesterday I blundered against Dink completely. Oh, we're yes. wondering. You didn't yeah. realize that he came out. I completely blundered, oh, yeah. Oh my gosh. And really? I wanted even to ask the orbiter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it's crazy because you never think like... But okay, I was lucky that he still draw, so... Yeah. yeah, because we were yes. talking about that yes. and we figured because the rook moves yes. and then you think you can't castle anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's completely missed it. Wow, so today you were perfectly alert. Yeah. 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 The knight on e6, that yeah. can yeah. castle, yes, I know it. Yeah. yeah. Wow, it's it's so nice to see you also. Yes. You were the one who has uh, beaten Magnus Kars and then finally this crazy uh, time trouble, we couldn't uh, hear your opinions. Can you share some thoughts looking back on that match? Because that was very close and in this first rapid game, you also had such a good chance at the start. Yeah, uh, I mean, first with classical, I should have seen the a5 move. And then when he played queen before, if I play a5, mm -hmm. then it's very symmetrical. And, but I completely missed it. Yeah, and then I lost that game. Then I had I mean, a good, very good chance on, in the rapid. But yeah, in the time trouble, I, under the probably I lacked a bit energy at the end, but um, it was a very close match, so it, uh, could have gone either way. So. It's always a close fight when you and Magnus play, and it's always so fun to watch Alireza, the kind of chess that you bring for us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. All the best. Yep, best of luck. Ali Reza Faruja gets the first win in against Gukesh. But there is a second classical game. And this, these are the score lines of our...
uh, game one of the finals, Magnus versus Fabi, ended peacefully. But Peter, there were critical moments, uh, and the game was a bit of a cat and mouse between the world number one and world number two. Eventually, Fabi, a little bit on the defense, managed to keep it under control, seizing his opportunity at the right time. For Magnus Carlsen, it was a draw. He was a little disappointed with the result. He felt he had chances but wasn't able to capitalize on it. Nordbeck Levon also ends into a draw. A bit of a heartbreak for the Uzbek Senom, playing incredibly well. Everything under control. Uh, Peter, even in those queen and rook positions, he made it so difficult for Levon. But Levon once again seizing the opportunity to go c5, changing the dynamics of the position, striking it when it mattered. And then eventually this beautiful finish that we saw. And perhaps we can just see the end of it with Niklas, uh, exactly how it finished, because I believe it went into the line that you and I were discussing. Ali Reza takes the point against Gokesh, uh, take it away, uh, Nicholas. What happened at the end of the position? Sure. So we see the king being very active, going after pawn e3. Rook takes g2. Now king a3, preparing the b4 push. Black is going after the pawn on e3, and that's exactly the line that you mentioned. Tanya b4, a takes b4. He did not take here on b4. He played king b3, but it doesn't really matter. Black can still take on e3, and in this line after a5. Now, Nordebeck offered a draw because after, let's say, king d2, a6, e3, a7, both queens will appear at the same time. And why it takes a pawn, for example, and this is a completely dead draw. So, huge save for Levon Aronian here against Nordebeck. And he'll be looking forward to the white pieces tomorrow and try to win his match against Nordebeck mm. up to Zotorov. Big save, getting that half point in, knowing that you're not in a win-on-demand situation going into the final classical game. It's so important from a psychological perspective and the math situation. And it's the same for Fabi and Magnus as well. It's a bit of a reset, but Magnus starts with the white pieces. Peter, what are you expecting? Well, first of all, about Levon, that so far he has played two classical games with the white pieces and both of them were masterpieces. Yeah, he crushed uh, Vincent Keimer. After Vincent made a mistake in right at the very first move, without any chances of ever coming back to that game, and after he has uh, grand done Fabiano Caruana in some stunning strategical masterpiece there, that was a fantastic game, and he will have a third classical game with the white pieces. So Clean Nodia back will be kicking himself, but he has to. He has to try to forget about uh, today's chances. Mm. It's so easy to say it, but it's so difficult to do. We know exactly we have been there. Yeah, we are twisting, turning at night, uh, and and you you always have that motive in your mind that okay, how I did not play this or that move, which would have sealed the game. And you know that yes, any given moment you would ask me to play the right move, I would play it, but exactly over the board I made the wrong choice. Heartbreak for Abdus Atalov, but. It's going to be a fantastic match and he will be looking for counter chances against Levon also with the black pieces. So close for Nodderbeck, just does everything right. But in chess you can make 40 good moves and then that one miss, that rook to h4, that one moment you let it slip and it's all gone. Uh, chess can be quite brutal like that and we're seeing that more and more in freestyle chess. It's been an awesome day of chess and of course we will be back with our final day tomorrow, Peter. We will have the champion fighting for, uh, yes, Peter. Yes. yes $60,000 on the line, bragging rights. Uh, uh, Peter, where are we, what are we doing with this? I mean, the broadcast <laughs> about to come to an end. Uh, yes, I'm uh, waiting we... <laughs> for Jan to appear again, yes, that we can hand it over to him because, okay, it's, as long as we are in the studio, I'm happy with it. I can yeah, take I'm responsibility. I'm not letting you leave. No, no, no we... not at all. No, no. no. All right, we will figure this out. Meanwhile, for the players, they have to figure out what they will come up with tomorrow as there's a big fight in the grand final. World number one against world number two. A peaceful score so far, but one of the few draws that we've seen in freestyle chess. There have been mostly decisive games. We're looking forward to the action that's coming up. And let's remind everyone that today is the last day for you to submit your freestyle rap entries. Bust out those bars, send them to us. 
And uh, do not forget to use the hashtag Freestyle Chess. Also, don't forget to follow us on all our social media channels. And you will win. A very cool special edition. Peter, I'm struggling to open it. I managed to yes. do it. But you've got to show the king cards. Yes. Okay, the king cards. So already three. And where is Magnus? Magnus is not there? Not yet. Oh, my gosh. It is Levon. It oh, is Fabian. Then there it is, yes. So... I'm holding the other three. And the England, the world champion, Magnus Carson there. Yeah, all the four kings and the four jacks. Don't be fooled by the B. This is Bube in German. Yeah, it means jacks. And they are also treating us to some fantastic chess. Fantastic chess and some fantastic artwork by Magnus Carlsen on his card. We can see those heart-shaped glasses right there. They're signed by the eight grandmasters who are currently in Weissenhaus playing the first ever freestyle chess go challenge for the first time in chess. Freestyle chess, Fisher Random Chess in a classical time format. It's going to be a lot of fun. We will have our winner, not only a freestyle chess, but even a freestyle rap tomorrow, Peter. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. I feel like this was a fantastic initiative. Everybody is getting involved. I'm very excited seeing Anish Giri's tweet and rapping out live in the show. Levon Adonian also coming up with some rap after that marathon match yesterday during dinner. It's, uh, it's just so nice to see everybody getting all this extra spice and enjoying the event to the maximum. Absolutely, uh, Peter. I think for the players... Someone's got to sit them down and say, look, you've got one shot, one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted. One moment. Do you capture it or do you let it slip? With that thought, we will sign off and we'll see you tomorrow for the final. It's a goodbye from us. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>
His historic triumph over Magnus Carlsen in 2022 established him as a formidable force. More than just a chess enthusiast, he represents the dawn of a new era in Indian chess, surpassing the legendary Viswanathan Anand in rankings, a feat unachieved for over 37 years. His journey, a blend of innate talent and relentless dedication, continues to inspire, cementing his status not just as India's pride, but also as a beacon for the next generation of chess maestros. Gukesh Domaraju, born in 2006 from India, currently holds the 16th position in the chess world rankings with an ELO rating of 2743. His career peak so far, an ELO rating of 2758 and the eighth position on the global stage. Please see more at the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge at Weissenhaus. Alireza Firuzia, a chess prodigy born in 2003, represents France with an ELO of 2760 as of January 2024, peaking at 2804. Ranked sixth worldwide, he's lauded for his meteoric rise, becoming the youngest to surpass 2800 ELO at 18. Beyond the 64 squares, Firuzia intrigues with a dual career in fashion design, merging strategic finesse with creative flair. Despite not clinching the world championship spot, his prowess earned Magnus Carlsen's respect, leading to a mentorship. Firuzia's multifaceted life reflects in his achievements, including a fied Grand Swiss victory and top finishes in Rapid and Blitz World Championships. His journey symbolizes a blend of traditional mastery and modern versatility. Alireza Firuzia is a chess prodigy from France, born in 2003. His current ELO rating is 2760, placing him sixth worldwide. His highest ELO was 2804, and he achieved his best world ranking position at second. Please see more at the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge at Weissenhaus.